The Story of Anthony and Cleopatra Volume 1 of Famous Affinities of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr Volume 1 The Story of Anthony and Cleopatra Of all love stories that are known to human history, the love story of Anthony and Cleopatra has been for 19 centuries the most remarkable. It has tasked the resources of the plastic and the graphic arts. It has been made the theme of poets and of prose narrators. It has appeared and reappeared in a thousand forms. And it appeals as much to the imagination today as it did when Anthony deserted his almost victorious troops and hastened in a swift galley from Actium in pursuit of Cleopatra. The wonder of the story is explained by its extraordinary nature. Many men in private life have lost fortune and fame for the love of women. Kings have incurred the odium of their people, and have cared nothing for it in comparison with the joys of sense that come from the lingering caresses and clinging kisses. Cold-blooded statesmen such as Parnell have lost the leadership of their party and have gone down in history with a clouded name because of the fascination exercised upon them by some woman, often far from beautiful, and yet possessing some mysterious power which makes the triumphs of statesmanship seem slight in comparison with the swiftly flying hours of pleasure. But in the case of Anthony and Cleopatra alone do we find a man flinging away not merely the triumphs of civic honors or the headship of a state, but much more than these, the mastery of what was practically the world, in answer to the promptings of a woman's will. Hence the story of the Roman triumvir and the Egyptian queen is not like any other story that has yet been told. The sacrifice involved in it was so overwhelming, so instantaneous, and so complete, as to set this narrative above all others. Shakespeare's genius has touched it with the glory of a great imagination. Dryden, using it in the finest of his plays, expressed its nature in the title, All for Love. The distinguished Italian historian Signor Ferrero, the author of many books, has tried hard to eliminate nearly all the romantic elements from the tale and to have us see it as not the triumph of love, but the blindness of ambition. Under his handling, it becomes almost a sordid drama of a man's pursuit of power and of woman's selfishness. Let us review the story as it remains, even after we have taken full account of Ferrara's criticism. Has the world, for 1900 years, been blinded by a show of sentiment? Has it so absolutely been misled by those who lived and wrote in the days which followed closely on the events that make up this extraordinary narrative? In answering these questions we must consider, in the first place, the scene, and in the second place, the psychology of the two central characters, who for so long a time have been regarded as a very embodiment of unchecked passion. As to the scene, it must be remembered that the Egypt of those days was not Egyptian as we understand the word, but rather Greek. Cleopatra herself was of Greek descent. The kingdom of Egypt had been created by a general of Alexander the Great after that splendid warrior's death. Its capital, the most brilliant city of the Greco-Roman world, had been founded by Alexander himself, who gave to it his name. With his own hands he traced out the limits of the city, and issued the most peremptory orders that it should be made the metropolis of the entire world. The orders of a king cannot give enduring greatness to a city, but Alexander's keen eye and marvelous brain saw at once that in the sight of Alexandria was such that a great commercial community planted there would live and flourish throughout all succeeding ages. He was right, for within a century this new capital of Egypt leaped into the forefront among the exchanges of the world's commerce, while everything that art could do was lavished on its embellishment. Alexandria lay upon a projecting tongue of land so situated that the whole trade of the Mediterranean centered there. Down the Nile there floated to its gates the barbaric wealth of Africa. To it came the treasures of the East, brought from afar by caravans, silks from China, spices and pearls from India, and enormous masses of gold and silver from lands scarcely known. In its harbor were the vessels of every country, from Asia in the east to Spain and Gaul, and even Britain in the west. When Cleopatra, a young girl of seventeen, succeeded to the throne of Egypt, the population of Alexandria amounted to a million souls. The customs duties collected at the port would, in terms of modern money, amount each year to more than thirty million dollars even though the imposts were not heavy. The people, who may be described as Greek at the top and Oriental at the bottom, were boisterous and pleasure-loving, devoted to splendid spectacles, with horse-racing, gambling, and dissipation. Yet at the same time they were an artistic people, 
loving music passionately, and by no means idle, since one part of the city was devoted to large and prosperous manufactories of linen, paper, glass, and muslin. To the outward eye, Alexandria was extremely beautiful. Through its entire length ran two great boulevards, shaded and diversified by mighty trees and parterres of multicolored flowers, amid which fountains plashed and costly marbles gleamed. One-fifth of the whole city was known as the royal residence. In it were the palaces of the reigning family, the great museum, and the famous library which the Arabs later burned. There were parks and gardens brilliant with tropical foliage and adorned with the masterpieces of Grecian sculpture, while sphinxes and obelisks gave a suggestion of oriental strangeness. As one looked seaward, his eye beheld over the blue water the snow-white rocks of the sheltering island, Pharos, on which was reared a lighthouse four hundred feet in height, and justly numbered among the seven wonders of the world. Altogether, Alexandria was a city of wealth, of beauty, of stirring life, of excitement, and of pleasure. Ferrero has aptly likened it to Paris, not so much the Paris of today as the Paris of forty years ago, when the Second Empire flourished in all its splendor as the home of joy and strange delights. Over the country of which Alexandria was the capital, Cleopatra came to reign at seventeen. Following the odd custom which the Greek dynasty of the Ptolemies had inherited from their Egyptian predecessors, she was betrothed to her own brother. He, however, was a mere child of less than twelve, and was under the control of evil counselors, who, in his name, gained control of the capital and drove Cleopatra into exile. Until then she had been a mere girl, but now the spirit of a woman who was wrong blazed up in her and called out all her latent powers. Hastening to Syria, she gathered about herself an army and led it against her foes. But meanwhile, Julius Caesar, the greatest man of ancient times, had arrived at Alexandria backed by an army of his veterans. Against him no resistance would avail. Then came a brief moment during which the Egyptian king and the Egyptian queen each strove to win the favor of the Roman imperator. The king and his advisers had many arts, and so had Cleopatra. One thing, however, she possessed which struck the balance in her favor, and this was a woman's fascination. According to the story, Caesar was unwilling to receive her. There came into his presence, as he sat in the palace, a group of slaves bearing a long roll of matting, bound carefully and seeming to contain some precious work of art. The slaves made signs that they were bearing a gift to Caesar. The master of Egypt bade them unwrap the gift that he might see it. They did so, and out of the wrapping came Cleopatra, a radiant vision, appealing, irresistible. Next morning it became known everywhere that Cleopatra had remained in Caesar's quarters through the night, and that her enemies were now his enemies. In desperation they rushed upon his legions, casting aside all pretense of amity. There ensued a fierce contest, but the revolt was quenched in blood. This was a crucial moment in Cleopatra's life. She had sacrificed all that a woman has to give, but she had not done so from any love of pleasure or from wantonness. She was queen of Egypt and she had redeemed her kingdom and kept it by her sacrifice. One should not condemn her too severely. In a sense, her act was one of heroism like that of Judith in the Ten of Herophanes, but beyond all question it changed her character. It taught her the secret of her own great power. Henceforth, she was no longer a mere girl, nor a woman of the ordinary type. Her contact with so great a mind as Caesar's quickened her intellect. Her knowledge that, by the charms of sense, she had mastered even him, transformed her into a strange and wonderful creature. She learned to study the weaknesses of men, to play on their emotions, to appeal to every subtle taste and fancy. In her were blended mental power and that elusive, indefinable gift which is called charm. For Cleopatra was never beautiful. Signor Ferrero seems to think this fact to be a discovery of his own, but it was set down by Plutarch in a very striking passage written less than a century after Cleopatra and Anthony died. We may quote here what the Greek historian said of her. Her actual beauty was far from being so remarkable that none could be compared with her, nor was it such that it would strike your fancy when you saw her first. Yet the influence of her presence, if you lingered near her, was irresistible. Her attractive personality, joined with the charms of her conversation, and the individual touch that she gave to everything she said or did, were utterly bewitching. It was delightful merely to hear the music of her voice, with which, like an instrument of many strings, she could pass from one language to another. Caesar had left Cleopatra firmly seated in the throne of Egypt. For six years she reigned with great intelligence, keeping order in her dominions, and patronizing with discrimination both arts and letters. 
But ere long the convulsions of the Roman state once more caused her extreme anxiety. Caesar had been assassinated, and there ensued a period of civil war. Out of it emerged two striking figures which were absolutely contrasted in their character. One was Octavian, the adopted son of Caesar, a man who, though still quite young and possessed of great ability, was cunning, cold-blooded, and deceitful. The other was Anthony, a soldier by training, and with all the soldier's bluntness, courage, and lawlessness. The Roman world was divided for a time between these two men, Anthony receiving the government of the East, Octavian that of the West. In the year which had preceded this division, Cleopatra had wavered between the two opposite factions at Rome. In doing so, she had excited the suspicion of Anthony, and now he demanded of her an explanation. One must have some conception of Anthony himself in order to understand the events that followed. He was essentially a soldier of excellent family, being related to Caesar himself. As a very young man he was exceedingly handsome, and bad companions led him into the pursuit of vicious pleasure. He had scarcely come of age when he found that he owned the enormous sum of two hundred and fifty talents, equivalent to half a million dollars in the money of today. But he was much more than a mere man of pleasure, given over to drinking and to dissipation. Men might tell of his escapades, as when he drove about the streets of Rome in a common cab, dangling his legs out of the window while he shouted forth drunken songs of revelry. This was not the whole of Anthony. Joining the Roman army in Syria, he showed himself to be a soldier of great personal bravery, a clever strategist, and also humane and merciful in the hour of victory. Unlike most Romans, Anthony wore a full beard. His forehead was large, and his nose was of a distinctive Roman type. His look was so bold and masculine that people likened him to Hercules. His democratic manners endeared him to the army. He wore a plain tunic, covered with a large, coarse mantle, and carried a huge sword at his side, despising ostentation. Even his faults and follies added to his popularity. He would sit down at the common soldier's mess and drink with them, telling them stories and clapping them on the back. He spent money like water, quickly recognizing any daring deed which his legionaries performed. In this respect he was like Napoleon, and like Napoleon he had a vein of florid eloquence which was criticized by literary men, but which went straight to the heart of the private soldier. In a word, he was a powerful, virile, passionate, able man, rough, as were nearly all of his countrymen, but strong and true. It was to this general that Cleopatra was to answer, and with a firm reliance on the charms which had subdued Antony's great commander Caesar, she set out in person for Cilicia in Asia Minor, sailing up the river Sidnus to a place where Antony was encamped with his army. Making all allowances for the exaggeration of historians, there can be no doubt that she appeared to him like some dreamy vision. Her barge was gilded, and was wafted on its way by swelling sails of Tyrian purple. The oars which smote the water were of shining silver. As she drew near the Roman general's camp, the languorous music of flutes and harps breathed forth a strain of invitation. Cleopatra herself lay upon a divan set upon the deck of the barge beneath a canopy of woven gold. She was dressed to resemble Venus, while girls about her personified nymphs and graces. Delicate perfumes diffused themselves from the vessel, and at last, as she drew near the shore, all the people for miles about were gathered there, leaving Anthony to sit alone in the tribunal where he was dispensing justice. Word was brought to him that Venus had come to feast with Bacchus. Anthony, though still suspicious of Cleopatra, sent her an invitation to dine with him in state. With graceful tact she sent him a counter-invitation, and he came. The magnificence of his reception dazzled a man who had so long known only a soldier's fare, or at most, the crude entertainments which he had enjoyed in Rome. A marvelous display of lights was made. Thousands upon thousands of candles shone brightly, arranged in squares and circles, while the banquet itself was one that symbolized the studied luxury of the East. At this time Cleopatra was twenty-seven years of age, a period of life which modern psychologists have called the crisis in a woman's growth. She had never really loved before, since she had given herself to Caesar, not because she cared for him, but to save her kingdom. She now came into the presence of one whose manly beauty and strong passions were matched by her own subtlety and appealing charm. When Anthony addressed her, he felt himself a rustic in her presence. Almost resentful, he betook himself to the coarse language of the camp. Cleopatra, with marvelous adaptability, took her tone from his, and thus in a moment put him at his ease. 
Ferraro, who takes a most unfavorable view of her character and personality, nevertheless explains the secret of her fascination. Herself, utterly cold and callous, and sensitive by nature to the flame of true devotion, Cleopatra was one of those women gifted with an unerring instinct for all the various roads to men's affections. She could be the shrinking, modest girl, too shy to reveal her half-conscious emotions of jealousy and depression and self-abandonment, or a woman carried away by the sweep of a fiery and uncontrollable passion. She could tickle the aesthetic sensibilities of her victims by rich and gorgeous festivals, by the fantastic adornment of her own person and her palace, or by brilliant discussions on literature and art. She could conjure up all the grossest instincts with the vilest obscenities of conversation, with the free and easy jocularity of the woman of the camps. These last words are far too strong, and they represent only Ferrero's personal opinion. Yet there is no doubt that she met every mood of Anthony so that he became enthralled with her at once. No such woman as this had ever cast her eyes on him before. He had a wife at home, a most disreputable wife, so that he cared little for domestic ties. Later, out of policy, he made another marriage with the sister of his rival Octavian, but this wife he never cared for. His heart and soul were given up to Cleopatra, the woman who could be a comrade in the camp and a fount of tenderness in their hours of dalliance, and who possessed the keen intellect of a man joined to the arts and fascinations of a woman. On her side, she found in Anthony an ardent lover, a man of vigorous masculinity, and moreover, a soldier whose armies might well sustain her on the throne of Egypt. That there was calculation mingled with her love no one can doubt. That some calculation also entered into Antony's affection is likewise certain. Yet this does not affect the truth that each was wholly given to the other. Why should it have lessened her love for him to feel that he could protect her and defend her? Why should it have lessened his love for her to know that she was queen of the richest country in the world, one that could supply his needs, sustain his armies, and gild his triumphs with magnificence. There are many instances in history of regent queens who loved, and yet whose love was not disassociated from the policy of state. Such were Anne of Austria, Elizabeth of England, and the unfortunate Mary Stuart. Such, too, we cannot fail to think, was Cleopatra. The two remained together for ten years. In this time, Anthony was separated from her only during a campaign in the East. In Alexandria, he ceased to seem a Roman citizen, and gave himself up wholly to the charms of this enticing woman. Many stories are told of their good fellowship and close intimacy. Plutarch quotes Plato as saying that there are only four kinds of flattery, but he adds that Cleopatra had a thousand. She was a supreme mistress of the art of pleasing. Whether Anthony were serious or mirthful, she had at the instant some new delight or some new charm to meet his wishes. At every turn she was with him both day and night. With him she threw dice, with him she drank, with him she hunted, and when he exercised himself in arms, she was there to admire and applaud. At night the pair would disguise themselves as servants and wander about the streets of Alexandria. In fact, more than once they were set upon in the slums and treated roughly by the rabble who did not recognize them. Cleopatra was always alluring, always tactful, often humorous, and full of frolic. Then came the shock of Anthony's final breach with Octavian. Either Anthony or his rival must rule the world. Cleopatra's lover once more became the Roman general, and with a great fleet proceeded to the coast of Greece, where his enemy was encamped. Anthony had raised a 112,000 troops and 500 ships, a force far superior to that commanded by Octavian. Cleopatra was there with 60 ships. In the days that preceded the final battle, much took place which still remains obscure. It seems likely that Anthony desired to become again the Roman, while Cleopatra wished him to thrust Rome aside and return to Egypt with her, to reign there as an independent king. To her, Rome was almost a barbaric city. In it, she could not hold sway as she could in her beautiful Alexandria, with its blue skies and velvet turf and tropical flowers. At Rome, Anthony would be distracted by the cares of state, and she would lose her lover. At Alexandria, she would have him for her very own. The clash came when the hostile fleets met off the promontory of Actium. At its crisis, Cleopatra, prematurely concluding that the battle was lost, of a sudden gave the signal for retreat, and put out to sea with her fleet. This was the crucial moment. Anthony, mastered by his love, forgot all else, and in a swift ship started in pursuit of her, abandoning his fleet and army to win or lose as fortune might decide. 
For him the world was nothing. The dark-browed queen of Egypt, imperious and yet caressing, was everything. Never was such a prize and never were such great hopes thrown carelessly away. After waiting seven days, Antony's troops still undefeated, finding that their commander would not return to them, surrendered to Octavian, who thus became the master of an empire. Later his legions assaulted Alexandria, and there Antony was twice defeated. At last Cleopatra saw her great mistake. She had made her lover give up the hope of being Rome's dictator, but in so doing she had also lost the chance of ruling with him tranquilly in Egypt. She shut herself behind the barred doors of the royal sepulcher, and, lest she should be molested there, she sent forth word that she had died. Her proud spirit could not brook the thought that she might be seized and carried as a prisoner to Rome. She was too much a queen in soul to be led in triumph up the sacred way to the capital, with golden chains clanking on her slender wrist. Anthony, believing the report that she was dead, fell upon his sword. But in his dying moments he was carried into the presence of the woman for whom he had given all. With her arms about him, his spirit passed away, and soon after she too met death, whether by a poisoned draught or by the storied asp, no one can say. Cleopatra had lived the mistress of a splendid kingdom. She had successfully captivated two of the greatest men whom Rome had ever seen. She died, like a queen, to escape disgrace. Whatever modern critics may have to say concerning small details, this story still remains the strangest love story of which the world has any record. End of The Story of Anthony and Cleopatra Recording by James Christopher JX Christopher at Yahoo.com Abelard and Heloise, Volume 1 of Famous Affinities of History this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr, Volume 1, Abelard and Heloise. Many a woman, amid the transports of passionate and languishing love, has cried out in a sort of ecstasy. I love you as no woman ever loved a man before. When she says this, she believes it. Her whole soul is aflame with the ardor of emotion. It really seems to her that no one ever could have loved so much as she. This cry, spontaneous, untaught, sincere, has become almost one of those conventionalities of amorous expression which belong to the vocabulary of self-abandonment. Every woman who utters it, when torn by the almost terrible extravagance of a great love, believes that no one before her has ever said it, and that in her own case it is absolutely true. Yet how many women are really faithful to the end? Very many indeed, if circumstances admit of easy faithfulness. A high-souled, generous, adherent nature will endure the infinity of disillusionment, of misfortune, of neglect, and even of ill-treatment. Even so, the flame, though it may sink low, can be revived again to burn as brightly as before. But in order that this may be so, it is necessary that the object of such a wonderful devotion be alive, and that he be present and visible or if he be absent that there should still exist some hope of renewing the exquisite intimacy of the past a man who is sincerely loved may be compelled to take long journeys which will separate him for any indefinite time from the woman who has given her heart to him and she will be still a constant he may be imprisoned perhaps for life yet there is always the hope of his release or of his escape and some women will be faithful to him and will watch for his return but given a situation which absolutely bars out hope which sunders two souls in such a way that they can never be united in this world and there we have a test so terribly severe that few even of the most loyal and intensely clinging lovers can endure it not that such a situation would lead a woman to turn to any other man than the one whom she had given her very life but we might expect that at least her strong desire would cool and weaken she might cherish his memory among the precious souvenirs of her love life but that she should still pour out the same rapturous unstinted passion as before seems almost too much to believe annals of emotion record only one such instance and so this instance has become known to all and has been cherished for nearly a thousand years it involves the story of a woman who did love perhaps as no one ever loved before or since for she was subjected to this cruel test and she met the test not alone completely, but triumphantly and almost fiercely. The story is, of course, the story of Abelard and Heloise, 
it has many times been falsely told portions of it have been omitted and other portions have been garbled a whole literature has grown up around the subject it may be worth our while to clear away the ambiguous and doubtful points and once more tell it simply without bias with a strict adherence to what seems to be the truth attested by authentic records there is one circumstance connected with the story which must specially note the narrative does something more than set forth the one quite unimpeccable instance of unconquered constancy it shows how in the last analysis that which touches the human heart has more vitality and more enduring interest than what concerns the intellect or those achievements of the human mind which are external to our emotional nature pierre abelard was undoubtedly the boldest and most creative reasoner of his time as a wandering teacher he drew after him thousands of enthusiastic students he gave a strong impetus to learning he was a marvellous logician and an accomplished orator among his pupils were men who afterward became prelates of the church and distinguished scholars in the dark age when the dictates of reason were almost wholly disregarded he fought fearlessly for intellectual freedom he was practically the founder of the university of paris which in turn became the mother of medieval and modern universities he was therefore a great and striking figure in the history of civilization nevertheless he would to-day be remembered only by scholars and students of the middle ages were it not for the fact that he inspired the most enduring love that history records if heloise had never loved him and if their story had not been so tragic so poignant he would be to-day only a name known to but a few his final resting-place in the cemetery of pere lachaise in paris would not be sought out by thousands every year and kept bright with flowers the gift of those who have themselves both loved and suffered pierre abelard or more fully pierre abelard de palais was a native of brittany born in the year ten seventy nine his father was a knight the lord of the manor but abelard cared little for the life of a petty noble and so he gave up his seigneurial rights to his brothers and went forth to become first of all a student and then a published lecturer and teacher his student days ended abruptly in paris where he enrolled himself as a pupil of a distinguished philosopher Choliom de champeau but one day abelard engaged in a disputation with his master his wonderful combination of eloquence logic and originality utterly rooted champeau who was thus humiliated in the presence of his disciples he was the first of many enemies that abelard was destined to make in his long and stormy career from that moment the young briton himself set up as a teacher of philosophy and the brilliancy of his discourses soon drew to him songs of students from all over europe before proceeding with the story of abelard it is well to reconstruct however slightly a picture of the times in which he lived it was an age when western europe was but partly civilized pedantry and learning of the most minute sort existed side by side with the most violent excesses of medieval barbarism the church had undertaken the gigantic task of subduing and enlightening the semi-pagan people of france germany and england when we look back at that period some will unjustly censor rome for not controlling more completely the savagery of the medievals more fairly should we wonder at the great measure of success which had been already achieved the leaven of true christianity was working in the half-pagan populations it had not yet completely reached the nobles and the knights nor even all the ecclesiastics who served it and who were consecrated to its mission thus amid a sort of political chaos were seen the glaring evils of feudalism kings and princes and their followers lived the lives of swine private blood feuds were regarded lightly there was as yet no single central power every man carried his life in his hand trusting to sword and dagger for protection the cities were still mere hamlets clustered around great castles of fortified cathedrals in paris itself the network of dark lanes ill-lighted and unguarded was the scene of midnight murder and assassination in the winter time wolves infested the town by night men at arms with torches and spears often had to march out from the barracks to assail the snarling yelping packs of savage animals that hunger drove from the surrounding forests paris of the twelfth century was typical of france itself which was harried by human wolves intent on rapine and wanton plunder there were great schools of theology but the students who attended them fought and slashed one another if a man's life was threatened he must protect it by his own strength or by gathering about him a band of friends 
No one was safe, no one was tolerant. Very few were free from the grosser vices. Even in some of the religious houses, the brothers would meet at night for unseemly revels, splashing the stone floors with wine and shrieking in a delirium of drunkenness. The rules of the church enjoined temperance, continence, and celibacy. But the decrees of Leo IX and Nicholas II and Alexander II and Gregory were only partially observed. In fact, Europe was in a state of chaos, political and moral and social. Only very slowly was order emerging from sheer anarchy. We must remember this when we recall some facts which meet us in the story of Abelard and Heloise. The jealousy of Champot drove Abelard for a time from Paris. He taught and lectured at several other centers of learning, always admired and yet at the same time denounced by many for his advocacy of reason against blind faith. During the years of his wandering, he came to have a wide knowledge of the world and of human nature. If we try to imagine him as he was in the thirty and fifth year, we shall find in him a remarkable combination of attractive qualities. It must be remembered that though in a sense he was ecclesiastic, he had not yet been ordained to the priesthood, but was rather a canon, a person who did not belong to any religious order, though he was supposed to live according to a definite set of religious rules and as a member of a religious community. Abelard, however, made rather light of his churchy associations. He was at once an accomplished man of the world and a profound scholar. There was nothing of the recluse about him. He mingled with his fellow men, whom he dominated by the charm of his personality. He was eloquent, adherent, and persuasive. He could turn a delicate compliment as skilfully as he could elaborate a syllogism. His rich voice had in it a seductive quality which was never without its effect. Handsome, well-formed, he possessed as much vigor of body as of mind nor were his accomplishments entirely those of the scholar he wrote dainty verses which he had also set to music and which he sang himself with a rare skill some have called him the first of the troubadours and many who cared nothing for his skill and logic admired him for his gifts as a musician and a poet altogether he was one to attract attention wherever he went for none could fail to recognize his power it was soon after his thirty-fifth year that he returned to paris where he was welcomed by thousands. With much tact he reconciled himself to his enemies, so that his life now seemed to be full of promise and of sunshine. It was at this time that he became acquainted with a very beautiful young girl named Heloise. She was only eighteen years of age, yet already she possessed not only beauty but many accomplishments which were quite rare in women, since she both wrote and spoke a number of languages and, like Abelard, she was a lover of music and poetry. Heloise was the illegitimate daughter of a canon of patrician blood, so that she is said to have been a worthy representative of the noble house of the Montmorencys, famous throughout French history for chivalry and charm. Up to this time we do not know precisely what sort of life Abelard had lived in private. His enemies declared that he had squandered his substance in vicious ways. His friends denied this and represented him as strict and chaste. The truth probably lies between these assertions. He was naturally a pleasure-loving man of the world, who may very possibly have relieved his severer studies by occasional revelry and light love. It is not at all likely that he was addicted to gross passions and low practices. But such as he was, when he first saw Heloise, he conceived for her a violent attachment. Carefully guarded in the house of her uncle Falbert, it was difficult at first for Abelard to meet her, save in the most casual way yet every time that he heard her exquisite voice and watched her graceful manners he became more and more infatuated his studies suddenly seemed tame and colourless beside the fierce scarlet flame which blazed up in his heart nevertheless it was because of these studies and of his great reputation as a scholar that he managed to obtain access to heloise he flattered her uncle and made a chance proposal that he should himself become an inmate of Fulbert's house in order that he might teach this girl of so much promise such an offering from so brilliant a man was joyfully accepted from that time abelard could visit heloise without restraint he was her teacher and the two spent hours together nominally in the study of greek and hebrew but doubtless very little was said between them upon such unattractive subjects on the contrary with all his wide experience of life his eloquence his perfect manners and his fascination abelard put forth his power to captivate the senses of a girl still in her teens and quite ignorant to the world as remusee says 
he employed to win her the great genius which had overwhelmed all the great centres of learning in the western world it was then that the pleasures of knowledge the joys of thought the emotions of eloquence were all called into play to charm and move and plunge into a profound and strange intoxication this noble and tender heart which had never known either love or sorrow one can imagine that everything helped on the inevitable end their studies gave them opportunities to see each other freely and also permitted them to be alone together then their books lay open between them but either long periods of silence still their reading or else words of deepening intimacy made them forget their studies altogether the eyes of the two lovers turned from the book to mingle their glances and then to turn away in a confusion that was conscious hand would touch hand apparently by accident and when conversation ceased abelard would often hear the long quivering sigh which showed the strange half frightened and yet exquisite joy which heloise experienced it was not long before the girl's heart had been wholly won transported by her emotion she met the caresses of her lover with those as unrestrained as his her very innocence deprived her of the protection which all the women would have had all was given freely and even wildly by heloise and all was taken by abelard who afterward himself declared the pleasure of teaching her to love surpassed the delightful fragrance of all the perfumes in the world yet those two could not always live in a paradise which was entirely their own the world of paris took notice of their close association some poems written to heloise by abelard as if in letters of fire were found and shown to fulbert who until this time had suspected nothing angrily he ordered abelard to leave his house he forbade his niece to see her lover any more but the two could not be separated and indeed there was good reason why they should still cling together secretly heloise left her uncle's house and fled through the narrow lanes of paris to the dwelling of abelard's sister denise where abelard himself was living there presently the young girl gave birth to a son who was named aristolabe after an instrument used by astronomers since both the father and the mother felt that the offspring of so great a love should not have an ordinary name fulbert was furious and rightly so his hospitality had been outraged and his niece dishonoured he insisted that the pair should at once be married here was revealed a certain weakness in the character of abelard he consented to the marriage but insisted that it should be kept an utter secret oddly enough it was heloise herself who objected to becoming the wife of the man she loved unselfishness could go no farther she saw that were he to marry her his advancement in the church would be almost impossible for while the very minor clergy sometimes married in spite of the papal bulls matrimony was becoming a fatal part of ecclesiastical promotion and so heloise pleaded pitifully both with her uncle and with abelard that there should be no marriage she would rather bear all manner of disgrace than stand in the way of abelard's advancement he has himself given some of the words in which she pleaded with him what glory shall i win from you when i have made you quite inglorious and have humbled both of us what vengeance will the world inflict on me if i deprive it from one so brilliant what curses will follow such a marriage how outrageous would it be that you whom nature created for the universal good should be devoted to one woman and plunged into such disgrace i loathe the thought of a marriage which should humiliate you indeed every possible effort which another woman in her place would employ to make him marry her she used in order to dissuade him finally her sweet face streaming with tears she uttered the tremendous sentence which makes one really think that she loved him as no other woman ever loved a man she cried out in an agony of self-sacrifice i would rather be your mistress than the wife even of an emperor nevertheless the two were married and abelard returned to his lecture room and his studies for months they met but seldom meanwhile however the taunts and innuendos directed against heloise so irritated fulbert that he broke his promise of secrecy and told his friends that abelard and heloise were man and wife they went to heloise for confirmation once more she showed in an extraordinary way the depths of her devotion i am no wife she said it is not true that abelard has married me my uncle merely tells you this to save my reputation they asked her whether she would swear to this and without a moment's hesitation this pure and noble woman took an oath upon the scriptures that there had been no marriage fulbert was enraged by this his ill-treated heloise and furthermore he forbade abelard to visit her the girl therefore again left her uncle's house and betook herself to a convent 
just outside of Paris, where she assumed the habit of a nun as a disguise. There Abelard continued from time to time to meet her. When Fulbert heard this, he put his own interpretation on it. He believed that Abelard intended to ignore the marriage altogether, and that possibly he might even marry some other woman. In any case, he now hated Abelard with all his heart, and he resolved to take a fearful and unnatural vengeance, which would at once prevent his enemy from making any other marriage, while at the same time it would debar him from ecclesiastical preferment. To carry out this plot, Fulbert first bribed the man who was the body servant of Abelard, watching at the door of his room each night. Then he hired the services of four ruffians. After Abelard had retired and was deep in slumber, the treacherous valet unbared the door. The hirelings of Fulbert entered and fell upon the sleeping man. Three of them bound him fast, while the fourth, with a razor, inflicted on him the most shameful mutilation that is possible. Then, extinguishing the lights, the wretches slunk away and were lost in darkness, leaving behind the victim bound to his couch, uttering cries of torment and bathed in his own blood. It is a shocking story, and yet it is immensely characteristic of the lawless and barbarous era in which it happened. Early the next morning the news flew rapidly through Paris. The city hummed like a beehive. Citizens and students and ecclesiastics poured into the street and surrounded the house of Abelard. Almost the entire city, said Fulquet, as quoted by McCabe, went clamoring toward his house. Women wept as if each one had lost her husband. Unmanned though he was, Abelard still retained enough of the spirit of his time to seek vengeance. He, in his turn, employed ruffians, whom he set upon the track of those who had assaulted him. The treacherous valet and one of Fulbert's hirelings were run down, seized and mutilated precisely as Abelard had been, and their eyes were blinded. A third was lodged in prison. Fulbert himself was accused before one of the church courts, which alone had power to punish an ecclesiastic, and all his goods were confiscated. But, meantime, how did it fare with Heloise? Her grief was greater than his own, while her love and her devotion were absolutely undiminished. But Abelard now showed a selfishness, and indeed a meanness, far beyond any that he had before exhibited. Heloise could no more be his wife. He made it plain that he put no trust in her fidelity. He was unwilling that she should live in the world while he could not and so he told her sternly that she must take the veil and bury herself for ever in a nunnery the pain and shame which she experienced at this came wholly from the fact that evidently abelard did not trust her long afterward she wrote god knows i should not have hesitated at your command to proceed or to follow you to hell itself it was his distrust that cut her to the heart still her love for him was so intense that she obeyed his order soon after she took the vows and in the convent chapel Shaken with sobs, she knelt before the altar and assumed the veil of a cloistered nun. Abelard himself put on the tunic of a Benedictine monk and entered the abbey of St. Denis. It is unnecessary here to follow out all the details of the lives of Abelard and Heloise. After this heart-rendering scene, Abelard passed through many years of strife and disappointment, and even of humiliation. For on one occasion, just as he had silenced Guillaume de Champeaux, so he himself was silenced and put to rout by Bernard of Claveau, a frail, tense, absorbed, dominant little man, whose face was white and worn with suffering, but in whose eyes there was a light of supreme strength. Bernard represented pure faith, as Abelard represented pure reason, and the two men met before a great council to match their respective powers. Bernard, with fiery eloquence, brought a charge of heresy against Abelard in an oration which was like a charge of cavalry. When he had concluded, Abelard rose with an ashen face, stammered out a few words, and sat down. He was condemned by the council, and his works were ordered to be burned. All his later life was one of misfortune, of humiliation, and even of personal danger. The reckless monks whom he tried to rule rose fiercely against him. His life was threatened. He betook himself to a desolate and lonely place, where he built for himself a hut of reeds and rushes, hoping to spend his final years in meditation but there were many who had not forgotten his ability as a teacher. These flocked by hundreds to the desert place where he abode. His hut was surrounded by tents and rude hovels, built by his scholars for their shelter. Thus Abelard resumed his teaching, though in a very different frame of mind. In time he built the structure of wood and stone, which he called the Periclete, some remains of which still can be seen. All this time no word had passed between him and Heloise. 
but presently abelard wrote and gave to the world a curious and unexceedingly frank book which he called the story of my misfortunes a copy of it reached the hands of heloise and she at once sent to abelard the first of a series of letters which have remained unique in the literature of love ten years had passed and yet the woman's heart was as faithful and as full of yearning as on the day when the two had parted it has been said that the letters are not genuine but they must be read with this assertion in mind yet it is difficult to believe that any one save heloise herself could have flung a human soul into such frankly passionate utterances or that any imitator could have done the work in her first letter which was sent to abelard written upon parchment she said at thy command i would change not merely my costume but my very soul so entirely art thou the sole possessor of my body and my spirit never god is my witness never have i sought anything in thee but thyself i have sought thee and not thy gifts i have not looked to the marriage bond or dowry she begged him to write to her and to lead her to god as once he had led her into the mysteries of pleasure abelard answered in a letter friendly to be sure but formal the letter of a priest to a cloistered nun the opening words of it are characteristic to the whole to heloise his sister in christ from abelard her brother in him the letter was a long one but throughout the whole of it the writer's tone was cold and prudent its very coldness roused her soul to a passionate revolt her second letter bursts forth in a sort of anguish how hast thou been able to frame such thoughts dearest how hast thou found words to convey them oh if i dared but call god cruel to me oh most wretched of all creatures that i am so sweet did i find the pleasures of our loving days that i cannot bring myself to reject them or to banish them from my memory wheresoever i go they thrust themselves upon my vision and rekindle the old desire but abelard knew only too well that not in this life could there be anything save spiritual love between himself and heloise he wrote to her again and again always in the same remote and unimpassioned way he tells her about the history of monasticism and discusses with her the matters of theology and ethics but he never writes one word to feed the flame that is consuming her the woman understood at last and by degrees her letters became as calm as his suffused however with a tenderness and feeling that showed that in her heart of hearts she was still entirely given to him after some years abelard left his dwelling at the paraclete and there was founded there a religious house of which heloise became the abbess all the world respected her for her sweetness her wisdom and the purity of her character she made friends as easily as abelard made enemies even bernard who had overthrown her husband sought out heloise to ask her advice and counsel abelard died while on his way to rome whither he was journeying in order to undergo a penalty and his body was brought back to the paraclete where it was entombed over it for twenty-two years heloise watched with tender care and when she died her body was laid beside that of her lover to-day their bones are mingled as she would have desired them to be mingled the stones of their tomb in the great cemetery of Père Lachaise were brought from the ruins of the paraclete and above the sarcophagus are two recumbent figures the whole being the work of the artist alexandre lenoir who died in eighteen thirty six the figure representing heloise is not however an authentic likeness the model for it was a lady belonging to a noble family of france and the figure itself was brought to Père Lachaise from the ancient college de beauvais the letters of heloise have been read and imitated throughout the whole of the last nine centuries some have found in them the utterances of a woman whose love of love was greater than her love of god and whose intensity of passion nothing could subdue and so these have condemned her but others like chateaubriand have more truly seen in them a pure and noble spirit to whom fate had been very cruel and who was after all writing to the man who had been her lawful husband some of the most famous imitations of her letters are those in the ancient poem entitled the romance of the rose written by jean de meux in the thirteenth century in the modern times her first letter was paraphrased by alexander pope and in french by Coulardeux. there exist in english half a dozen translations of them with abelard's replies it is interesting to remember that practically all the other writings of abelard remained unpublished and unedited until a very recent period he was a remarkable figure as a philosopher and scholar but the world cares for him only because he was loved by heloise End of Abelard and Heloise Recording by Ellie August 2009
Queen Elizabeth and the Earl of Leicester, Volume 1 of Famous Affinities of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Dodge. Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr. Volume 1. Queen Elizabeth and the Earl of Leicester. History has many romantic stories to tell of the part which women have played in determining the destinies of nations. Sometimes it is a woman's beauty that causes the shifting of a province. Again, it is another woman's rich possessions that incite invasion and lead to bloody wars. Marriages or dowries or the refusal of marriages and lack of dowries, inheritance to an heiress, the failure of male succession. In these, and in many other ways, women have set their mark indelibly upon the trend of history. However, if we look over these different events, we shall find that it is not so much the mere longing for a woman, the desire to have her as a queen, that has seriously affected the annals of any nation. Kings, like ordinary men, have paid their suit and then have ridden away repulsed, if not seriously dejected. Most royal marriages are made either to secure the succession to the throne by a legitimate line of heirs, or else to unite adjoining states and make a powerful kingdom out of two that are less powerful. But, as a rule, kings have found greater delight in some sheltered bower, remote from courts, than in castled halls and well-cared-for nooks, where their own wives and children have been reared with all the appurtenances of legitimacy. There are not many stories that hang persistently about the love-making of a single woman. In the case of one or another, we may find an episode or two, something dashing, something spirited or striking, something brilliant and exhilarating, or something sad. But for a woman's whole life to be spent in courtship that meant nothing, and that was only a clever aid to diplomacy, this is surely an unusual and really wonderful thing. It is the more unusual because the woman herself was not intended by nature to be wasted upon the cold and cheerless sport of chancellors and counselors and men who had no thought of her except to use her as a pawn. She was hot-blooded, descended from a fiery race, and one whose temper was quick to leap into the passion of a man. In studying this phase of the long and interesting life of Elizabeth of England, we must notice several important facts. In the first place, she gave herself, above all else, to the maintenance of England. Not an England that would be half Spanish or half French or even partly Dutch and Flemish, but the merry England of tradition, the England that was one and undivided with its growing freedom of thought, its bows and bills, its nut-brown ale, its sturdy yeomen, in its loyalty to crown and parliament. She once said, almost as in agony, I love England more than anything. And one may really hold that this was true. For England she schemed and planned. For England she gave up many of her royal rights. For England she descended into the depths of treachery. For England she left herself on record as an arrant liar, false, perjured, yet successful. And because of her success for England's sake, her countrymen will hold her in high remembrance, since her scheming and her falsehood are the offenses that one pardons most readily in a woman. In the second place, it must be remembered that Elizabeth's courtships and pretended love-makings were almost always a part of her diplomacy. When not a part of her diplomacy, they were a mere appendage to her vanity. To seem to be the flower of the English people, and to be surrounded by the noblest, the bravest, and the most handsome cavaliers, 
not only of her own kingdom, but of others, this was, indeed, a choice morsel, of which she was fond of tasting, even though it meant nothing beyond the moment. Finally, though at times she could be very cold, and though she made herself still colder in order that she might play fast and loose with foreign suitors, who played fast and loose with her, the king of Spain, the Duc de Alencon, brother of the French king, with an Austrian archduke, with the magnificent barbarian prince of Muscovy, with Eric of Sweden, or any other Scandinavian suitor, she felt a woman's need for some nearer and more tender association to which she might give freer play and in which she might feel those deeper emotions without the danger that arises when love is mingled with diplomacy. Let us first consider a picture of the woman as she really was, in order that we may understand her triple nature, consummate mistress of every art that statesmen know, and using at every moment her person as a lure, a vainglorious queen who seemed to be the prey of boundless vanity, and lastly, a woman who had all a woman's passion, and who could cast suddenly aside the check and balance which restrained her before the public gaze, and could allow herself to give full play to the emotion that she inherited from the king, her father, who was himself a marvel of fire and impetuosity. That the daughter of King Henry the Eighth and Anne Boleyn should be a gentle, timid maiden would be to make heredity a farce. Elizabeth was about twenty-five years of age when she ascended the throne of England. It is odd that the date of her birth cannot be given with precision. The intrigues and disturbances of the English court, and the fact that she was a princess, made her birth a matter of less account than if there had been no male heir to the throne. At any rate, when she ascended it, after the deaths of her brother, King Edward the Sixth, and her sister, Queen Mary. She was a woman well-trained both in intellect and in physical development. Mr. Martin Hume, who loves to dwell upon the later years of Queen Elizabeth, speaks rather bitterly of her as a, quote, painted old harridan, unquote, and such she may well have seemed when, at nearly seventy years of age, she leered and grinned a sort of skeleton smile at the handsome young courtiers who pretended to see in her the queen of beauty and to be dying for love of her yet in her earlier years when she was young and strong and impetuous she deserved far different words than these the portrait of her by zucchero now hangs in hampton court depicts her when she must have been of more than middle age and still the face is one of beauty, though it be strange and almost artificial beauty, one that draws, attracts, and perhaps lures you on against your will. It is interesting to compare this painting with the frank word picture of a certain German agent who was sent to England by his emperor, and who seems to have been greatly fascinated by Queen Elizabeth she was at that time in the prime of her beauty and her power her complexion was of that peculiar transparency which is seen only in the face of golden blondes her figure was fine and graceful and her wit an accomplishment that would have made a woman of any rank or time remarkable the german envoy says she lives a life of such magnificence and feasting as can hardly be imagined and occupies a great portion of her time with balls banquets hunting and similar amusements with the utmost possible display but nevertheless she insists upon far greater respect being shown her than was exacted by queen mary she summons parliament but lets them know that her orders must be obeyed in any case. If any one will look at the painting by Zucchero, he will see how much is made of Elizabeth's hands, 
a distinctive feature quite as noble with the Tudors as is the Habsburg lip among the descendants of the House of Austria. These were ungloved, and they were very long and white, and she looked at them and played with them a great deal, and, indeed, they justified the admiration with which they were regarded by her flatterers. Such was the personal appearance of Elizabeth. When a young girl, we have still more favorable opinions of her that were written by those who had occasion to be near her. Not only do they record swift glimpses of her person, but sometimes in a word or two they give an insight into certain traits of mind which came out prominently in her later years. It may, perhaps, be well to view her as a woman before we regard her more fully as a queen. It has been said that Elizabeth inherited many of the traits of her father, the boldness of spirit, the rapidity of decision, and, at the same time, the fox-like craft which often showed itself when it was least expected. Henry had also, as is well known, a love of the other sex, which has made his reign memorable. And yet it must be noted that while he loved much, it was not loose love. Many a king of England, from Henry the Second to Charles the Second, has offended far more than Henry the Eighth. Where Henry loved, he married, and it was the unfortunate result of these royal marriages that has made him seem unduly fond of women. If, however, we examine each one of the separate espousals, we shall find that he did not enter into it lightly, and that he broke it off unwillingly. His ardent temperament, therefore, was checked by a certain rational or conventional propriety, so that he was by no means a loose liver, as many would make him out to be. We must remember this when we recall the charges that have been made against Elizabeth, and the strange stories that were told of her tricks, by no means seemly tricks, which she used to play with her guardian, Sir Thomas Seymour. The antics she performed with him in her dressing-room were made the subject of an official inquiry. Yet it came out that while Elizabeth was less than sixteen, and Lord Thomas very much her senior, his wife was with him on his visits to the chamber of the princess. Sir Robert Turwitt and his wife were also sent to question her. Turwitt had a keen mind and one well-trained to cope with any other's wit in this sort of cross-examination. Elizabeth was only a girl of fifteen, yet she was a match for the accomplished courtier in diplomacy and quick retort. He was sent down to worm out of her everything that she knew. Threats, flattery, and forged letters, and false confessions were tried on her, but they were tried in vain. She would tell nothing of importance. She denied everything. She sulked. She cried. She availed herself of a woman's favorite defense in suddenly attacking those who attacked her. She brought counter-charges against her wit and put her enemies on their own defense. Not a compromising word could they wring out of her. She bitterly complained of the imprisonment of her governess, Mrs. Ashley, and cried out, I have not so behaved that you need put more mistresses upon me. Altogether, she was too much for Sir Robert, and he was wise enough to recognize her cleverness. She hath a very good wit, said he shrewdly, and nothing is to be gotten out of her except by great policy. And he added, If I had to say my fancy, I think it more meet that she should have two governesses than one. Mr. Hume notes the fact that after the two servants of the princess had been examined and had told nothing very serious, they found that they had been wise in remaining friends of the royal girl. No sooner had Elizabeth become queen than she knighted the man Parry and made him treasurer of the household while Mrs. Ashley, the governess, was treated with great consideration. Thus, very naturally, Mr. Hume said, 
they had probably kept back far more than they told. Even Terwitt believed that there was a secret compact between them, for he said quaintly, They all sing one song, and she hath set the note for them. Soon after this, her brother Edward's death brought to the throne her elder sister Mary, who has harshly become known as Bloody Mary. During this time, Elizabeth put aside her boldness and became, apparently, a shy and simple-minded virgin. Surrounded on every side by those who sought to trap her, there was nothing in her bearing to make her seem the head of a party or a young chief of a faction. Nothing could exceed her in meekness. She spoke of her sister in the humblest terms. She exhibited no signs of the Tudor animation that was in reality so strong a part of her character. But coming to the throne, she threw away her modesty and brawled and rioted with very little self-restraint. The people as a whole found little fault with her. She reminded them of her father, the bluff King Hal, and even those who criticized her did it only partially. They thought much better of her than they had of her saturnine sister, the first Queen Mary. The life of Elizabeth has been very oddly misunderstood, not so much for the facts in it as for the manner in which these have been arranged and the relation which they have to one another. We ought to recollect for that this woman did not live in a restricted sphere, that her life was not a short one, and that it was crowded with incidents and full of vivid color. Some think of her as living for a short period of time, and speak of the great historical characters who surround her as belonging to a single epoch. To them she has one set of suitors all the time, the Duke de Alencon, the King of Denmark's brother, the Prince of Sweden, the Russian potentate, the Archduke sending her sweet messages from Austria, the melancholy King of Spain, together with a number of her own brilliant Englishmen, Sir William Pickering, Sir Robert Dudley, Lord Darnley, the Earl of Essex, Sir Philip Sidney, and Sir Walter Raleigh. Of course, as a matter of fact, Elizabeth lived for nearly seventy years, almost three-quarters of a century, and in that long time there came and went both men and women, those whom she had used and cast aside, and others whom she had also treated with gratitude, and who had died gladly serving her. But through it all there was a continual change in her environment, though not in her. The young soldier went to the battlefield and died, the wise counselor gave her his advice, and she either took it or cared nothing for it. She herself was a curious blending of forwardness and folly, of wisdom and wantonness, of frivolity and unbridled fancy. But through it all she loved her people, even though she often cheated them and made them pay her taxes in the harsh old way that prevailed, before there was any right save the king's will. At the same time, this was only by fits and starts, and on the whole she served them well. Therefore, to most of them she was always the good Queen Bess. What mattered it to the ditcher and yeoman, far from the court, that the Queen was said to dance in her nightdress and to swear like a trooper? It was, indeed, largely from these rustic sources that such stories were scattered throughout England. Peasants thought them picturesque. More to the point with them were peace and prosperity throughout the country. The fact that law was administered with honesty and justice, and that England was safe from her deadly enemies, the swarthy Spaniards and the scheming French. But as I said, we must remember always that the Elizabeth of one period was not the Elizabeth of another, and that the England of one period was not the England of another. As one thinks of it, there is something wonderful in the almost star-like way in which this girl flitted unharmed through a thousand perils. Her own countrymen were at first divided against her. A score of greedy, avaricious suitors sought her destruction, or at least her hand to lead her to destruction. 
all the great powers of the continent were either demanding an alliance with England or threatening to dash England down admit their own dissensions. What had this girl to play off against such dangers? Only an undaunted spirit, a scheming mind that knew no scruples, and finally her own person, and the fact she was a woman, and therefore might give herself in marriage and become the mother of a race of kings. It was this last weapon, the weapon of her sex, that proved perhaps the most powerful of all, by promising a marriage or by denying it, or by neither promising nor denying but withholding it. She gave forth a thousand wily intimations which kept those who surrounded her at bay until she had made still another deft and skillful combination, escaping like some startled creature to a new place of safety. In 1583, when she was fifty years of age, she had reached a point when her courtships and her pretended love-making were no longer necessary. She had played Sweden against Denmark and France against Spain and the Austrian Archduke against the others and many suitors in her own land against the different factions which they headed. She might have sat herself down to rest, for she could feel that her wisdom had led her up to a high place, whence she might look down in peace and with assurance of the tranquillity that she had won. Not yet had the great armada rolled and thundered toward the English shores, but she was certain that her land was secure, compact, and safe. It remains to see what were those amatory relations which she may be said to have sincerely held. She had played at love-making with foreign princes because it was wise and for the moment best. She had played with Englishmen of rank who aspired to her hand because in that way she might conciliate at one time her Catholic and at another her Protestant subjects. But what of the real and inward feeling of her heart, when she was not thinking of political problems or the necessities of state? This is an interesting question. One may at least seek the answer, hoping thereby to solve one of the most interesting phases of this perplexing and most remarkable woman. It must be remembered that it was not a question of whether Elizabeth desired marriage. She may have done so, as involving a brilliant stroke of policy. In this sense, she may have wished to marry one of the two French princes who were among her suitors. But even here she hesitated, and her parliament disapproved, for by this time England had become largely Protestant. Again, had she married a French prince and had children, England might have become an appanage of France. There is no particular evidence that she had any feeling at all for her Flemish, Austrian, or Russian suitors, while the Swedes' pretensions were the laughing-stock of the English court. So we may set aside this question of marriage as having nothing to do with her emotional life. She did desire a son, as was shown by her passionate outcry when she compared herself with Mary of Scotland. The Queen of Scots has a bonny son, while I am but a barren stock. She was too wise to wed a subject, though. Had she married at all, her choice would doubtless have been an Englishman. In this respect, and in so many others, she was like her father, who chose his numerous wives, with the exception of the first, from among the English ladies of the court, just as the showy Edward the Fourth was happy in marrying Dame Elizabeth Woodville. But what a king may do is by no means so easy for a queen, and a husband is almost certain to assume an authority which makes him unpopular with the subjects of his wife. Hence, as said above, we must consider not so much whom she would have liked to marry, but rather to whom her love went out spontaneously, and not as a part of that amatory play which amused her from the time when she frisked with Seymour down to her very last days, when she could no longer move about, but when she still dabbed her cheeks with rouge and powder 
and set her skeleton face amid a forest of ruffs. There were many whom she cared for after a fashion. She would not let Sir Walter Raleigh visit her American colonies, because she could not bear to have him so long away from her. She had great moments of passion for the Earl of Essex, though in the end she signed his death warrant, because he was as dominant in spirit as the Queen herself. Readers of Sir Walter Scott's wonderfully picturesque novel, Kenilworth, will note how he throws the strongest light upon Elizabeth's affection for Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. Scott's historical instinct is united here with a vein of psychology, which goes deeper than is usual with him. We see Elizabeth trying hard to share her favor equally between two nobles, but the Earl of Essex fails to please her because he lacked those exquisite manners which made Leicester so great a favorite with the fastidious queen. Then, too, the story of Leicester's marriage with Amy Robsart is something more than a myth based upon an obscure legend and an ancient ballad. The earl had had such a wife, and there were sinister stories about the manner of her death. But it is Scott who invents the villainous Varney and the bulldog Antony Foster, just as he brought the whole episode into the foreground and made it occur at a period much later than was historically true. Still, Scott felt and he was imbued with the spirit and knowledge of that time, a strong conviction that Elizabeth loved Lester, as she really loved no one else. There is one interesting fact which goes far to convince us. Just as her father was, in a way, polygamous, so Elizabeth was even more truly polyandrous. It was inevitable that she should surround herself with attractive men whose love-lock she would caress, and whose flattery she would greedily accept. To the outward eye there was very little difference in her treatment of the handsome and daring nobles of her court. Yet a historian of her time makes one very shrewd remark when he says, To every one she gave some power at times, to all save Lester. Cecil and Walsingham in council and Essex and Raleigh in the field, might have their own way at times, and even share the sovereign's power. But to Leicester she entrusted no high commands and no important mission. Why so? Simply because she loved him more than any of the rest, and knowing this, she knew that if besides her love she granted him any measure of control or power, then she would be but half a queen, and would be led either to marry him, or else to let him sway her as he would. For the reason given, one may say with confidence that, while Elizabeth's light loves were fleeting, she gave a deep affection to this handsome, bold, and brilliant Englishman, and cherished him in a far different way from any of the others. This was as near as she ever came to marriage, and it was this love, at least, which makes Shakespeare's famous line as false as it is beautiful, when he describes the imperial votaress as passing by in maiden meditation, fancy-free. End of Queen Elizabeth and the Earl of Leicester Mary, Queen of Scots, and Lord Bothwell, Volume 1 of the Famous Affinities of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr, Volume 1, Mary, Queen of Scots, and Lord Bothwell. Mary Stuart and Cleopatra are the two women who have most attracted the fancy of poets, dramatists, novelists, and painters from their own time down to the present day. In some respects, there is a certain likeness in their careers. Each was the queen of a nation 
whose affairs were entangled with those of a much greater one. Each sought for her own ideal of love until she found it. Each won that love recklessly, almost madly. Each, in its attainment, fell from power and fortune. Each died before her natural life was ended. One caused the man she loved to cast away the sovereignty of a mighty state. The other lost her own crown in order that she might achieve the whole desire of her heart. There is still another parallel which may be found. Each of these women was reputed to be exquisitely beautiful. Yet each fell short of beauty's highest standards. They are alike remembered in song and story because of qualities that are far more powerful than any physical charm can be. They impressed the imagination of their own contemporaries, just as they had impressed the imagination of all succeeding ages, by reason of a strange and irresistible fascination, which no one could explain, but which very few could experience and resist. Mary Stuart was born six days before her father's death, and when the kingdom, which was her heritage, seemed to be almost in its death throes. James V of Scotland, half Stuart and half Tudor, was no ordinary monarch. As a mere boy he had burst the bonds with which a regency had bound him, and he had ruled the wild Scotland of the sixteenth century. He was brave and crafty, keen in statesmanship, and dissolute in pleasure. His first wife had given him no heirs, so at her death he sought out a princess, whom he pursued all the more ardently, because she was also courted by the burly Henry the Eighth of England. This girl was Marie of Lorraine, the daughter of Duke de Guise. She was fit to be the mother of a lion's brood, for she was above six feet in height, and of proportions so ample as to excite the admiration of the royal voluptuary who sat upon the throne of England. "'I am big,' said he, "'and I want a wife who is as big as I am.' But James of Scotland wooed in person, and not by embassies, and he triumphantly carried off his strapping princess. Henry of England gnawed his beard in vain, and though he found consolation in another woman's arms, he viewed James not only as a public, but as a private enemy. There was war between the two countries. First, the Scots repelled an English army, but soon they were themselves disgracefully defeated at Solway Moss by a force much their inferior in numbers. The shame of it broke King James's heart. As he was galloping from the battlefield, the news was brought to him that his wife had given birth to a daughter. He took little notice of the message and in a few days he had died, moaning with his last breath the mysterious words, It came with a lass, with a lass it will go. The child who was born at this ill-omened crisis was Mary Stuart, who within a week became, in her own right, Queen of Scotland. Her mother acted as regent of the kingdom. Henry of England demanded that the infant girl should be betrothed to his young son, Prince Edward, who afterwards reigned as Edward the Sixth, though he died while still a boy. The proposal was rejected, and the war between England and Scotland went on its bloody course. But meanwhile the little queen was sent to France, her mother's home, so that she might be trained in accomplishments which were rare in Scotland. In France she grew up at the court of Catherine de' Medici, that imperious intriguer whose splendid surroundings were tainted with the corruption which she had brought from her native Italy. It was indeed a singular training school for the girl of Mary Stuart's character. She saw about her a superficial chivalry and a most profound depravity. Poets like Ronsard graced the life of the court with exquisite verse, Troubadours and minstrels sang sweet music there. There were fates and tournaments and gallantry of bearing. Yet, on the other hand, there was every possible refinement and variety of vice. 
Men were slain before the eyes of the queen herself. The talk of the court was of intrigue and lust and evil things, which almost verged on crime. Catherine de' Medici herself kept her nominal husband at arm's length, and in order to maintain her grasp on France, she connived at the corruption of her own children, three of whom were destined in their turn to sit upon the throne. Mary Stuart grew up in these surroundings until she was sixteen, eating the fruit which gave a knowledge of both good and evil. Her intelligence was very great. She quickly learned Italian, French, and Latin. She was a daring horsewoman. She was a poet and artist, even in her teens. She was also a keen judge of human motives, for those early years of hers had forced her into a womanhood that was premature but wonderful. It had been proposed that she should marry the eldest son of Catherine, so that in time the kingdom of Scotland and that of France might be united, while if Elizabeth of England were to die unmarried, her realm also would fall to this pair of children. And so Mary, at sixteen, wedded Dauphin Francis, who was a year her junior. The prince was a wretched, whimpering little creature with a cankered body and a blighted soul. Marriage with such a husband seemed absurd. It never was a marriage in reality. The sickly child would cry all night, for he suffered from abscesses in his ears, and his manhood had been prematurely taken from him. Nevertheless, within a twelvemonth, the French king died, and Mary Stuart was queen of France, as well as of Scotland. Hampered only by her nominal obedience to the sick boy whom she openly despised. At seventeen, she showed herself a master spirit. She held her own against the ambitious Catherine de' Medici, whom she contemptuously nicknamed the apothecary's daughter. For the brief period of a year, she was actually the ruler of France. But then her husband died, and she was left a widow, restless, ambitious, yet no longer having any of the power she loved. Mary Stuart at this time had become a woman whose fascination was exerted over all who knew her. She was very tall and very slim, with chestnut hair, like a flower of the heat, both lax and delicate. Her skin was fair and pale, so clear and so transparent as to make a story plausible that when she drank from a flask of wine, the red liquid could be seen passing down her slender throat. Yet with all this, she was not fine in texture, but hardy as a man. She could endure immense fatigue without yielding to it, her supple form had the strength of steel. There was a gleam in her hazel eyes that showed her to be brimful of an almost fierce vitality. Young as she was, she was the mistress of a thousand arts, and she exhaled a sort of atmosphere that turned the heads of men. The Stuart blood made her impatient of control, careless of state, and easy-mannered. The French and Tudor strain gave her vivacity. She could be submissive in appearance while still persisting in her aims. She could be languorous and seductive while cold within. Again, she could assume the haughtiness which belonged to one who was twice a queen. Two motives swayed her, and they fought together for supremacy. One was the love of power, and the other was love of love. The first was natural to a girl who was a sovereign in her own right. The second was inherited, and was then forced into a rank luxuriance by the sort of life that she had seen about her. At eighteen she was a strangely amorous creature, given to fondling and kissing every one about her, with slight discrimination. From her sense of touch she received emotions that were almost necessary to her existence. With her slender, graceful hands, she was always stroking the face of some favorite. It might be only the face of a child, or it might be the face of some courtier or poet, or one of the four Marys whose names are linked with hers, Mary Livingston, Mary Fleming, Mary Beaton. 
and Mary Seton, the last of whom remained with her royal mistress until her death. But one must not be too censorious in thinking of Mary Stuart. She was surrounded everywhere by enemies. During her stay in France, she was hated by the faction of Catherine de Medici. When she returned to Scotland, she was hated because of her religion by the Protestant lords. Her every action was set forth in the worst possible light. The most sinister meaning was given to everything she said or did. In truth, we must reject almost all the stories which accuse her of anything more than a certain levity of conduct. She was not a woman to yield herself to love's last surrender, unless her intellect and heart alike had been made captive. She would listen to the passionate outpourings of poets and courtiers, and she would plunge her eyes into theirs, and let her hair just touch their faces, and give them her white hands to kiss. But that was all. Even in this she was only following the fashion of the court where she was bred, and she was not unlike her royal relative, Elizabeth of England, who had the same external amorousness, coupled with the same internal self-control. Mary Stuart's love life makes a piteous story, for it is the life of one who was ever seeking, seeking for the man to whom she could look up, who could be strong and brave and ardent like herself, and at the same time be more powerful and more steadfast even than she herself in mind and thought. Whatever may be said of her, and howsoever the facts may be colored by partisans, this royal girl, stung though she was by passion and goaded by desire, cared nothing for any man who could not match her in body and mind and spirit all at once. It was in her early widowhood that she first met the man, and when their union came, it brought ruin on them both. In France there came to her one day one of her own subjects, the Earl of Bothwell. He was but a few years older than she, and in his presence for the first time she felt, in her own despite, that profoundly moving, indescribable, and never-to-be-forgotten thrill which shakes a woman to the very center of her being, since it is the recognition of a complete affinity. Lord Bothwell, like Queen Mary, has been terribly maligned. Unlike her, he has found only a few defenders. Maurice Hewitt has drawn a picture of him more favorable than many, and yet it is a picture that repels. Bothwell, says he, was of a type esteemed by those who pronounce vice to be their virtue. He was a galliard, flushed with rich blood, broad-shouldered, square-jawed, with a laugh so happy and so prompt that the world, rejoicing to hear it, thought all must be well wherever he might be. He wore brave clothes, sat a brave horse, and kept brave company bravely. His high color, while it betokened high feeding, got him the credit of good health. His little eyes twinkled so merrily that you did not see they were like a pig's, sly and greedy at once, and bloodshot. His tawny beard concealed a jaw underhung, a chin jutting and dangerous. His mouth had a cruel twist, but his laughing hid that too. The bridge of his nose had been broken few observed it or guessed at the brawl which must have given it to him frankness was his great charm careless ease in high places and so when mary stuart met him in her eighteenth year lord bothwell made her think as she had never thought of any other man and as she was not to think of any other man again she grew to look eagerly for that frank mockery in those twinkling eyes, in that quick mouth, and to wonder whether it was with him always, asleep, at prayers, fighting, furious, or in love. Something more, however, must be said of Bothwell. He was undoubtedly a roisterer, but he was very much a man. He made easy love to women. His sword leaped quickly from its sheath. He could fight, and he could also think. He was no brawling ruffian, no ordinary rake. 
remembering what Scotland was in those days, Bothwell might well seem in reality a princely figure. He knew Italian, he was at home in French, he could write fluent Latin. He was a collector of books, and a reader of them also. He was perhaps the only Scottish noble of his time who had a bookplate of his own. Here is something more than a mere reveler. Here is a man of varied accomplishments and of a complex character. Though he stayed but a short time near the Queen in France, he kindled her imagination, so that when she seriously thought of men, she thought of Bothwell. And yet all the time she was fondling the young pages in her retinue, and kissing her maids of honor with their scarlet lips, and lying on their knees while poets like Ronsard and Chastelard wrote ardent love sonnets to her, and sighed and pined for something more than the privilege of kissing her two dainty hands. In 1561, less than a year after her widowhood, Mary set sail for Scotland, never to return. The great high-decked ships which escorted her sailed into the harbor of Leith, and she pressed on to Edinburgh. A depressing change indeed from the sunny terraces and fields of France. In her own realm were fog and rain and only a hut to shelter her upon her landing. When she reached her capital there were few welcoming cheers, but as she rode over the cobblestones to Holyrood, the squalid winds vomited forth great mobs of hard-featured, grim-visaged men and women who stared with curiosity and half-contempt at the girl queen and her retinue of foreigners. The Scots were Protestants of the most dour sort, and they distrusted their new ruler because of her religion, and because she loved to surround herself with dainty things and bright colors and exotic elegance. They feared lest she should try to repeal the law of Scotland's Parliament, which had made the country Protestant. The very indifference of her subjects stirred up the nobler part of Mary's nature. For a time she was indeed a queen. She governed wisely. She respected the religious rights of her Protestant subjects. She strove to bring order out of the chaos into which her country had fallen and she met with some success. The time came when her people cheered her as she rode among them. Her subtle fascination was her greatest source of strength. Even John Knox, that iron-visaged, stentorian preacher, fell for a time under the charm of her presence. She met him frankly and pleaded with him as a woman, instead of commanding him as a queen. The surly rancher became softened for a time, and, though he spoke of her to others as, quote, honeypot, unquote, he ruled his tongue in public. She had offers of marriage from Austrian and Spanish princes. The new king of France, her brother-in-law, would perhaps have wedded her. It married little to Mary that Elizabeth of England was hostile. She felt that she was strong enough to hold her own and govern Scotland. But who could govern a country such as Scotland was? It was a land of broils and feuds, of clan enmities and fierce vendettas. Its nobles were half barbarous, and they fought and slashed at one another with drawn dirks, almost in the presence of the queen herself. No matter whom she favored, there rose up a swarm of enemies. Here was a Corsica of the north, more savage and untamed than even the other Corsica. In her perplexity, Mary felt a woman's need of some man on whom she could have the right to lean, and whom she could make the king consort. She thought that she had found him in the person of her cousin, Lord Darnley, a Catholic, and by his upbringing, half an Englishman. Darnley came to Scotland and for the moment Mary fancied that she had forgotten Bothwell. Here again she was in love with love, and she idealized the man who came to give it to her. Darnley seemed, indeed, well worthy to be loved, for he was tall and handsome, appearing well on horseback, and having some of the accomplishments which Mary valued. 
It was a hasty wooing, and the queen herself was first of all the wooer. Her quick imagination saw in Darnley traits and gifts of which he really had no share. Therefore the marriage was soon concluded, and Scotland had two sovereigns, King Henry and Queen Mary. So sure was Mary of her indifference to Bothwell, that she urged the earl to marry, and he did marry a girl of the great house of Gordon. Mary's self-suggested love for Darnley was extinguished almost on her wedding night. The man was a drunkard who came into her presence befuddled and almost bestial. He had no brains. His vanity was enormous. He loved no one but himself, and least of all this queen, whom he regarded as having thrown herself at his empty head. The first fruits of the marriage were uprisings among the Protestant lords. Mary then showed herself a heroic queen, at the head of a motley band of soldiery who came at her call. Half-clad, uncouth and savage, she rode into the west, sleeping at night upon the bare ground, sharing the camp food, dressed in plain tartan, but swift and fierce as any eagle. Her spirit ran like fire through the veins of those who followed her. She crushed the insurrection, scattered its leaders, and returned in triumph to her capital. Now she was really queen, but here came in the other motive, which was interwoven in her character. She had shown herself a man in courage. Should she not have the pleasures of a woman? To her court in Holyrood came Bothwell once again, and this time Mary knew that he was all the world to her. Darnley had shrunk from the hardships of battle. He was steeped in low intrigues. He roused the constant irritation of the queen by his folly and utter lack of sense and decency. Mary felt she owed him nothing, but she forgot that she owed much to herself. Her old amorous ways came back to her, and she relapsed into the joys of sense. The scandalmongers of the capital saw a lover in every man with whom she talked. She did, in fact, set convention at defiance. She dressed in men's clothing. She showed what the unemotional Scots thought to be unseemly levity. The French poet, Chastelard, misled by her external signs of favor, believed himself to be her choice. At the end of one mad revel he was found secreted beneath her bed and was driven out by force. A second time he ventured to secrete himself within the covers of the bed. Then he was dragged forth, imprisoned, and condemned to death. He met his fate without a murmur, save at the last when he stood upon the scaffold and, gazing toward the palace, cried in French, O oh, cruel queen, I die for you. Another favorite, the Italian David Rizzio, or Riccio, in like manner wrote love verses to the queen, and she replied to them in kind but there is no evidence that she valued him save for his ability, which was very great. She made him her foreign secretary, and the man whom he supplanted worked on the jealousy of Darnley, so that one night, while Mary and Rizzio were at dinner in a small private chamber, Darnley and the others broke in upon her. Darnley held her by the waist, while Rizzio was stabbed before her eyes with a cruelty the greater because the queen was soon to become a mother. From that moment she hated Darnley as one would hate a snake. She tolerated him only that he might acknowledge her child as his son. The child was a future James the Sixth of Scotland and James the First of England. It is recorded of him that never throughout his life could he bear to look upon drawn steel. After this, Mary summoned Bothwell again and again. It was revealed to her in a blaze of light that, after all, he was the one and only man who could be everything to her. His frankness, his cynicism, his mockery, his carelessness, his courage, and the power of his mind matched her moods completely. She threw away all semblance of concealment. She ignored the fact that he had married at her wish. She was queen. She desired him. She must have him at any cost. 
though i lose scotland and england both she cried in a passion of abandonment i shall have him for my own bothwell in his turn was nothing loath and they leaped at each other like two flames it was then that mary wrote those letters which were afterward discovered in a casket and which were used against her when she was on trial for her life these so-called casket letters though we have not now the originals are among the most extraordinary letters ever written all shame all hesitation all innocence are flung away in them the writer is so fired with passion that each sentence is like a cry to a lover in the dark as de peister says in them the animal instincts override and spur and lash the pen mary was committing to paper the frenzied madness of a woman consumed to her very marrow by the scorching blaze of unendurable desire events moved quickly darnley convalescent from an attack of smallpox was mysteriously destroyed by an explosion of gunpowder bothwell was divorced from his young wife on curious grounds a dispensation allowed mary to wed a protestant and she married bothwell three months after darnley's death here one sees the consummation of what had begun many years before in france from the moment that she and bothwell met their union was inevitable seas could not sunder them other loves and other fancies were as nothing to them even the bonds of marriage were burst asunder so that these two fiery panting souls could meet it was the irony of fate that when they had so met it was only to be parted mary's subjects outraged by her conduct rose against her as she passed through the streets of edinburgh the women hurled after her indecent names great banners were raised with execrable daubs representing the murdered darnley the short and dreadful monosyllable which is familiar to us in the pages of the bible was hurled after her wherever she went with bothwell by her side she led a wild and ragged horde of followers against the rebellious nobles whose forces met her at carberry hill her motley followers melted away and mary surrendered to the hostile chieftains who took her to the castle at lochlaven there she became the mother of twins a fact that is seldom mentioned by historians these children were the fruit of her union with bothwell from this time forth she cared but little for herself and she signed without great reluctance a document by which she abdicated in favor of her infant son even in this place of imprisonment however her fascination had power to charm among those who guarded her two of the douglas family george douglas and william douglas for love of her effected her escape the first attempt failed mary disguised as a laundress was betrayed by the delicacy of her hands but the second attempt was successful the queen passed through a postern gate and made her way to the lake where george douglas met her with a boat crossing the lake fifty horsemen under lord claude hamilton gave her their escort and bore her away in safety but mary was sick of scotland for bothwell could not be there she had tasted all the bitterness of life and for a few months all the sweetness but she would have no more of this rough and barbarous country of her own free will she crossed the Solway into England to find herself at once a prisoner. Never again did she set eyes on Bothwell. After the battle of Carberry Hill, he escaped to the north, gathered some ships together, and preyed upon English merchantmen, very much as a pirate might have done. Ere long, however, when he had heard of Mary's fate, he set sail for Norway. King Frederick of Denmark made him a prisoner of state. He was not confined within prison walls, however, but was allowed to hunt and ride in the vicinity of Malmo Castle and of Dragsholm. It is probably in Malmo Castle that he died. In 1858, a coffin, which was thought to be the coffin of an earl, was opened, and a Danish artist sketched the head, which corresponds quite well with the other portraits of the ill-fated Scottish noble. 
It is a sad story. Had Mary been less ambitious when she first met Bothwell, or had he been a little bolder, they might have reigned together and lived out their lives in the plentitude of that great love which held them both in thrall. But a queen is not as other women, and she found too late that the teaching of her heart was, after all, the truest teaching. She went to her death as Bothwell went to his, alone, in a strange, unfriendly land. Yet, even this perhaps was better so. It has at least touched both their lives with pathos, and has made the name of Mary Stuart one to be remembered throughout all the ages. End of Mary, Queen of Scots, and Lord Bothwell Queen Christina of Sweden and the Marquis Monaldeschi. Volume One of Famous Affinities of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr. Volume One Queen Christina of Sweden and the Marquis Monaldeschi. Sweden today is one of the peaceful kingdoms of the world, whose people are prosperous, well-governed, and somewhat apart from the clash and turmoil of other states and nations. Even the secession of Norway, a few years ago, was accomplished without bloodshed, and now the two kingdoms exist side by side, as free from strife as they are with Denmark, which once domineered and tyrannized over both. It is difficult to believe that long ago, in the Middle Ages, the cities of southern Sweden were among the great commercial centers of the world. Stockholm and Lund ranked with London and Paris. They absorbed the commerce of the northern seas, and were the admiration of thousands of travelers and merchants who passed through them and trafficked with them. Much nearer to our own time, Sweden was the great military power of northern Europe. The ambassadors of the Swedish kings were received with the utmost deference in every court. Her soldiers won great battles and ended mighty wars. The England of Cromwell and Charles II was unimportant and isolated in comparison with this northern kingdom, which could pour forth armies of gigantic blond warriors, headed by generals astute as well as brave. It was no small matter then, in 1626, that the loyal Swedes were hoping that their queen would give birth to a male heir to succeed his splendid father, Gustavus Adolphus ranked by military historians as one of the six great generals whom the world had so far produced. The queen, a German princess of Brandenburg, had already borne two daughters, who died in infancy. The expectation was widespread and intense that she should now become the mother of a son, and the king himself was no less anxious. When the event occurred, the child was seen to be completely covered with hair, and for this reason the attendants at first believed that it was the desired boy. When their mistake was discovered, they were afraid to tell the king, who was waiting in his study for the announcement to be made. At last, when no one else would go to him, his sister, the Princess Caroline, volunteered to break the news. Gustavus was in truth a chivalrous, high-bred monarch. Though he must have been disappointed at the advent of a daughter, he showed no sign of dissatisfaction, or even of surprise. But, rising, he embraced his sister, saying, Let us thank God. I hope this girl will be as good as a boy to me. May God preserve her now that he has sent her. It is customary at almost all courts to pay less attention to the birth of a princess than to that of a prince. But Gustavus displayed his chivalry toward this little daughter, whom he named Christina. He ordered that the full royal salute should be fired in every fortress of his kingdom, and that displays of fireworks, balls of honor, and court functions should take place. For, as he said, this is the heir to my throne. And so from the first he took his child under his own keeping, 
and treated her as if she were a much-loved son as well as a successor. He joked about her looks when she was born, when she was mistaken for a boy. She will be clever, he said, for she has taken us all in. The Swedish people were as delighted with their little princess as were the people of Holland when the present Queen Wilhelmina was born, to carry on the succession of the House of Orange. On one occasion, the king and the small Christina, who were inseparable companions, happened to approach a fortress where they expected to spend the night. The commander of the castle was bound to fire a royal salute of fifty cannon in honor of his sovereign. Yet he dreaded the effect upon the princess of such a roaring and bellowing of artillery. He therefore sent a swift horseman to meet the royal party at a distance and explain his perplexity. Should he fire these guns or not? Would the king give an order? Gustavus thought for a moment and then replied, My daughter is the daughter of a soldier, and she must learn to lead a soldier's life. Let the guns be fired. The procession moved on. Presently fire spurted from the embrasures of the fort, and its batteries thundered in one great roar. The king looked down at Christina. Her face was aglow with pleasure and excitement. She clapped her hands and laughed, and cried out, More bang! More! 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 This is only one of a score of stories that were circulated about the princess, and the Swedes were more and more delighted with the girl who was to be their queen. Somewhat curiously, Christina's mother, Queen Maria, cared little for the child, and in fact came at last to detest her almost as much as the king loved her. It is hard to explain this dislike. Perhaps she had a morbid desire for a son, and begrudged the honors given to a daughter. Perhaps she was a little jealous of her own child, who took so much of the king's attention. Afterward, in writing of her mother, Christina excuses her, and says quite frankly, she could not bear to see me, because I was a girl, and an ugly girl at that. And she was right enough, for I was as tawny as a little Turk. This candid description of herself is hardly just. Christina was never beautiful, and she had a harsh voice. She was apt to be overbearing, even as a little girl. Yet she was a most interesting child, with an expressive face, large eyes, an aquiline nose, and the blonde hair of her people. There was nothing in this to account for her mother's intense dislike for her. It was currently reported at the time that attempts were made to maim or seriously injure the little princess. By what was made to seem an accident, she would be dropped upon the floor, and heavy articles of furniture would somehow manage to strike her. More than once a great beam fell mysteriously close to her, either in the palace or while she was passing through the streets. None of these things did her serious harm, however. Most of them she luckily escaped, but when she had grown to be a woman, one of her shoulders was permanently higher than the other. I suppose, said Christina, that I could be straightened if I would let the surgeons attend to it, but it isn't worth while to take the trouble. When Christina was four, Sweden became involved in a great war that had been raging for a dozen years between the Protestant and the Catholic states of Germany. Gradually the neighboring powers had been drawn into the struggle either to serve their own ends, or to support the faith of which they adhered. Gustavus Adolphus took up the sword with mixed motives, for he was full of enthusiasm for the imperiled cause of the Reformation, and at the same time he deemed it a favorable opportunity to assert his control over the shores of the Baltic. The warrior king summoned his army and prepared to invade Germany. Before departing, he took his little daughter by the hand and led her among the assembled nobles and counselors of state. To them he entrusted the princess, making them kneel and vow that they would regard her as his heir, and, if aught should happen to him, as his successor. Amid the clashing of swords and the clang of armor, this vow was taken, and the king went forth to war. He met the ablest generals of his army, and the fortunes of battle swayed hither and thither, but the climax came when his soldiers encountered those of Wallenstein, that strange, overbearing, arrogant, mysterious creature whom many regarded with a sort of awe. The clash came at Lutzen, in Saxony. The Swedish king fought long and hard, and so did his mighty opponent. But at last, in the very midst of a tremendous onset that swept all before him, Gustavus received a mortal wound and died. 
even while Wallenstein was fleeing from the field of battle. The Battle of Lutzen made Christina Queen of Sweden at the age of six. Of course, she could not yet be crowned, but a council of able ministers continued the policy of the late king and taught the young queen her first lessons in statecraft. Her intellect soon showed itself as more than that of a child. She understood all that was taking place and all that was planned and arranged. Her tact was unusual. Her discretion was admired by everyone, and after a while she had the advice and training of the great Swedish Chancellor Oxenstierna, whose wisdom she shared to a remarkable degree. Before she was sixteen, she had so approved herself to her counselors, and especially to the people at large, that there was a widespread clamor that she should take the throne and govern in her own person. To this she gave no heed, but said, I am not yet ready. All this time she bore herself like a king. There was nothing distinctly feminine about her. She took but slight interest in her appearance. She wore sword and armor in the presence of her troops, and often she dressed entirely in men's clothes. She would take long, lonely gallops through the forests, brooding over problems of state and feeling no fatigue or fear. And indeed, why should she fear who was beloved by all her subjects? When her eighteenth year arrived, the demand for her coronation was impossible to resist. All Sweden wished to see a ruling queen, who might marry and have children to succeed her through the royal line of her great father. Christina consented to be crowned, but she absolutely refused all thought of marriage. She had more suitors from all parts of Europe than even Elizabeth of England, but, unlike Elizabeth, she did not dally with them, give them false hopes, or use them for the political advantage of her kingdom. At that time Sweden was stronger than England, and was so situated as to be independent of alliances. So Christina said, in her harsh, preemptory voice, I shall never marry, and why should you speak of my having children? I am just as likely to give birth to a Nero as to an Augustus. Having assumed the throne, she ruled with a strictness of government such as Sweden had not known before. She took the reins of state into her own hands and carried out a foreign policy of her own, over the heads of her ministers and even against the wishes of her people. The fighting upon the continent had dragged out to a weary length, but the Swedes, on the whole, had scored a marked advantage. For this reason the war was popular, and everyone wished it to go on. But Christina, of her own will, decided that it must stop, that mere glory was not to be considered against material advantages. Sweden had had enough of glory. She must now look to her enrichment and prosperity through the channels of peace. Therefore, in 1648, against Oxenstierna, against her generals, and against her people, she exercised her royal power and brought the Thirty Years' War to an end by the so-called Peace of Westphalia. At this time she was twenty-two, and by her personal influence she had ended one of the greatest struggles of history. Nor had she done it to her country's loss. Denmark yielded up rich provinces, while Germany was compelled to grant Sweden membership in the German Diet. When came a period of immense prosperity through commerce, through economies and government, through the improvement of agriculture and the opening of mines, this girl queen, without intrigue, without descending from her native nobility to peep and whisper with shady diplomats, showed herself in reality a great monarch, a true Semiramis of the North, more worthy of respect and reverence than Elizabeth of England. She was highly trained in many arts. She was fond of study, spoke Latin fluently, and could argue with Salmasius, Descartes, and other accomplished scholars without showing any inferiority to them. She gathered at her court distinguished persons from all countries. She repelled those who sought her hand, and she was pure and truthful and worthy of all men's admiration. Had she died at this time, history would rank her with the greatest of women sovereigns. Naud, the librarian of Cardinal Mazarin, wrote of her to the scientist Gassendi in these words. To say truth, I am sometimes afraid lest the common saying should be verified in her that short is the life and rare the old age of those who surpass the common limits. Do not imagine that she has learned only in books, 
for she is equally so in painting, architecture, sculpture, metals, antiquities, and all curiosities. There is not a cunning workman in these arts but she has him fetched. There are as good workers in wax and in enamel, engravers, singers, players, dancers here, as will be found anywhere. She has a gallery of statues, bronze and marble, medals of gold, silver, and bronze, pieces of ivory, amber, coral, worked crystal, steel mirrors, clocks and tables, bass reliefs, and other things of the kind. Richer I have never seen, even in Italy. Finally, a great quantity of pictures. In short, her mind is open to all impressions. But after she began to make her court a sort of home for art and letters, it ceased to be the sort of court that Sweden was prepared for. Christina's subjects were still rude and lacking in accomplishments. Therefore she had to summon men of genius from other countries, especially from France and Italy. Many of these were illustrious artists or scholars, but among them were also some who used their mental gifts for harm. Among these latter was a French physician named Bourdelot, a man of keen intellect, of winning manners, and of a profound cynicism, which was not apparent on the surface, but the effect of which was lasting. To Bourdelot we must chiefly ascribe the mysterious change which gradually came over Queen Christina. With his associates he taught her a distaste for the simple and healthy life that she had been accustomed to lead. She ceased to think of the welfare of the state, and began to look down with scorn upon her unsophisticated Swedes. Foreign luxury displayed itself at Stockholm, and her palaces overflowed with beautiful things. By subtle means Bordelot undermined her principles. Having been a Stoic, she now became an Epicurean. She was by nature devoid of sentiment. She would not spend her time in the niceties of love-making, as did Elizabeth but beneath the surface she had a sort of tigerish, passionate nature, which would break forth at intervals, and which demanded satisfaction from a series of favorites. It is probable that Bordelot was her first lover, but there were many others whose names are recorded in the annals of the time. When she threw aside her virtue, Christina ceased to care about appearances. She squandered her revenues upon her favorites. What she retained of her former self was a carelessness that braved the opinion of her subjects. She dressed almost without thought, and it is said that she combed her hair not more than twice a month. She caroused with male companions to the scandal of her people, and she swore like a trooper when displeased. Christina's philosophy of life appears to have been compounded of an almost brutal licentiousness, a strong love of power, and a strange, freakish longing for something new. Her political ambitions were checked by the rising discontent of her people, who began to look down upon her and to feel ashamed of her shame. Knowing herself as she did, she did not care to marry. Yet Sweden must have an heir. Therefore she chose out her cousin Charles, declared that he was to be her successor, and finally caused him to be proclaimed as such before the assembled estates of the realm. She even had him crowned, and finally, in her twenty-eighth year, she abdicated altogether and prepared to leave Sweden. When asked whether she would go, she replied in a Latin quotation, The fates will show the way. In her act of abdication, she reserved to herself the revenues of some of the richest provinces in Sweden, and absolute power over such of her subjects as should accompany her. They were to be her subjects until the end. The Swedes remembered that Christina was the daughter of their greatest king, and that, apart from personal scandals, she had ruled them well. And so they let her go regretfully, and accepted her cousin as their king. Christina, on her side, went joyfully and in the spirit of a grand adventuress. With a numerous suite she entered Germany, and then stayed for a year at Brussels, where she renounced Lutheranism. After this she traveled slowly into Italy, where she entered Bourne on horseback, and was received by the Pope Alexander the Seventh, who lodged her in a magnificent palace, accepted her conversion, and baptized her, giving her a new name, Alexandra. In Rome she was a brilliant but erratic personage, living sumptuously, 
even though her revenues from Sweden came in slowly, partly because the Swedes disliked her change of religion. She was surrounded by men of letters, with whom she amused herself, and she took to herself a lover, the Marquis Monaldeschi. She thought that at last she had really found her true affinity, while Monaldeschi believed that he could count on the Queen's fidelity. He was in attendance upon her daily, and they were almost inseparable. He swore allegiance to her, and thereby made himself one of the subjects over whom she had absolute power. For a time he was the master of those intense emotions which, in her, altered with moods of coldness and even cruelty. Monaldeschi was a handsome Italian, who bore himself with a fine air of breeding. He understood the art of charming, but he did not know that beyond a certain time no one could hold the affections of Christina. However, after she had quarreled with various cardinals and decided to leave Rome for a while, Monaldeschi accompanied her to France, where she had an immense vogue at the court of Louis XIV. She attracted wide attention because of her eccentricity and utter lack of manners. It gave her the greatest delight to criticize the ladies of the French court, their looks, their gowns, and their jewels. They, in return, would speak of Christina's deformed shoulder and skinny frame, but the king was very gracious to her and invited her to his hunting palace at Fontainebleau. While she had been winning triumphs of sarcasm, the infatuated Monaldeschi had gradually come to suspect, and then to know, that his royal mistress was no longer true to him. He had been supplanted in her favor by another Italian, one Sentinelli, who was the captain of her guard. Monaldeschi took a torturous and roundabout revenge. He did not let the queen know of his discovery, nor did he, like a man, send a challenge to Sentinelli. Instead, he began by betraying her secrets to Oliver Cromwell, with whom she had tried to establish a correspondence. Again, imitating the hand and seal of Sentinelli, he sent in circulation a series of the most scandalous and insulting letters about Christina. By this treacherous trick, he hoped to end the relations between his rival and the queen. But when the letters were carried to Christina, she instantly recognized their true source. She saw that she was betrayed by her former favorite, and that he had taken a revenge which might seriously compromise her. This led to a tragedy, of which the facts were long obscure. They were carefully recorded, however, by the Queen's household chaplain, Father Labelle, and there is also a narrative written by one Marco Antonio Conti, which confirms the story. Both were published privately in 1865, with notes by Louis Lacour. The narration of the priest is dreadful in its simplicity and minuteness of detail. It may be summed up briefly here, because it is the testimony of an eyewitness who knew Christina. Christina, with the Marquis and a large retinue, was at Fontainebleau in November 1657. A little after midnight, when all was still, the priest, Father Labelle, was aroused and ordered to go at once to the Galerie des Cerfs, or Hall of Stags, in another part of the palace. When he asked why, he was told, It is by the order of Her Majesty, the Swedish Queen. The priest, wondering, hurried on his garments. On reaching the gloomy hall, he saw the Marquis Monaldeschi, evidently in great agitation, and at the end of the corridor the Queen in somber robes. Beside the Queen, as if awaiting orders, stood three figures, who could with some difficulty be made out as three soldiers of her guard. The Queen motioned to Father Labelle, and asked him for a packet which she had given him for safekeeping some little time before. He gave it to her, and she opened it. In it were letters and other documents, which, with a steely glance, she displayed to Monaldeschi. He was confused by the sight of them, and by the incisive words in which Christina showed how he had both insulted her and had tried to shift the blame upon Sentinelli. Monaldeschi broke down completely. He fell at the queen's feet and wept piteously, begging for pardon, only to be met by the cold answer, You are my subject and a traitor to me. Marquis, you must prepare to die. Then she turned away and left the hall, in spite of the cries of Monaldeschi. 
to whom she merely added the advice that he should make his peace with God by confessing to Father Labelle. After she had gone, the Marquis fell into a torrent of self-exculpation and cried for mercy. The three armed men drew near and urged him to confess for the good of his soul. They seemed to have no malice against him, but to feel that they must obey the orders given them. At the frantic urging of the Marquis, their leader even went to the Queen to ask whether she would relent, but he returned, shaking his head, and said, Marquis, you must die. Father Labelle undertook a like mission, but he returned with the message that there was no hope. So the Marquis made his confession in French and Latin, but even then he hoped, for he did not want to receive absolution, but begged still further for delay or pardon. Then the three armed men approached, having drawn their swords. The absolution was pronounced, and, following it, one of the guards slashed the Marquis across the forehead. He stumbled and fell forward, making signs as if to ask that he might have his throat cut. But his throat was partly protected by a coat of mail, so that three or four strokes delivered there had slight effect. Finally, however, a long, narrow sword was thrust into his side, after which the Marquis made no sound. Father Labelle at once left the Galerie de Cerfs and went into the Queen's apartment, with the smell of blood in his nostrils. He found her calm and ready to justify herself. Was she not still Queen over all who had voluntarily become members of her suite? This had been agreed to in her act of abdication. Wherever she set her foot, there, over her own, she was still a monarch, with full power to punish traitors at her will. This power she had exercised, and with justice. What mattered it that she was in France? She was queen as truly as Louis the Fourteenth was king. The story was not long in getting out, but the truth was not wholly known until a much later day. It was said that Sentinelli had slapped the Marquis in a fit of jealousy, though some added that it was done with the connivance of the queen. King Louis, the incarnation of absolutism, knew the truth, but he was slow to act. He sympathized with the theory of Christina's sovereignty. It was only after a time that word was sent to Christina that she must leave Fontainebleau. She took no notice of the order until it suited her convenience, and then she went forth with all the honors of a reigning monarch. This was the most striking episode in all the strange story of her private life. When her cousin Charles, whom she had made king, died without an heir, she sought to recover her crown but the estates of the realm refused her claim, reduced her income, and imposed restraints upon her power. She then sought the vacant throne of Poland, but the Polish nobles, who desired a weak ruler for their own purposes, made another choice. So at last she returned to Rome, where the Pope received her with a splendid procession and granted her twelve thousand crowns a year to make up for her lessened Swedish revenue. From this time she lived a life which she made interesting by her patronage of learning and exciting by her rather unseemly quarrels with cardinals and even with the Pope. Her armed retinue marched through the streets with drawn swords and gave open protection to criminals who had taken refuge with her. She dared to criticize the pontiff, who merely smiled and said, She is a woman. On the whole, the end of her life was pleasant. She was much admired for her sagacity in politics. Her words were listened to at every court in Europe. She annotated the classics, she made beautiful collections, and she was regarded as a privileged person whose acts no one took amiss. She died at fifty-three and was buried in St. Peter's. She was bred a man, she was almost a son to her great father, and yet, instead of the sonorous epitaph that is inscribed beside her tomb, Perhaps a truer one would be the words of the vexed Pope. E donna. End of Queen Christina of Sweden and the Marquis Monaldeschi. King Charles the Second and Nell Gwyn, Volume One of Famous Affinities of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr Volume 1 
King Charles the Second, and Nell Gwen. One might classify the kings of England in many ways. John was undoubtedly the most unpopular. The impetuous yet far-seeing Henry the Second, with the other two great warriors, Edward the First and Edward the Third, and William of Orange, did most for the foundation and development of England's constitutional law. Some monarchs, such as Edward the Second, and the womanish Henry the Sixth, have been contemptible. Hard-working, useful kings have been Henry the Seventh, the Georges, William the Fourth, and especially the last Edward. If we consider those monarchs who have in some curious way touched the popular fancy without reference to their virtues, we must go back to Richard of the Lionheart, who saw but little of England, yet was the best essentially English king, and to Henry V, gallant soldier and conqueror of France. Even Henry VIII had a warm place in the affection of his countrymen, few of whom saw him near at hand, but most of whom made him a sort of regal incarnation of John Bull, wrestling and tilting and boxing, eating great joints of beef, and staying his thirst with flagons of ale, a big, healthy, masterful animal, in fact, who gratified the national love of splendor and stood up manfully in his struggle with the Pope. But if you look for something more than ordinary popularity, something that belongs to sentiment and makes men willing to become martyrs for a royal cause, we must find these among the Stuart kings. It is odd, indeed, that even at this day there are English men and English women who believe their lawful sovereign to be a minor Bavarian princess in whose veins runs the Stuart blood. Prayers are said for her at English shrines, and toasts are drunk to her in rare old wine. Of course today this cult of the Stuarts is nothing but a fad. No one ever expects to see a Stuart on the English throne, but it is significant of the deep strain of romance which the six Stuarts who reigned in England have implanted in the English heart. The old Jacobite ballads still have power to thrill. Queen Victoria herself used to have the pipers file out before her at Balmoral to the skirling of Bonnie Dundee, over the water to Charlie, and what'll be king but Charlie? It is a sentiment that has never died. Her late majesty used to say that when she heard these tunes she became for the moment a Jacobite, just as the Empress Eugene, at the height of her power, used partly to remark that she herself was the only legitimist left in France. It may be suggested that the Stuarts are still loved by many Englishmen because they were unfortunate, yet this is hardly true after all. Many of them were fortunate enough. The first of them, King James, an absurd creature, speaking broad Scotch, timid, foolishly fond of favorites, and having none of the dignity of a monarch, lived out a lengthy reign. The two royal women of the family, Anne and Mary, had no misfortunes of a public nature. Charles the Second reigned for more than a quarter of a century, lapped in every kind of luxury, and died a king. The first Charles was beheaded, and afterwards styled a saint, yet the majority of the English people were against his arrogance, or else he would have won his great struggle against the Parliament. The second James was not popular at all. Nevertheless, no sooner had he been expelled and been succeeded by a Dutchman gnawing asparagus and reeking of cheeses, then there was already a Stuart legend. Even had there been no pretenders to carry on the cult, the Stuarts would still have passed into history as much loved by the people. It only shows how very little in former days the people expected of a regent king. Many monarchs have had just a few popular traits, and these have stood out brilliantly against the darkness of the background. No one could have cared greatly for the first James, but Charles I was indeed a kingly personage when viewed afar. He was handsome, as a man, fully equaling the French princess who became his wife. He had no personal vices. He was brave and good to look upon, and had a kingly mane. Hence, although he sought to make his rule over England a tyranny, there were many fine old cavaliers to ride a field for him when he raised his standard 
and who, when he died, mourned for him as a martyr. Many hardships they underwent while Cromwell ruled with his iron hand, and when that iron hand was relaxed in death, and poor, feeble Richard Cromwell slunk away to his country seat, what wonder is it that young Charles came back to England, and carousled through the streets of London, with a smile for every one, and a happy laugh upon his lips? What wonder is it that the cannon in the tower thundered a loud welcome, and that all over England, at one season or another, maypoles rose and Christmas fires blazed? For Englishmen at heart are not only monarchists, but they are lovers of good cheer and merrymaking and all sorts of mirth. Charles the Second might well at first have seemed a worthier and wiser successor for his splendid father. As a child, even, he had shown himself to be no faint-hearted creature. When the great civil war broke out, he had joined his father's army. It met with disaster at Edgehill, and was finally shattered by the crushing defeat of Naseby, which afterward inspired Macaulay's most stirring ballad. Charles was then only a child of twelve, and so his followers did wisely in hurrying him out of England, through the Sicily Isles and Jersey, to his mother's place of exile. Of course, a child so very young could be of no value as a leader, though his presence might prove an inspiration. In 1648, however, when he was eighteen years of age, he gathered a fleet of eighteen ships and cruised along the English coast, taking prizes, which he carried to the Dutch ports. When he was at Holland's capital, during his father's trial, he wrote many messages to the parliamentarians, and even sent them a blank charter, which they might fill in with any stipulations they desired, if only they would save and restore their king. When the head of Charles rolled from the velvet-covered block, his son showed himself to be no loiterer or lover of an easy life. He hastened to Scotland, skillfully escaping an English force, and was proclaimed as king and crowned at Scone in 1651. With ten thousand men he dashed into England, where he knew there would be many who would rally at his call. But it was then that Cromwell put forth his supreme military genius, and with his ironsides crushed the royal troops at Worcester. Charles knew that for the present all was lost. He showed courage and address in covering the flight of his beaten soldiers, but he soon afterward went to France, remaining there and in the Netherlands for eight years as a pensioner of Louis the Fourteenth. He knew that time would fight for him far more surely than infantry and horse. England had not been called Merry England for nothing, and Cromwell's tyranny was likely to be far more resented than the heavy hand of one who was born a king. So Charles at Paris and Liege, though he had little money at the time, managed to maintain a royal court such as it was. Here there came out another side of his nature. As a child he had borne hardship and privation, and had seen the red blood flow upon the battlefield. Now, as it were, he allowed a certain sensuous, pleasure-loving ease to envelop him. The red blood should become the rich red burgundy. The sound of trumpets and kettle drums should give way to the melody of lutes and viols. He would be a king of pleasure if he were to be a king at all, and therefore his court, even in exile, was a court of gallantry and ease. The Pope refused to lend him money, and the King of France would not increase his pension, but there were many who foresaw that Charles would not long remain in exile, and so they gave him what he wanted, and waited until he could give them what they would ask for in their turn. Charles at this time was not handsome, like his father. His complexion was swarthy, his figure by no means imposing, though always graceful. When he chose, he could bear himself with all the dignity of a monarch. He had a singularly pleasant manner, and a word from him could win over the harshest opponent. The old cavaliers who accompanied their master in exile were like Napoleon's veterans and Elba. With their tall, powerful forms, they stalked about the courtyards, sniffing their disapproval at these foreign ways and longing grimly for the time when they could once more smell the pungent powder of the battlefield. But, as Charles had hoped, the change was coming. Not merely were his own subjects beginning to long for him, and to pray in secret for the king, but continental monarchs who maintained spies in England began to know of this. To them, Charles was no longer a penniless exile. He was a king who, before long, would take possession of his kingdom. 
a very wise woman, the Queen Regent of Portugal, was the first to act on this information. Portugal was then very far from being a petty state. It had wealth at home and rich colonies abroad, while its flag was seen on every sea. The Queen Regent, being at odds with Spain, and wishing to secure an ally against that power, made overtures to Charles, asking him whether a match might not be made between him and the Princess Catherine of Braganza. It was not merely her daughter's hand that she offered, but a splendid dowry. She would pay Charles a million pounds in gold, and cede to England two valuable ports. The match was not yet made, but by 1659 it had been arranged. The Spaniards were furious, for Charles's cause began to appear successful. She was a quaint and rather piteous little figure, she who was destined to be the wife of the merry monarch. Catherine was dark, petite, and by no means beautiful. Yet she had a very sweet expression and a heart of utter innocence. She had been wholly convent-bred. She knew nothing of the world. She was told that in marriage she must obey in all things, and that the chief duty of a wife was to make her husband happy. Poor child! It was a too gracious preparation for a very graceless husband. Charles, in exile, had already made more than one discreditable connection, and he was already the father of more than one growing son. First of all, he had been smitten by the bold ways of one Lucy Walters. Her impudence amused the exiled monarch. She was not particularly beautiful, and when she spoke, as others did, she was rather tiresome. But her pertness and the inexperience of the king when he went into exile made her seem attractive. She bore him a son, in the person of that brilliant adventurer whom Charles afterward created Duke of Monmouth. Many persons believe that Charles had married Lucy Walters, just as George the Fourth may have married Miss Fitzherbert, yet there is not the slightest proof of it, and it must be classed with popular legends. There was also one Catherine Pegg, or Kep, whose son was afterward made Earl of Plymouth. It must be confessed that in his attachments to English women, Charles showed little care for rank or station. Lucy Walters and Catherine Pegg were very illiterate creatures. In a way, it was precisely this sort of preference that made Charles so popular among the people. He seemed to make rank of no account, but would chat in the most familiar and friendly way with anyone whom he happened to meet. His easy, democratic manner, coupled with the grace and prestige of royalty, made friends for him all over England. The treasury might be nearly bankrupt, the navy might be routed by the Dutch, the king himself might be too much given to dissipation, but his people forgave him all, because everybody knew that Charles would clap an honest citizen on the back and joke with all who came to see him feed the swans in Regent Park. The popular name for him was Rowley, or Old Rowley, a nickname of mysterious origin, although it is said to have been given him from a fancied resemblance to a famous hunter in his stables. Perhaps it is the very final test of popularity that a ruler should have a nickname known to everyone. Cromwell's death roused all England to a frenzy of king worship. The Roundhead, General Monk, and his soldiers proclaimed Charles King of England and escorted him to London in splendid state. That was a day when national feeling reached a point such as never has been seen before or since. Autred, the famous mathematician, died of joy when the royal emblems were restored. Urquhart, the translator of Rabelais, died, it is said, of laughter at the people's wild delight, a truly Rabelaisian end. There was the king once more, and England, breaking through its long period of Puritanism, laughed and danced with more vivacity than ever the French had shown. All the pipers and the players and panderers to vice, the mountebanks, the sensual men, the lawless women, poured into the presence of the king, who had been too long deprived of the pleasure that his nature craved. Parliament voted seventy thousand pounds for a memorial to Charles's father, but the irresponsible king spent the whole sum on the women who surrounded him. His severest counsellor, Lord Clarendon, sent him a remonstrance. How can I build such a memorial, asked Charles, when I don't know where my father's remains are buried? He took money from the King of France to make war against the Dutch, who had befriended him. 
It was the French king, too, who sent him that insidious, subtle daughter of Brittany, Louise de Carouel, the Duchess of Portsmouth, a diplomat in petticoats, who won the king's wayward affections, and spied on what he did and said, and faithfully reported all of it to Paris. She became the mother of the Duke of Lennox, and she was feared and hated by the English more than any other of his mistresses. They called her Madame Carwell, and they seemed to have an instinct that she was no mere plaything of his idle hours, but was like some strange exotic serpent, whose poison might in the end sting the honor of England. There is a pitiful little episode in the marriage of Charles with his Portuguese bride, Catherine of Braganza. The royal girl came to him, fresh from the cloisters of her convent. There was something about her grace and innocence that touched the dissolute monarch, who was by no means without a heart. For a time he treated her with great respect, and she was happy. At last she began to notice about her strange faces, faces that were evil, wanton, or overbold. The court became more and more a seat of reckless revelry. Finally Catherine was told that the Duchess of Cleveland, that splendid termagant, Barbara Villiers, had been appointed Lady of the Bedchamber. She was told at the same time who this vixen was, that she was no fit attendant for a virtuous woman and that her three sons, the Dukes of Southampton, Grafton, and Northumberland, were also the sons of Charles. Fluttered and frightened and dismayed, the Queen hastened to her husband and begged him not to put his slight upon her. A year or two before, she had never dreamed that life contained such things as these, but now it seemed to contain nothing else. Charles spoke sternly to her until she burst into tears, and then he petted her and told her that her duty as a Queen compelled her to submit to many things which a lady in private life need not endure. After a long and poignant struggle with her own emotions, the little Portuguese yielded to the wishes of her lord. She never again reproached him. She even spoke with kindness to his favorites and made him feel that she studied his happiness alone. Her gentleness affected him so that he always spoke to her with courtesy and real friendship. When the Protestant mobs sought to drive her out of England, he showed his courage and manliness by standing by her and refusing to allow her to be molested. Indeed, had Charles been always at his best, he would have had a very different name in history. He could be in every sense a king. He had a king knowledge of human nature. Though he governed England very badly, he never governed it so badly as to lose his popularity. The epigram of Rochester, written at the king's own request, was singularly true of Charles, no man relied upon his word, yet men loved him. He never said anything that was foolish, and he very seldom did anything that was wise. Yet his easy manners and gracious ways endeared him to those who met him. One can find no better picture of his court than that which Sir Walter Scott has drawn so vividly in Peveril of the Peak. Or, if one wishes first-hand evidence, it can be found in the diaries of Evelyn and Samuel Pepys. In them we find the rakes and dicers, full of strange oaths, deep drunkards, vile women, and still viler men, all striving for the royal favor and offering the filthiest lures, amid routs and balls and noisy entertainments, of which it is recorded that more than once some woman gave birth to a child among the crowd of dancers. No wonder that the little Portuguese queen kept to herself and did not let herself be drawn into the swirling, roaring, roistering Saturnalia. She had less influence even than Maul Davis, whom Charles picked out of a coffee-house, and far less than Madame Carwell, to whom it is reported that a great English nobleman once presented pearls to the value of eight thousand pounds in order to secure her influence in a single stroke of political business. Of all the women who surrounded Charles, there was only one who cared anything for him or for England. The rest were all either selfish or treacherous or base. This one exception has been so greatly written of, both in fiction and in history, as to make it seem almost unnecessary to add another word. Yet it may well be worth while to separate the fiction from the fact and to see how much of the legend of Eleanor Gwynne is true. The fanciful story of her birthplace is most surely quite unfounded. She was not the daughter of a Welsh officer, but of two petty hucksters who had their booth in the lowest precincts of London. In those days the Strand was partly open country, 
and as it neared the city it showed the mansions of the gentry set in their green-walled parks. At one end of the Strand, however, was Drury Lane, then the haunt of criminals and every kind of wretch, while nearer still was the notorious coal yard where no citizen dared go unarmed. Within this dreadful place, children were kidnapped and trained to various forms of vice. It was a school for murderers and robbers and prostitutes, and every night when the torches flared, it vomited forth its deadly spawn. Here was the earliest home of Eleanor Gwen, and out of this den of iniquity she came at night to sell oranges at the entrance to the theaters. She was stage-struck, and endeavored to get even a minor part in a play. But Betterton, the famous actor, thrust her aside when she ventured to apply to him. It must be said that in everything that was external, except her beauty, she fell short of a fastidious taste. She was intensely ignorant, even for that time. She spoke in a broad, cockney dialect. She had lived the life of the coal yard, and, like Zola's Nana, she could never remember the time when she had known the meaning of chastity. Nell Gwynne was, in fact, a product of the vilest slums of London, and precisely because she was this, we must set her down as intrinsically a good woman, one of the truest, frankest, and most right-minded of whom the history of such women has anything to tell. All that external circumstances could do to push her down into the mire was done, yet she was not pushed down, but emerged as one of those rare souls who have in their natures an uncontaminated spring of goodness and honesty. Unlike Barbara Villiers or Lucy Walters or Louise de Keruel, she was neither a harpy nor a foe to England. Charles is said first to have met her when he, incognito with another friend, was making the rounds of the theatres at night. The king spied her glowing, nut-brown face in one of the boxes, and, forgetting his incognito, went up and joined her. She was with her protector of the time, Lord Buckhurst, who, of course, recognized his majesty. Presently the whole party went out to a neighboring coffee-house, where they drank and ate together, when it came time to pay the reckoning, the king found that he had no money, nor had his friend. Lord Buckhurst, therefore, paid the bill, while Mistress Nell jeered at the other two, saying that this was the most poverty-stricken party that she had ever met. Charles did not lose sight of her. Her frankness and honest manner pleased him. There came a time when she was known to be a mistress of the king, and she bore a son, who was ennobled as the Duke of St. Albans but who did not live to middle age. Nell Gwynne was much with Charles, and after his tempestuous scenes with Barbara Villiers, and the feeling of dishonor which the Duchess of Portsmouth made him experience, the girl's good English bluntness was a pleasure far more rare than sentiment. Somehow, just as the people had come to mistrust Madame Carwell, they so came to like Nell Gwynne. She saw enough of Charles, and she liked him well enough to wish that he might do his duty by his people and she alone had the boldness to speak out what she thought. One day she found him lolling in an armchair and complaining that the people were not satisfied. "'You can very easily satisfy them,' said Nell Gwen. "'Dismiss your women and attend to the proper business of a king.' Again her heart was touched at the misfortunes of the old soldiers who had fought for Charles and for his father during the Civil War, and who were now neglected, while the treasury was emptied for French favorites and while the policy of England itself was bought and sold in France. Many and many a time, when other women of her kind used their lures to get jewels or titles or estates or actual heaps of money, Nell Gwen besought the king to aid these needy veterans. Because of her efforts, Chelsea Hospital was founded. Such money as she had, she shared with the poor and with those who fought for her royal lover. As I have said, she is a historical type of woman who loses her physical purity, yet who retains a sense of honor and honesty which nothing can take from her. There are not many such examples, and therefore this one is worth remembering. Of anecdotes concerning her there are many, but not often has their real import been detected. If she could twine her arms about the monarch's neck and transport him in a delirium of passion, this was only part of what she did. She tried to keep him right and true and worthy of his rank, and after he had ceased to care much for her as a lover, he remembered that she had been faithful in many other things. 
Then there came the deathbed scene, when Charles, in his inimitable manner, apologized to those about him because he was so long in dying. A far sincerer sentence was that which came from his heart, as he cried out in the very pangs of death, Do not let poor Nelly starve. End of King Charles the Second and Nell Gwen. The Story of Prince Charles Edward Stuart, Volume One of Famous Affinities of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr, Volume One. The Story of Prince Charles Edward Stuart. The royal families of Europe are widely known, yet not all of them are equally renowned. Thus, the house of Romanov, although comparatively young, stands out to the mind with a sort of barbaric power, more vividly than the Austrian house of Habsburg, which is the oldest reigning family in Europe, tracing its beginnings backward until they are lost in the Dark Ages. The Hohenzollerns of Prussia are comparatively modern, so far as concerns their royalty. The offshoots of the Bourbons carry on a very proud tradition in the person of the King of Spain, although France, which has been ruled by so many members of the family, will probably never again behold a Bourbon king. The deposed Braganzas bear a name which is ancient, but which has a somewhat tinsel sound. The Bonapartes, of course, are merely parvenus, and they have had the good taste to pretend to no antiquity of birth. The first Napoleon, dining at a table full of monarchs, when he heard one of them deferentially alluding to the Bonaparte family as being very old and noble, exclaimed, Pish, my nobility dates from the day of Marengo. And the third Napoleon, in announcing his coming marriage with Mademoiselle de Montillo, used the very word parvenu in speaking of himself and of his family. His frankness won the hearts of the French people and helped to reconcile them to a marriage in which the bride was barely noble. In English history, there are two great names to conjure by, at least to the imaginative. One is Plantagenet, which seems to contain within itself the very essence of all that is patrician, magnificent, and royal. It calls to memory at once the lion-hearted Richard, whose short reign was replete with romance in England and France and Austria and the Holy Land. But perhaps a name of greater influence is that which links the royal family of Britain today with the traditions of the past, and which summons up legend and story and great deeds of history. This is the name of Stuart, about which a whole volume might be written to recall its suggestions and its reminiscences. The first Stuart, then Stuart, of whom anything is known, got his name from the title of Stuart of Scotland which remained in the family for generations, until the sixth of the line, by marriage with Princess Marjorie Bruce, acquired the Scottish crown. That was in the early years of the fourteenth century, and finally, after the death of Elizabeth of England, her rival son, James the sixth of Scotland and first of England, united under one crown two kingdoms that had so long been at almost constant war. It is almost characteristic of a Scot that, having small territory, little wealth, and a seat among his peers that is almost ostentatiously humble, he should bit by bit absorb the possessions of all the rest and become their master. Surely, the proud Tudors, whose line ended with Elizabeth, must have despised the stewards, whose kingdom was small and bleak and cold, and who could not control their own vassals. One can imagine also, with Sir Walter Scott, the haughty nobles of the English court sneering covertly at the awkward, shambling James, pedant and bookworm. Nevertheless, his diplomacy was almost as good as that of Elizabeth herself, and, though he did some foolish things, he was very far from being a fool. In his appearance, James was not unlike Abraham Lincoln, an unlikely figure, and yet, like Lincoln, when occasion required it, he could rise to the dignity which makes one feel the presence of a king. He was the only steward who lacked anything in form or feature or external grace. His son, Charles I, was perhaps one of the worst rulers that England has ever had, yet his uprightness of life, his melancholy yet handsome face, his graceful bearing, and the strong religious element in his character, together with the fact that he was put to death after being treacherously surrendered to his enemies, all these have combined to make almost a saint of him. 
There are Englishmen today who speak of him as the martyr king, and who, on certain days of the year, say prayers that beg the Lord's forgiveness because of Charles's execution. The members of the so-called League of the White Rose, founded to perpetuate English allegiance to the direct line of Stuarts, do many things that are quite absurd. They refuse to pray for the present King of England, and profess to think that the Princess Mary of Bavaria is the true ruler of Great Britain. All this represents that trace of sentiment which lingers among the English today. They feel that the Stuarts were the last kings of England to rule by the grace of God, rather than by the grace of Parliament. As a matter of fact, the present reigning family in England is glad to derive its ancient strain of royal blood through a Stuart, descended on the distaff side from James I, and winding its way through Hanover. The sentiment for the Stuarts is a thing entirely apart from reason, and belongs to the realm of poetry and romance, yet so strong is it that it has shown itself in a most inconsistent fashion. For instance, Sir Walter Scott was a devoted adherent of the House of Hanover. When George the Fourth visited Edinburgh, Scott was completely carried away by his loyal enthusiasm. He could not see that the man before him was a drunkard and a braggart. He viewed him as an incarnation of all the noble traits that ought to hedge about a king. He snatched up a wine glass from which George had just been drinking, and carried it away to be an object of reverence for ever after. Nevertheless, in his heart, and often in his speech, Scott seemed to be a high Tory, and even a Jacobite. There are precedents for this. The Empress Eugene used often to say, with a laugh, that she was the only true royalist at the imperial court of France. That was well enough for her in her days of flightiness and frivolity. No one, however, accused Queen Victoria of being frivolous, and she was not supposed to have a strong sense of humor. Nonetheless, after listening to the skirling of the bagpipes and to the romantic ballads which were sung in Scotland, she said to have remarked with a sort of sigh, Whenever I hear those ballads, I feel that England belongs really to the Stuarts. Before Queen Victoria was born, when all the sons of George the Third were childless, the Duke of Kent was urged to marry, so that he might have a family to continue the succession. In resenting the suggestion, he said many things, and among them, this was the most striking. Why don't you call the Stuarts back to England? They couldn't possibly make a worse mess of it than our fellows have. But he yielded to persuasion and married. From this marriage came Victoria, who had the sacred drop of Stuart blood, which gave England to the Hanoverians, and she was to redeem the blunders and tyrannies of both houses. The fascination of the Stuarts, which has been carried overseas to America, and the British dominions, probably began with the striking victory of Mary Queen of Scots. Her brilliancy and boldness and beauty, and especially the pathos of her end, have made us see only her intense womanliness, which in her day was the first thing that anyone observed in her. So, too, was Charles I, romantic figure and knightly gentleman. One regrets his death upon the scaffold, even though his execution was necessary to the growth of freedom. Many people are no less fascinated by Charles II, that very different type, with his gaiety, his good fellowship, and his easy-going ways. It is not surprising that his people, most of whom never saw him, were very fond of him, and did not know that he was selfish, a loose liver, and almost a vassal of the King of France. So it is not strange that the Stuarts, with all their arts and graces, were very hard to displace. James the Second, with the aid of the French, fought hard before the British troops in Ireland broke the backs of both his armies and sent him into exile. Again in 1715, an episode perpetuated in Thackeray's dramatic story of Henry Esmond, came the son of James to take advantage of the vacancy caused by the death of Queen Anne. But it is perhaps to this claimant's son, the last of the militant stewards, that more chivalrous feeling has been given than to any other. To his followers he was the young chevalier, the true Prince of Wales. To his enemies, the Whigs and the Hanoverians, he was the pretender. One of the most romantic chapters of history is the one which tells of that last brilliant dash which he made upon the coast of Scotland, landing with but a few attendants and rejecting the support of a French army. It is not with foreigners, he said, but with my own loyal subjects that I wish to regain the kingdom for my father. 
It was a daring deed, and a spectacular side of it has been often commemorated, especially in Sir Walter Scott's Waverley. There we see the gallant prince moving through a sort of military panorama. Most of the British troops were absent in Flanders, and the few regiments that could be mustered to meet him were appalled by the ferocity and reckless courage of the Highlanders, who leaped down like wildcats from their hills and flung themselves with dirk and sword upon the British cannon. We see Sir John Cope retiring at Falkirk, an astonishing victory of Preston Pan, where disciplined British troops fled in dismay through the morning mist, leaving artillery and supplies behind them. It is Scott again who shows us the prince, master of Edinburgh for a time, while the white rose of Stuart royalty held once more the ancient keep above the Scottish capital. Then we see the chevalier pressing southward into England, where he hoped to raise an English army to support his own. But his Highlanders cared nothing for England, and the English, even the Catholic gentry, would not rise to support his cause. Personally, he had every gift that could win allegiance. Handsome, high-tempered, and brave, he could also control his fiery spirit and listen to advice, however unpalatable it might be. The time was favorable. The British troops had been defeated on the continent by Marshal Saxe, of whom I have already written, and by Marshal d'Astre. George the Second was a king whom few respected. He could scarcely speak anything but German. He grossly ill-treated his wife. It is said that on one occasion, in the fit of temper, he actually kicked the prime minister. Not many felt any personal loyalty to him, and he spent most of his time away from England and in his other domain of Hanover. But precisely here was a reason why Englishmen were willing to put up with him. As between him and the brilliant steward, there would have been no hesitation, had the choice been merely one of the men. But it was believed that the return of the stewards meant the return of something like absolute government, of taxation without sanction of law, and of religious persecution. Under the Hanoverian George, the English people had begun to exercise a considerable measure of self-government. Sharp opposition in Parliament compelled him time and again to yield, and when he was in Hanover, the English were left to work out the problem of free government. Hence, although Prince Charles Edward fascinated all who met him, and although a small army was raised for his support, still the unromantic, common-sense Englishmen felt that things were better than in the days gone by, and most of them refused to take up arms for the cause which sentimentally they favored. Therefore, although the Chevalier stirred all England and sent a thrill through the officers of state in London, his soldiers gradually deserted, and the Scots insisted on returning to their own country. Although the Stuart troops reached a point as far south as Derby, they were soon pushed backward into Scotland, pursued by an army of about 9,000 men under the Duke of Cumberland, son of George the Second. Cumberland was no soldier. He had been soundly beaten by the French on the famous field of Fontenoy. Yet he had firmness and a sort of overmastering brutality, which, with disciplined troops and abundant artillery, were sufficient to win a victory over the untrained Highlanders. When the battle came, five thousand of these mountaineers went roaring along the English lines, with the chevalier himself at the head. For a moment there was surprise. The Duke of Cumberland had been drinking so heavily that he could give no verbal orders. One of his officers, however, is said to have come to him in his tent, where he was trying to play cards. "'What position shall we make of the prisoners?' asked the officer. The Duke tried to reply, but his utterance was very thick. "'No quarter,' he was believed to say. The officer objected and begged that such an order as that should be given in writing. The Duke rolled over and seized a sheaf of playing cards. Pulling one out, he scrawled the necessary order, and that was taken to the commanders in the field. The Highlanders could not stand the cannon fire, and the English won. Then the fury of the common soldiery broke loose upon the country. There was a reign of fantastic and fiendish brutality. One provost of the town was violently kicked for a mild remonstrance about the destruction of the Episcopalian meeting-house. Another was condemned to clean out dirty stables. Men and women were whipped and tortured on slight suspicion or to extract information. Cumberland frankly professed his contempt and hatred of the people among whom he found himself, but he savagely punished robberies committed by private soldiers for their own profit. 
such was the famous battle of culloden fought in seventeen forty six and putting a final end to the hopes of all the stuarts as to cumberland's order for no quarter if any apology can be made for such brutality it must be found in the fact that the highland chiefs had on their side agreed to spare no captured enemy the battle has also left a name commonly given to the nine of diamonds which is called the curse of scotland because it is said that on that card cumberland wrote his bloodthirsty order such in brief was the story of prince charles's gallant attempt to restore the kingdom of his ancestors even when defeated he would not at once leave scotland a french squadron appeared off the coast near edinburgh it had been sent to bring him troops and a large supply of money but he turned his back upon it and made his way into the highlands on foot closely pursued by english soldiers and lowland spies this part of his career is in reality the most romantic of all he was hunted closely almost as by hounds for weeks he had only such sleep as he could snatch during short periods of safety and there were times when his pursuers came within an inch of capturing him but never in his life were his spirits so high it was a sort of life that he had never seen before climbing the mighty rocks and listening to the thunder of the cataracts among which he often slept with only one faithful follower to guard him the story of his escape is almost incredible but he laughed and drank and rolled upon the grass when he was free from care he hobnobbed with the most suspicious-looking caterans with whom he drank the smoky brew of the north and lived as he might on fish and onions and bacon and wild fowl with an appetite such as he had never known at the luxurious court of versailles or saint germain after the battle of culloden the prince would have been captured had not a scottish girl named flora macdonald met him caused him to be dressed in the clothes of her waiting-maid and thus got him off the isle of skye there for a time it was impossible to follow him and there the two lived almost alone together such a proximity could not fail to stir the romantic feeling of one who was both a youth and a prince on the other hand no thought of love-making seems to have entered flora's mind if however we read campbell's narrative very closely we can see that the prince charles made every advance consistent with a delicate remembrance of her sex and services it seems to have been his thought that if she cared for him then the two might well love and he gave her every chance to show him favor the youth of twenty-five and the girl of twenty-four roamed together in the long tufted grass or lay in the sunshine and looked out over the sea the prince would rest his head in her lap and she would tumble his golden hair with her slender fingers and sometimes clip off tresses which she preserved to give to friends of hers as love locks but to the last he was either too high or too low for her according to her own modest thought he was a royal prince the heir to a throne or else he was a boy with whom she might play quite fancy free a lover he could not be so pure and beautiful was her thought of him these were perhaps the most delightful days of all his life as they were a beautiful memory in hers in time he returned to france and resumed his place amid the intrigues that surrounded that other steward prince who styled himself james the third and still kept up the appearance of a king in exile as he watched the artifice and the plotting of these make-believe courtiers he may well have thought of his innocent companion of the highland wilds as for flora she was arrested and imprisoned for five months on english vessels of war after her release she was married in seventeen fifty and she and her husband sailed for the american colonies just before the revolution in that war macdonald became a british officer and served against his adopted countrymen perhaps because of this reason flora returned alone to scotland where she died at the age of sixty-eight the royal prince who would have given her his easy love lived a life of far less dignity in the years that followed his return to france there was no more hope of recovering the english throne for him there were left only the idle and licentious diversions of such a court as that in which his father lived at the death of james the third even this court was disintegrated and prince charles led a roving life under the title of earl of albany in his wanderings he met louise marie the daughter of a german prince gustavus adolphus of stolberg she was only nineteen years of age when she first felt the fascination that he still possessed but it was an unhappy marriage for the girl when she discovered that her husband was a confirmed drunkard not long after in fact she found her life with him so utterly intolerable that she persuaded the pope to allow her a formal separation 
the pontiff entrusted her to her husband's brother cardinal york who placed her in a convent and presently removed her to his own residence in rome here begins another romance she was often visited by vittorio alfieri the great italian poet and dramatist alfieri was a man of wealth in the early years he divided his time into alternate periods during which he either studied hard in civil and canonical law or was a constant attendant upon the race course or rushed aimlessly all over europe without any object except to wear out the post horses which he used in relays over hundreds of miles of road his life indeed was eccentric almost to insanity but when he had met the beautiful and lonely countess of albany there came over him a striking change she influenced him for all that was good and he used to say that he owed her all that was best in his dramatic works sixteen years after her marriage her royal husband died a worn-out bloated wreck of one who had been as a youth a model of knightliness and manhood during his final years he had fallen to utter destitution and there was either a touch of half-contempt or a feeling of remote kinship in the act of george the third who bestowed upon the prince an annual pension of four thousand pounds it showed most plainly that england was now consolidated under hanoverian rule when cardinal york died in eighteen o seven there was no stuart left in the male line and the countess was the last to bear the royal scottish name of albany after the prince's death his widow is said to have been married to alfieri and for the rest of her life she lived in florence though alfieri died nearly twenty-one years before her here we have seen a part of the romance which attaches itself to the name of stuart in a chivalrous young prince leading his highlanders against the bayonets of the british lolling idly among the ebrides or fallen at the last to be a drunkard and the husband of an unwilling consort who in turn loved the famous poet but it is this stuart after all of whom we think when we hear the bagpipes skirling over the water to charlie or wall be king but charlie End of the story of Prince Charles Edward Stuart by Lyndon Orr. Maurice of Saxony and Adrian Lecouvre, Volume One of Famous Affinities of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit. LibriVox.org Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr Volume 1 Maurice of Saxony and Adrian Lecouvre It is an old saying that to every womanly woman self-sacrifice is almost a necessity of her nature. To make herself of small account as compared with the one she loves, to give freely of herself, even though she may receive nothing in return, to suffer, and yet to feel an inner poignant joy in all this suffering. Here is a most wonderful trait of womanhood. Perhaps it is akin to the maternal instinct, for to the mother, after she has felt the throb of a new life within her, there is no sacrifice so great and no anguish so keen that she will not welcome it as the outward sign and evidence of her illimitable love. In most women, this spirit of self-sacrifice is checked and kept within ordinary bounds by the circumstances of their lives. In many small things, they do yield and they do suffer, yet it is not in yielding and in suffering that they find their deepest joy. There are some, however, who seem to have been born with an abnormal capacity for enduring hardship and mental anguish, so that, by a sort of contradiction, they find their happiness in sorrow. Such women are endowed with a remarkable degree of sensibility. They feel intensely. In moments of grief and disappointment, and even of despair, there steals over them a sort of melancholy pleasure. It is as if they loved dim lights and mournful music and scenes full of sad suggestion. If everything goes well with them, they are unwilling to believe that such good fortune will last. If anything goes wrong with them, they are sure that this is only the beginning of something even worse. The music of their lives is written in a minor key. 
Now, for such women as these, the world at large has very little charity. It speaks slightingly of them as agonizers. It believes that they are fond of making scenes. It regards as an affectation something that is really instinctive and inevitable. Unless such women are beautiful and young and charming, they are treated badly. And this is often true in spite of all their natural attractiveness, for they seem to quote ill usage as if they were saying frankly, Come, take us. We will give you everything and ask for nothing. We do not expect true and enduring love. Do not be constant or generous or even kind. We know that we shall suffer. But nonetheless, in our sorrow there will be sweetness. And even in our abasement, we shall feel a sort of triumph. In history, there is one woman who stands out conspicuously as a type of her melancholy sisterhood. One whose life was full of disappointment, even when she was most successful, and of indignity even when she was most sought after and admired. This woman was Adrienne Lecouvre, famous in the annals of the stage, and still more famous in the annals of unrequited, or at any rate, unhappy love. Her story is linked with that of a man no less remarkable than herself, a hero of chivalry, a marvel of courage, of fascination, and of irresponsibility. Adrienne Lecouvre, her name was originally Couvre, was born toward the end of the 17th century in the little French village of Damery, not far from Rheims, where her aunt was a laundress and her father a hatter in a small way. Of her mother, who died in childbirth, we know nothing. But her father was a man of gloomy and ungovernable temper, breaking out into violent fits of passion, in one of which, long afterward, he died, raving and yelling like a maniac. Adrian was brought up at the washtub and became accustomed to a wandering life, in which she went from one town to another. What she had inherited from her mother is, of course, not known. But she had all her father's strangely pessimistic temper, softened only by the fact that she was a girl. From her earliest years, she was unhappy. Yet her unhappiness was largely of her own choosing. Other girls of her own station met life cheerfully, worked away from dawn till dusk, and then had their moments of amusement and even jollity with their companions after the fashion of all children. But Adrienne Lecouvre was unhappy because she chose to be. It was not the washtub that made her so, for she had been born to it. Nor was it the half-mad outbreaks of her father, because to her, at least, he was not unkind. Her discontent sprang from her excessive sensibility. Indeed, for a peasant child, she had reason to think herself far more fortunate than her associates. Her intelligence was great. Ambition was awakened in her before she was ten years of age, when she began to learn and to recite poems, learning them, as has been said, between the washtub and the ironing board, and reciting them to the admiration of older and wiser people than she. Even at ten, she was a very beautiful child, with great lambent eyes, an exquisite complexion, and a lovely form while she had the further gift of a voice that thrilled the listener, and, when she chose, brought tears to every eye. She was, indeed, a natural elocutionist, knowing by instinct all those modulations of tone and varied cadences which go to the hearer's heart. It was very like Adrienne Lecouvre to memorize only such poems as were mournful, just as in after life she could win success upon the stage only in tragic parts. She would repeat, with a sort of ecstasy, the pathetic poems that were then admired. And she was soon able to give up her menial work, because many people asked her to their houses so that they could listen to the divinely beautiful voice charged with the emotion which was always at her command. When she was thirteen, her father moved to Paris, where she was placed at school. 
a very humble school in a very humble quarter of the city. Yet even there, her genius showed itself at that early age. A number of children and young people, probably influenced by Adrian, formed themselves into a theatrical company from the pure love of acting. A friendly grocer let them have an empty storeroom for their performances. And in this storeroom, Adrian Lecouvre first acted in a tragedy by Corneille, assuming the part of leading woman. Her genius for the stage was like the genius of Napoleon for war. She had had no teaching. She had never been inside of any theatre. And yet, she delivered the magnificent lines with all the power and fire and effectiveness of a most accomplished actress. People thronged to see her and to feel the tempest of emotion which shook her as she sustained her part, which, for the moment, was as real to her as life itself. At first, only the people of the neighbourhood knew anything about these amateur performances. But presently, a lady of rank, one Madame de Gou, came out of curiosity and was fascinated by the little actress. Madame de Gou offered the spacious courtyard of her own house and fitted it with some of the appurtenances of a theatre. From that moment, the fame of Adrian spread throughout all Paris. The courtyard was crowded by gentlemen and ladies, by people of distinction from the court, and at last even by actors and actresses from the comedy franchise. It is, in fact, a remarkable tribute to Adrian that in her thirteenth year she excited so much jealousy among the actors of the comedy that they evoked the law against her. Theatres required a royal license. And, of course, poor little Adrian's company had none. Hence, legal proceedings were begun, and the most famous actresses in Paris talked of having these clever children imprisoned. Upon this, the company sought the precincts of the temple, where no legal warrant could be served without the express order of the king himself. There, for a time, the performances still went on. Finally, as the other children were not geniuses, but merely boys and girls in search of fun, the little company broke up. Its success, however, had determined forever the career of Adrian. With her beautiful face, her lithe and exquisite figure, her golden voice, and her instinctive art, it was plain enough that her future lay upon the stage. And so, at fourteen or fifteen, she began where most actresses leave off, accomplished and attractive, and having had a practical training in her profession. Diderot, in that same century, observed that the truest actor is one who does not feel his part at all, but produces his effects by intellectual effort and intelligent observation. Behind the figure on the stage, torn with passion or rollicking with mirth, there must always be the cool and unemotional mind which directs and governs and controls. This same theory was both held and practiced by the late Benoit Constant Coquelin. To some extent, it was the theory of Garrick and Fechter and Edwin Booth, though it was rejected by the two Keynes and by Edwin Forrest, who entered so thoroughly into the character which he assumed and who let loose such tremendous bursts of passion that other actors dreaded to support him on the stage in such parts as Spartacus and Metamora. It is needless to say that a girl like Adrienne Lecouvre flung herself with all the intensity of her nature into every role she played. This was the greatest secret of her success, for with her nature rose superior to art. On the other hand, it fixed her dramatic limitations, for it barred her out of comedy. Her melancholy, morbid disposition was in the fullest sympathy with tragic heroines, but she failed when she tried to represent the lighter moods and the merry moments of those who welcome mirth. She could counterfeit despair, and unforced tears would fill her eyes, but she could not laugh and romp and simulate a gaiety that was never hers. 
Adrian would have been delighted to act at one of the theatres in Paris. But they were closed to her through jealousy. She went into the provinces in the eastern part of France, and for ten years she was a leading lady there in many companies and in many towns. As she blossomed into womanhood, there came into her life the love which was to be at once a source of the most profound interest and of the most intense agony. It is odd that all her professional success never gave her any happiness. The life of the actress who travelled from town to town, the crude and coarse experiences which she had to undergo, the disorder and the unsettled mode of living, all produced in her a profound disgust. She was of too exquisite a fibre to live in such a way, especially in a century when the refinements of existence were for the very few. She speaks herself of obligatory amusements, the insistence of men, and of love affairs. Yet, how could such a woman as Adrienne Lecouvre keep herself from love affairs? The motion of the stage and its mimic griefs satisfied her only while she was actually upon the boards. Love offered her an emotional excitement that endured and that was always changing. It was the profoundest instinct of her being. And she once wrote, What could one do in the world without loving? Still, through these ten years, she seems to have loved only that she might be unhappy. There was a strange twist in her mind. Men who were honourable and who loved her with sincerity, she treated very badly. Men who were indifferent or ungrateful or actually base, she seemed to choose by a sort of perverse instinct. Perhaps the explanation of it is that during these ten years, though she had many lovers, she never really loved. She sought excitement, passion, and after that, the mournfulness which came when passion dies. Thus, one man after another came into her life, some of them promising marriage, and she bore two children whose fathers were unknown, or at least uncertain. But after all, one can scarcely pity her, since she had not yet in reality known that great passion which comes but once in life. So far, she had learned only a sort of feeble cynicism, which she expressed in letters and in such sayings as these. There are sweet errors which I would not venture to commit again. My experiences, all too sad, have served to illumine my reason. I am utterly weary of love and prodigiously tempted to have no more of it for the rest of my life, because, after all, I don't wish either to die or to go mad. Yet, she also said, I know too well that no one dies of grief. She had had, indeed, some very unfortunate experiences. Men of rank had loved her and had then cast her off. An actor, one Clavel, would have married her, but she would not accept his offer. A magistrate in Strasbourg promised marriage, and then, when she was about to accept him, he wrote to her, that he was going to yield to the wishes of his family and make a more advantageous alliance. And so she was alternately caressed and repulsed, a mere plaything, and yet this was probably all that she really needed at that time, something to stir her, something to make her mournful or indignant or ashamed. It was inevitable that at last Adrian Lecouvre should appear in Paris. She had won such renown throughout the provinces that even those who were intensely jealous of her were obliged to give her due consideration. In 1717, when she was in her 25th year, she became a member of the comedy franchise. There she made an immediate and most brilliant impression. She easily took the leading place. She was one of the glories of Paris, for she became the fashion outside the theatre. For the first time, the great classic plays were given, not as a monotonous sing-song which had become a sort of theatrical convention, but with all the fire 
and naturalness of life. Being the fashion, Mademoiselle Le Couvre elevated the social rank of actors and of actresses. Her salon was thronged by men and women of rank. Voltaire wrote poems in her honor. To be invited to her dinners was almost like receiving a decoration from the king. She ought to have been happy, for she had reached the summit of her profession and something more. Yet, still, she was unhappy. In all her letters, one finds a plaintive tone, a little mourning sound that shows how slightly her nature had been changed. No longer, however, did she throw herself away upon dullards and brutes. An English peer, Lord Peterborough, not realizing that she was different from other actresses of that loose-lived age, said to her coarsely at his first introduction, Come now, show me lots of wit and lots of love. The remark was characteristic of the time. Yet Adrian had learned at least one thing, and that was the discontent which came from light affairs. She had thrown herself away too often. If she could not love with her entire being, if she could not give all that was in her to be given, whether of her heart or mind or soul, then she would love no more at all. At this time there came to Paris a man remarkable in his own century and one who afterward became almost a hero of romance. This was Maurice Comte de Saxe, as the French called him, his German name and title being Moritz Graf von Saxon, while we usually term him, in English, Marshal Saxe. Maurice de Saxe was now, in 1721, entering his 25th year. Already, though so young, his career had been a strange one, and it was destined to be still more remarkable. He was the natural son of Duke Augustus II of Saxony, who later became King of Poland, and who is known in history as Augustus the Strong. Augustus was a giant in stature and in strength, handsome, daring, unscrupulous, and yet extremely fascinating. His life was one of revelry and fighting and display. When in his cups, he would often call for a horseshoe and twist it into a knot with his powerful fingers. Many were his mistresses, but the one for whom he cared the most was a beautiful and high-spirited Swedish girl of rank, Aurora von Koningsmark. She was descended from a rough old field marshal, who in the Thirty Years' War had slashed and sacked and pillaged and plundered to his heart's content. From him, Aurora von Koningsmark seemed to have inherited a high spirit and a sort of lawlessness which charmed the stalwart Augustus of Poland. Their son, Maurice de Saxe, inherited everything that was good in his parents, and a great deal that was less commendable. As a mere child of twelve, he insisted on joining the army of Prince Eugene, and had seen rough service in a very strenuous campaign. Two years later, he showed such daring on the battlefield that Prince Eugene summoned him and paid him a compliment under the form of a rebuke. Young man, he said, you must not mistake mere recklessness for valour. Before he was twenty, he had attained the stature and strength of his royal father, and to prove it, he in his turn called for a horseshoe, which he twisted and broke in his fingers. He fought on the side of the Russians and Poles, and again against the Turks, everywhere displaying high courage and also genius as a commander, for he never lost his self-possession amid the very blackest danger, but possessed, as Carlyle says, vigilance, foresight, and sagacious precaution. Exceedingly handsome, Maurice was a master of all the arts that pleased, with just a touch of roughness which seemed not unfitting in so gallant a soldier. His troops adored him and would follow wherever he might choose to lead them, for he exercised over these rude men a magnetic power resembling that of Napoleon in after years. In private life, he was a hard drinker and fond of every form of pleasure. Having no fortune of his own, 
a marriage was arranged for him with the Countess von Loben, who was immensely wealthy. But in three years he had squandered all her money upon his pleasures and had, moreover, got himself heavily in debt. It was at this time that he first came to Paris to study military tactics. He had fought hard against the French in the wars that were now ended, but his chivalrous bearing, his handsome person, and his reckless joviality made him at once a universal favourite in Paris. To the perfumed courtiers, with their laces and love-locks and mincing ways, Maurice de Saxe came as a sort of knight of old, jovial, daring, pleasure-loving. Even his broken French was held to be quite charming, and to see him break a horseshoe with his fingers threw everyone into raptures. No wonder, then, that he was welcomed in the very highest circles. Almost at once he attracted the notice of the Princess de Conti, a beautiful woman of the blood royal. Of her it has been said that she was the personification of a kiss, the incarnation of an embrace, the ideal of a dream of love. Her chestnut hair was tinted with little gleams of gold. Her eyes were violet black. Her complexion was dazzling. But by the king's orders, she had been forced to marry a hunchback, a man whose very limbs were so weakened by disease and evil living that they would often fail to support him and he would fall to the ground a writhing, screaming mass of ill-looking flesh. It is not surprising that his lovely wife should have shuddered much at his abuse of her, and still more at his grotesque endearments. When her eyes fell on Maurice de Saxe, she saw in him one who could free her from her bondage. By a skilful trick, he led the Prince de Conti to invade the sleeping room of the princess, with servants declaring that she was not alone. The charge proved quite untrue, and so she left her husband having won the sympathy of her own world, which held that she had been insulted. But it was not she who was destined to win and hold the love of Maurice de Saxe. Not long after his appearance in the French capital, he was invited to dine with the Queen of Paris, Adrienne Le Couvre. Saxe had seen her on the stage. He knew her previous history. He knew that she was very much of a soiled dove. But when he met her, these two natures, so utterly dissimilar, leaped together, as it were, through the indescribable attraction of opposites. He was big and powerful, she was small and fragile. He was merry and full of quips and jests. She was reserved and melancholy. Each felt in the other a need supplied. At one of their earliest meetings, the climax came. Saxe was not the man to hesitate while she, already, in her thoughts, had made a full surrender. In one great sweep, he gathered her into his arms. It appeared to her as if no man had ever laid his hand upon her until that moment. She cried out, Now, for the first time in my life, I seem to live. It was, indeed, the very first love, which in her checkered career was really worthy of the name. She had supposed that all such things were past and gone, that her heart was closed forever, that she was invulnerable. And yet, here she found herself clinging about the neck of this impetuous soldier and showing him all the shy fondness and the unselfish devotion of a young girl. From this instant, Adrian Le Couvre never loved another man and never even looked at any other man with the slightest interest. For nine long years, the two were bound together, though there were strange events to ruffle the surface of their love. Maurice de Saxe had been sired by a king. He had the lofty ambition to be a king himself, and he felt the stirrings of that genius which, in after years, was to make him a great soldier, and to win the brilliant victory of Fontenoy, which, to this very day, the French are never tired of recalling. Already, Louis the Fifteenth had made him a Marshal of France, and a certain restlessness came over him. He loved Adrian, 
yet he felt that to remain in the enjoyment of her witcheries ought not to be the whole of a man's career. Then the Grand Duchy of Courland, at that time a vassal state of Poland, now part of Russia, sought a ruler. Maurice de Saxe was eager to secure its throne, which would make him at least semi-royal and the chief of a principality. He hastened thither and found that money was needed to carry out his plans. The widow of the late Duke, the Grand Duchess Anna, niece of Peter the Great, and later Empress of Russia, as soon as she had met this dazzling genius, offered to help him to acquire the duchy if he would only marry her. He did not utterly refuse. Still another woman of high rank, the Grand Duchess Elizabeth of Russia, Peter the Great's daughter, made him very much the same proposal. Both of these imperial women might well have attracted a man like Maurice de Saxe, had he been wholly fancy-free, for the second of them inherited the high spirit and the genius of the great Peter, while the first was a pleasure-seeking princess, resembling some of those Roman empresses who loved to stoop that they might conquer. She is described as indolent and sensual, and she once declared that the chief good in the world was love. Yet, though she neglected affairs of state and gave them over to favourites, she won and kept the affections of her people. She was unquestionably endowed with the magnetic gift of winning hearts. Adrian, who was left behind in Paris, knew very little of what was going on. Only two things were absolutely clear to her. One was that if her lover secured the duchy, he must be parted from her. The other was that without money his ambition must be thwarted and that he would then return to her. Here was a test to try the soul of any woman. It proved the height and the depth of her devotion. Come what might, Maurice should be Duke of Courland, even though she lost him. She gathered together her whole fortune, sold every jewel that she possessed and sent her lover the sum of nearly a million francs. This incident shows how absolutely she was his. But in fact, because of various intrigues, he failed of election to the ducal throne of Courland, and he returned to Adrian with all her money spent, and without even the grace at first to show his gratitude. He stormed and raged over his ill luck. She merely soothed and petted him, though she had heard that he had thought of marrying another woman to secure the dukedom. In one of her letters, she bursts out with a pitiful exclamation. I am distracted with rage and anguish. Is it not natural to cry out against such treachery? This man surely ought to know me. He ought to love me. Oh my God, what are we? What are we? But still, she could not give him up nor could he give her up, though there were frightful scenes between them, times when he cruelly reproached her and when her native melancholy deepened into outbursts of despair. Finally, there occurred an incident which is more or less obscure in parts. The Duchess de Boulon, a great lady of the court, facile, feline, licentious, and eager for delights, resolved that she would win the love of Maurice de Saxe. She set herself to win it openly and without any sense of shame. Maurice himself, at times, when the tears of Adrian proved wearisome, flirted with the Duchess. Yet, even so, Adrian held the first place in his heart, and her rival knew it. Therefore, she resolved to humiliate Adrian, and to do so in the place where the actress had always reigned supreme. There was to be a gala performance of Racine's great tragedy, Phaedra, with Adrian, of course, in the title role. The Duchess de Boulon sent a large number of her lackeys with orders to hiss and jeer and, if possible, to break off the play. Malignantly delighted with her plan, the Duchess arrayed herself in jewels and took her seat in a conspicuous stage box where she could watch the coming storm and gloat over the discomfiture of her rival. When the curtain rose, 
and when Adrian appeared as Phaedra, an uproar began. It was clear to the great actress that a plot had been devised against her. In an instant, her whole soul was afire. The queen-like majesty of her bearing compelled silence throughout the house. Even the hired lackeys were overawed by it. Then, Adrian moved swiftly across the stage and fronted her enemy, speaking into her very face the three insulting lines which came to her at that moment of the play. I am not of those women void of shame who, savoring in crime the joys of peace, harden their faces till they cannot blush. The whole house rose and burst forth into tremendous applause. Adrian had won, for the woman who had tried to shame her rose in trepidation and hurried from the theatre. But the end was not yet. Those were evil times when dark deeds were committed by the great almost with impunity. Secret poisoning was a common trade. To remove a rival was as usual a thing in the 18th century as to snub a rival is usual in the 20th. Not long afterward, on the night of March 15, 1730, Adrienne Lecouvre was acting in one of Voltaire's plays with all her power and instinctive art when suddenly she was seized with the most frightful things. Her anguish was obvious to everyone who saw her and yet she had the courage to go through her path. Then she fainted and was carried home. Four days later, she died, and her death was no less dramatic than her life had been. Her lover and two friends of his were with her, and also a Jesuit priest. He declined to administer extreme unction unless she would declare that she repented of her theatrical career. She stubbornly refused, since she believed that to be the greatest actress of her time was not a sin. Yet still the priest insisted. Then came the final moment. Weary and revolting against this death, this destiny, she stretched her arms with one of the old lovely gestures toward a bust which stood nearby and cried, her last cry of passion. There is my world, my hope, yes, and my God. The bust was one of Maurice de Saxe. End of Maurice of Saxony and Adrian Lecouvre. End of Volume 1 of Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr. Recording by Hilara. Section 9. The Empress Catherine and Prince Potemkin. Volume 2 of Famous Affinities of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr. Volume 2. THE EMPRESS CATHERINE AND PRINCE POTEMKIN It has often been said that the greatest Frenchman who ever lived was in reality an Italian. It might with equal truth be asserted that the greatest Russian woman who ever lived was in reality a German. But the Emperor Napoleon and the Empress Catherine II resemble each other in something else. Napoleon, though Italian in blood and lineage, made himself so French in sympathy and understanding as to be able to play upon the imagination of all France, as a great musician plays upon a splendid instrument, with absolute sureness of touch and an ability to extract from it every one of its varied harmonies. So the Empress Catherine of Russia perhaps 
the greatest woman who ever ruled a nation, though born of German parents, became Russian to the core, and made herself the embodiment of Russian feeling and Russian aspiration. At the middle of the 18th century, Russia was governed by Empress Elizabeth, daughter of Peter the Great. In her own time, and for a long while afterward, her real capacity was obscured by her apparent indolence, her fondness for display, and her seeming vacillation. But now a very high place is accorded her in the history of Russian rulers. She softened the brutality that had reigned supreme in Russia. She patronized the arts. Her armies twice defeated Frederick the Great, and raided his capital, Berlin. Had Elizabeth lived, she would probably have crushed him. In her early years, this imperial woman had been betrothed to Louis the Fifteenth of France, but the match was broken off. Subsequently, she entered into a morganatic marriage, and bore a son who, of course, could not be her heir. In 1714, therefore, she looked about for a suitable successor, and chose her nephew, Prince Peter of holstein Gottorp. Peter, then a mere youth of seventeen, was delighted with so splendid a future, and came at once to St. Petersburg. The empress next sought for a girl who might marry the young prince, and thus become the future Tsarina. She thought first of Frederick the Great's sister, but Frederick shrank from this alliance, though it would have been of much advantage to him. He loved his sister. Indeed, she was one of the few persons for whom he ever really cared. So he declined the offer, and suggested instead the young Princess Sophia, of the tiny duchy of Anhalt Zerbst. The reason for Frederick's refusal was his knowledge of the semi-barbarous conditions that prevailed at the Russian court. The Russian capital at that time was a bizarre, half-civilized, half-oriental place, where, among the very highest-born, a thin veneer of French elegance covered every form of brutality, and savagery, and lust. It is not surprising, therefore, that Frederick the Great was unwilling to have his sister plunged into such a life. But when the Empress Elizabeth asked the Princess Sophia of Anhalt Zerbst to marry the heir to the Russian throne, the young girl willingly accepted, the more so as her mother practically commanded it, this mother of hers was a grim, harsh German woman, who had reared her daughter in the strictest fashion, depriving her of all pleasure, with a truly puritanical severity. In the case of a different sort of girl, this training would have crushed her spirit, but the Princess Sophia, though gentle and refined in manner, had a power of endurance which was toughened and strengthened by the discipline she underwent. And so, in 1744, when she was but sixteen years of age, she was taken by her mother to St. Petersburg. There she renounced the Lutheran faith, and was received into the Greek church, changing her name to Catherine. Soon after, with great magnificence, she was married to Prince Peter, and from that moment began a career which was to make her the most powerful woman in the world. At this time, a lady of the Russian court wrote down a description of Catherine's appearance. She was fair-haired, with dark blue eyes, and her face, though never beautiful, was made piquant and striking by the fact that her brows were very dark in contrast with her golden hair. Her complexion was not clear, yet her look was a very pleasing one. She had a certain diffidence of manner at first, but later she bore herself with such instinctive dignity as to make her seem majestic, though in fact 
she was beneath the middle size. At the time of her marriage her figure was slight and graceful. Only in after years did she become stout. Altogether she came to St. Petersburg an attractive, pure-minded German maiden, with a character well disciplined, and possessing reserves of power which had not yet been drawn upon. Frederick the Great's forebodings, which had led him to withhold his sister's hand, were almost immediately justified in the case of Catherine. Her Russian husband revealed to her a mode of life which must have tried her very soul. This youth was only seventeen, a mere boy in age, and yet a full-grown man in the rank luxuriance of his vices. Moreover, he had eccentricities which sometimes verged upon insanity. Too young to be admitted to the counsels of his imperial aunt, he occupied his time in ways that were either ridiculous or vile. Next to the sleeping room of his wife, he kept a set of kennels, with a number of dogs, which he spent hours in drilling as if they had been soldiers. He had a troop of rats, which he also drilled. It was his delight to summon a court-martial of his dogs, to try the rats for various military offences, and then to have the culprits executed, leaving their bleeding carcasses upon the floor. At any hour of the day or night Catherine, hidden in her chamber, could hear the yapping of the curs, the squeak of rats, and the word of command given by her half-idiot husband. When wearied of this diversion, Peter would summon a troop of favorites, both men and women, and with them he would drink deep of beer and vodka, since from his early childhood he had been both a drunkard and a debauchee. The whoops and howls and vile songs of his creatures could be heard by Catherine, and sometimes he would stagger into her rooms accompanied by his drunken minions. With a sort of psychopathic perversity, he would insist on giving Catherine the most minute and repulsive narratives of his amours, until she shrank from him with horror at his depravity, and came to loathe the sight of his bloated face, with its little twinkling porcine eyes, his upturned nose, and distended nostrils, and his loose-hung, lascivious mouth. She was scarcely less repelled when a wholly different mood would seize upon him, and he would declare himself her slave, attending her at court functions in the garb of a servant, and professing an unbounded devotion for his bride. Catherine's early training and her womanly nature led her for a long time to submit to the caprices of her husband. In his saner moments she would plead with him and strive to interest him in something better than his dogs and rats and venal mistresses. But Peter was incorrigible. Though he had moments of sense and even of good feeling, these never lasted, and after them he would plunge headlong into the most frantic excesses that his half-crazed imagination could devise. It is not strange that, in course of time, Catherine's strong good sense showed her that she could do nothing with this creature. She therefore gradually became estranged from him, and set herself to the task of doing those things which Peter was incapable of carrying out. She saw that, ever since the first awakening of Russia under Peter the Great, none of its rulers had been genuinely Russian, but had tried to force upon the Russian people 
various forms of Western civilization which were alien to the national spirit. Peter the Great had striven to make his people Dutch. Elizabeth had tried to make them French. Catherine, with a sure instinct, resolved that they should remain Russian, barring what they needed from other peoples, but stirred always by the Slavic spirit, and swayed by a patriotism that was their own. To this end she set herself to become Russian. She acquired the Russian language patiently and accurately. She adopted the Russian costume, appearing, except on state occasions, in a simple gown of green, covering her fair hair, however, with a cap powdered with diamonds. Furthermore, she made friends of such native Russians as were gifted with talent, winning their favor, and through them the favor of the common people. It would have been strange, however, had Catherine, the woman, escaped the tainting influences that surrounded her on every side. The infidelities of Peter gradually made her feel that she owed him nothing as his wife. Among the nobles there were men whose force of character and of mind attracted her, inevitably. Chastity was a thing of which the average Russian had no conception, and therefore it is not strange that Catherine, with her intense and sensitive nature, should have turned to some of these for the love which she sought in vain from the half-imbecile to whom she had been married. Much has been written of this side of her earlier and later life, yet, though it is impossible to deny that she had favorites, one should judge very gently the conduct of a girl so young, and thrust into a life, whence all the virtues seemed to be excluded. She bore several children before her thirtieth year, and it is very certain that a grave doubt exists as to their paternity. Among the nobles of the court were two whose courage and virility specially attracted her. The one with whom her name has been most often coupled was Gregory Orloff. He and his brother Alexis Orloff were Russians of the older type, powerful in frame, suave in manner, except when roused, yet with a tigerish ferocity slumbering underneath. Their power fascinated Catherine, and it was currently declared that Gregory Orloff was her lover. When she was in her thirty-second year, her husband was proclaimed Tsar, after the death of the Empress Elizabeth. At first, in some ways, his elevation seemed to sober him, but this period of sanity, like those which had come to him before, lasted only a few weeks. Historians have given him much credit for two great reforms that are connected with his name, and yet the manner in which they were actually brought about is rather ludicrous. He had shut himself up with his favorite revelers, and had remained for several days drinking and carousing, until he scarcely knew enough to speak. At this moment a young officer named Gudovich, who was really loyal to the newly created Tsar, burst into the banquet hall, booted and spurred, and his eyes aflame with indignation. Standing before Peter, his voice rang out with the tone of a battle trumpet, so that the sounds of revelry were hushed. Peter Fyodorovich, he cried, do you prefer these swine to those who really wish to serve you? Is it in this way that you imitate the glories of your ancestor, that illustrious Peter, whom you have sworn to take as your model? It will not be long before your people's love will be changed to hatred. Rise up, my Tsar, shake off this lethargy and sloth. Prove that you are worthy the faith which I and others 
have given you so loyally. With these words, Gudovich thrust into Peter's trembling hand two proclamations, one abolishing the secret bureau of police, which had become an instrument of tyrannous oppression, and the other restoring to the nobility many rights of which they had been deprived. The earnestness and intensity of Gudovich temporarily cleared the brain of the drunken Tsar. He seized the papers, and without reading them, hastened at once to his great council, where he declared that they expressed his wishes. Great was the rejoicing in St. Petersburg, and great was the praise bestowed on Peter. Yet, in fact, he had acted only as any drunkard might act under the compulsion of a stronger will than his. As before, his brief period of good sense was succeeded by another of the wildest folly. It was not merely that he reversed the wise policy of his aunt, but that he reverted to his early fondness for everything that was German. His bodyguard was made up of German troops, thus exciting the jealousy of the Russian soldiers. He introduced German fashions. He boasted that his father had been an officer in the Prussian army. His crazy admiration for Frederick the Great reached the utmost verge of sycophancy. As to Catherine, he turned on her with something like ferocity. He declared in public that his eldest son, the Tsarevich Paul, was really fathered by Catherine's lovers. At a state banquet he turned to Catherine and hurled at her a name which no woman could possibly forgive, and least of all a woman such as Catherine with her high spirit and imperial pride. He thrust his mistresses upon her, and at last he ordered her, with her own hand, to decorate the Countess Vorontsov, who was known to be his mistress on Tietre. It was not these gross insults, however, so much as a concern for her personal safety, that led Catherine to take measures for her own defense. She was accustomed to Peter's ordinary eccentricities. On the grounds of his unfaithfulness to her, she now had hardly any right to make complaint, but she might reasonably fear, lest he was becoming mad. If he questioned the paternity of their eldest son, he might take measures to imprison Catherine, or even to destroy her. Therefore, she conferred with the Orloffs and other gentlemen, and their conference rapidly developed into a conspiracy. The soldiery, as a whole, was loyal to the Empress. It hated Peter's Holstein guards. What she planned was probably the deposition of Peter. She would have liked to place him under guard in some distant palace, but while the matter was still under discussion, she was awakened early one morning by Alexis Orloff. He grasped her arm with scant ceremony. We must act at once, said he. We have been betrayed. Catherine was not a woman to waste time. She went immediately to the barracks of St. Petersburg, mounted upon a charger, and calling out the Russian guards, appealed to them for their support. To a man they clashed their weapons, and roared forth a thunderous cheer. Immediately afterwards the priests anointed her as regent in the name of her son, but as she left the church she was saluted by the people, as well as by the soldiers, as empress in her own right. It was a bold stroke, and it succeeded down to the last detail. The wretched Peter, who was drilling his German guards at a distance from the capital, heard of the revolt, found that his sailors at Kronstadt would not acknowledge him, and then finally submitted. 
he was taken to Rupshaw and confined within a single room. To him came the Orloffs, quite of their own accord. Gregory Orloff endeavoured to force a corrosive poison into Peter's mouth. Peter, who was powerful of build, and now quite desperate, hurled himself upon his enemies. Alexis Orloff seized him by the throat with a tremendous clutch, and strangled him till the blood gushed from his ears. In a few moments the unfortunate man was dead. Catherine was shocked by the intelligence, but she had no choice save to accept the result of excessive zeal. She issued a note to the foreign ambassadors informing them that Peter had died of a violent colic. When his body was laid out for burial, the extrafacated blood is said to have oozed out even through his hands, staining the gloves that had been placed upon them. No one believed the story of the colic, and some six years later Orloff told the truth with the utmost composure. The whole incident was characteristically Russian. It is not within the limits of our space to describe the reign of Catherine the Great, the exploits of her armies, the acuteness of her statecraft, the vast additions which she made to the Russian Empire, and the impulse which she gave to science and art and literature. Yet these things ought to be remembered first of all, when one thinks of the woman whom Voltaire once styled the Semiramis of the North. Because she was so powerful, because no one could gainsay her, she led in private a life which has been almost more exploited than her great imperial achievements. And yet, though she had lovers whose names have been carefully recorded, even she fulfilled the law of womanhood, which is to love deeply and intensely only once. One should not place all her lovers in the same category. As a girl, and when repelled by the imbecility of Peter, she gave herself to Gregory Orloff. She admired his strength, his daring, and his unscrupulousness. But to a woman of her fine intelligence, he came to seem almost more brute than man. She could not turn to him for any of those delicate attentions which a woman loves so much, nor for that larger sympathy which wins the heart, as well as captivates the senses. A writer of the time has said that Orloff would hasten with equal readiness from the arms of Catherine to the embraces of any flat-nosed fin or filthy Kalmuk, or to the lowest creature whom he might encounter in the streets. It happened that, at the time of Catherine's appeal to the imperial guards, there came to her notice another man, who, as he proved in a trifling and yet most significant manner, had those traits which Orloff lacked. Catherine had mounted, man-fashion, a cavalry horse, and, with a helmet on her head, had reined up her steed before the barracks. At that moment, one of the minor nobles, who was also favorable to her, observed that her helmet had no plume. In a moment his horse was at her side. Bowing low over his saddle, he took his own plume from his helmet and fastened it to hers. This man was Prince Gregory Potemkin, and this slight act gives a clue to the influence which he afterward exercised over his imperial mistress. When Catherine grew weary of the Orloffs, and when she had enriched them with lands and treasures, she turned to Potemkin, and from then until the day of his death he was more to her than any other man had ever been. With others she might flirt, and might go even further than flirtation. 
but she allowed no other favorite to share her confidence, to give advice, or to direct her policies. To other men she made munificent gifts, either because they pleased her for the moment, or because they served her on one occasion or another. But to Potemkin she opened wide the whole treasury of her vast realm. There was no limit to what she would do for him. When he first knew her, he was a man of very moderate fortune. Within two years after their intimate acquaintance had begun, she had given him nine million roubles, while afterward he accepted almost limitless estates in Poland and in every province of greater Russia. He was a man of sumptuous tastes, and yet he cared but little for mere wealth. What he had he used to please or gratify or surprise the woman whom he loved. He built himself a great palace in St. Petersburg, usually known as the Taurian Palace, and there he gave the most sumptuous entertainments, reversing the story of Antony and Cleopatra. In a superb library there stood one case containing volumes bound with unusual richness. When the empress, attracted by the bindings, drew forth a book, she found to her surprise that its pages were English banknotes. The pages of another proved to be Dutch banknotes, and of another notes on the bank of Venice. Of the remaining volumes, some were of solid gold, while others had pages of fine leather in which were set emeralds, and rubies, and diamonds, and other gems. The story reads like a bit of fiction from the Arabian Nights. Yet, after all, this is only a small affair compared with other undertakings with which Potemkin sought to please her. Thus, after Tarida and the Crimea had been added to the empire by Potemkin's agency, Catherine set out with him to view her new possessions. A great fleet of magnificently decorated galleys bore her down the river Dnieper. The country through which she passed had been a year before an unoccupied waste. Now, by Potemkin's extraordinary efforts, the empress found it dotted thick with towns and cities which had been erected for the occasion, filled with a busy population which swarmed along the riverside to greet the sovereign with applause. It was only a chain of phantom towns and cities made of painted wood and canvas, but while Catherine was there they were very real, seeming to have solid buildings magnificent arches, bustling industries, and beautiful stretches of fertile country. No human being ever wrought on so great a scale, so marvelous a miracle of stage management. Potemkin was, in fact, the one man who could appeal with unfailing success to so versatile and powerful a spirit as Catherine's. He was handsome of person, graceful of manner, and with an intellect which matched her own. He never tried to force her inclination, and, on the other hand, he never strove to thwart it. To him, as to no other man, she could turn at any moment and feel that, no matter what her mood, he could understand her fully. And this, according to Balzac, is the thing that woman yearns for most, a kindred spirit that can understand without the slightest need of explanation. Thus it was that Gregory Potemkin held a place in the soul of this great woman, such as no one else attained. He might be absent, heading armies or ruling provinces, and on his return he would be greeted with even greater fondness than before. And it was this, rather than his victories over Turk and other Oriental enemies, that made Catherine trust him 
Absolutely. When he died, he died as the supreme master of her foreign policy, and at a time when her word was powerful throughout all Europe. Death came upon him after he had fought against it with singular tenacity of purpose. Catherine had given him a magnificent triumph, and he had entertained her in his Torian palace with a splendor such as even Russia had never known before. Then he fell ill, though with high spirit he would not yield to illness. He ate rich meats and drank rich wines and bore himself as gallantly as ever. Yet all at once death came upon him while he was traveling in the south of Russia. His carriage was stopped. A rug was spread beneath a tree by the roadside there he died, in the country which he had added to the realms of Russia. The great empress who loved him mourned him deeply during the five years of life that still remained to her. The names of other men for whom she had imagined that she cared were nothing to her. But this one man lived in her heart in death as he had done in life. Many have written of Catherine as a great ruler, a wise diplomat, a creature of heroic mold. Others have depicted her as a royal wanton, and have gathered together a mass of vicious tales, the gossip of the palace kitchens, of the clubs, and of the barrack rooms. But perhaps one finds the chief interest of her story to lie in this, that besides being empress and diplomat and a lover of pleasure, she was beyond all else at heart a woman. End of Empress Catherine and Prince Potemkin Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, for LibriVox. Marie Antoinette and Count Fersen Volume 2 of Famous Affinities of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr Volume 2 Marie Antoinette and Count Fersen The English-speaking world long ago accepted a conventional view of Marie Antoinette. The eloquence of Edmund Burke in one brilliant passage has fixed, probably for all time, an enduring picture of this unhappy queen. When we speak or think of her, we speak and think first of all of a dazzling and beautiful woman, surrounded by the chivalry of France, and gleaming like a star in the most splendid court of Europe. And then there comes to us the reverse of the picture. We see her despised, insulted, and made the butt of brutal men and still more fiendish women, until at last the hideous tumbrel conveys her to the guillotine where her head is severed from her body, and her corpse is cast down into a bloody pool. In these two pictures our emotions are played upon in turn. Admiration, reverence, devotion, and then pity, indignation, and the shudderings of horror. Probably in our own country, and in England, this will remain the historic Marie Antoinette. Whatever the impartial historian may write, he can never induce the people at large to understand that this queen was far from queenly, that the popular idea of her is almost wholly false, and that both in her domestic life and as the greatest lady in France she did much to bring on the terrors of that revolution which swept her to the guillotine. In the first place, it is mere fiction that represents Maria Antoinette as having been physically beautiful. 
the painters and engravers have so idealized her face as in most cases to have produced a purely imaginary portrait. She was born in Vienna, in 1755, the daughter of the Emperor Francis and of that warrior queen Maria Theresa. She was a very German-looking child. Lady Jackson describes her as having a long, thin face, small, pig-like eyes, a pinched-up mouth with a heavy Habsburg lip, and with a somewhat misshapen form, so that for years she had to be bandaged tightly to give her a more natural figure. At fourteen, when she was betrothed to the heir to the French throne, she was a dumpy, mean-looking little creature, with no distinction whatever, and with only her bright golden hair to make amends for her many blemishes. At fifteen she was married, and joined the Dauphin in French territory. We must recall for a moment the conditions which prevailed in France. King Louis the Fifteenth was nearing his end. He was a man of the most shameless life, yet he had concealed or gilded his infamies by an external dignity and magnificence which were very pleasing to his people. The French liked to think that their king was the most splendid monarch and the greatest gentleman in Europe. The courtiers about him might be vile beneath the surface, yet they were compelled to deport themselves with the form and the etiquette that had become traditional in France. They might be panders, or stock-jobbers, or sellers of political offices, yet they must none the less have wit and grace and outward nobility of manner. There was also a tradition regarding the French queen. However loose in character the other women of the court might be, she alone, like Caesar's wife, must remain above suspicion. She must be purer than the pure. No breath of scandal must reach her or be directed against her. In this way the French court, even under so dissolute a monarch as Louis the Fifteenth, maintained its hold upon the loyalty of the people. Crowds came every morning to view the king in his bed before he arose. The same crowds watched him as he was dressed by the gentlemen of the bedchamber, and as he breakfasted and went through all the functions which are usually private. The king of France must be a great actor. He must appear to his people as in reality a king, stately, dignified, and beyond all other human beings in his remarkable presence. When the Dauphin and Marie Antoinette came to the French court, King Louis the Fifteenth kept up in the case the same semblance of austerity. He forbade these children to have their sleeping apartments together. He tried to teach them that if they were to govern as well as to reign, they must conform to the rigid etiquette of Paris and Versailles. It proved a difficult task, however. The little German princess had no natural dignity though she came from a court where the very strictest imperial discipline prevailed. Marie Antoinette found that she could have her own way in many things, and she chose to enjoy life without regard to ceremony. Her escapades at first would have been thought mild enough had she not been a daughter of France, but they served to shock the old French king, and likewise, perhaps even more, her own imperial mother, Maria Theresa. When a report of the young girl's conduct was brought to her, the empress was at first mute with indignation. Then she cried out, "'Can this girl be a child of mine? She must surely be a changeling!' The Austrian ambassador to France was instructed to warn the Dauphiness to be more discreet. "'Tell her,' said Maria Theresa, "'that she will lose her throne and even her life unless she shows more prudence.' but advice and remonstrance were of no avail. Perhaps they might have been had her husband possessed a stronger character, but the young Louis was little more fitted to be a king than was his wife to be a queen. Dull of perception, and indifferent to affairs of state, he had only two interests that absorbed him. One was the love of hunting, and the other was his desire to shut himself up in a sort of blacksmith shop, where he could hammer away at the anvil, blow the bellows, and manufacture small trifles of mechanical inventions. From this smudgy den he would emerge, sooty and greasy, 
an object of distaste to his frivolous princess, with her foamy laces and perfumes and pervasive daintiness. It was hinted in many quarters, and it has been many times repeated, that Louis was lacking in virility. Certainly he had no interest in the society of women, and was wholly continent. But this charge of physical incapacity seems to have had no real foundation. It has been made against some of his predecessors. It was afterward hurled at Napoleon the Great, and also Napoleon the Little. In France, unless a royal personage was openly licentious, he was almost sure to be jeered at by the people as a weakling. And so poor Louis the Sixteenth, as he came to be, was treated with a mixture of pity and contempt, because he loved to hammer and mend locks in his smithy or shoot game, when he might have been caressing ladies who would have been proud to have him choose them out. On the other hand, because of this opinion regarding Louis, people were the more suspicious of Marie Antoinette. Some of them, in coarse language, criticized her assumed infidelities. Others, with a polite sneer, affected to defend her. But the result of it all was dangerous to both, especially as France was already verging toward the deluge with Louis the Fifteenth had cynically predicted would follow after him. In fact, the end came sooner than any one had guessed. Louis the Fifteenth, who had become hopelessly and helplessly infatuated with the low-born Jeanne de Bury, was struck down with smallpox of the most virulent type. For many days he lay in his gorgeous bed. Courtiers crowded his sick room and the adjacent hall, longing for the moment when the breath would leave his body. He had lived an evil life, and he was to die a lonesome death. Yet he had borne himself before men as a stately monarch. Though his people had suffered in a thousand ways from his misgovernment, he was still Louis the Well-Beloved, and they blamed his ministers of state for all the shocking wrongs that France had felt. The abler men, and some of the leaders of the people, however, looked forward to the accession of Louis the Sixteenth. He at least was frugal in his habits, and almost plebeian in his tastes, and seemed to be one who would reduce the enormous taxes that had been levied upon France. The moment came when the well-beloved died. His death-room was fetid with disease, and even the long corridors of the palace reeked with infection, while the motley mob of men and women clad in silks and satins and glittering with jewels hurried from the spot to pay their homage to the new Louis, who was spoken of as the desired. The body of the late monarch was hastily thrown into a mass of quicklime, and was driven away in a humble wagon, without guards and with no salute, save from a single veteran who remembered the glories of Fontenoy, and discharged his musket as the royal corpse was carried through the palace gates. This was a critical moment in the history of France, but we have to consider it only as a critical moment in the history of Marie Antoinette. She was now queen. She had it in her power to restore to the French court its old-time grandeur, and, so far as the queen was concerned, its purity. Above all, being a foreigner, she should have kept herself free from reproach and above every shadow of suspicion. But here again the indifference of the king undoubtedly played a strange part in her life. Had he borne himself as her lord and master, she might have respected him. Had he shown her the affection of a husband, she might have loved him. But he was neither imposing nor, on the other hand, was he alluring. She wrote very frankly about him in a letter to the Count Orsini. My tastes are not the same as those of the king who cares only for hunting and blacksmith work. You will admit that I should not show to advantage in a forge. I could not appear there as Vulcan, and the part of Venus might displease him even more than my tastes. Thus, on the one side, is a woman in the first bloom of youth, ardent, eager, and neglected. On the other side is her husband, whose sluggishness may be judged by quoting from a diary which he kept during the month in which he was married. Here is a part of it. Sunday, 13th. 
left Versailles, supper and slept at Compigny, at the house of Monsieur de Saint Florentin. Monday, the fourteenth, interview with Madame la Dauphine. Tuesday, the fifteenth, supped at La Muette, slept at Versailles. Wednesday, the sixteenth, my marriage, apartment in the gallery, royal banquet in the Salle de Opera. Thursday, the seventeenth, Opera of Perseus. Friday, the eighteenth, stag hunt. Met at La Belle Image. Took one. Saturday, the nineteenth, dress ball in the Salle de Opera. Fireworks. Thursday, the thirty-first, I had indigestion. What might have been expected from a young girl placed as this queen was placed? She was indeed an earlier Eugenie. The first was of royal blood, the second was almost a plebeian, but each was headstrong, pleasure-loving, and with no real domestic ties. As Mr. Kipling expresses it, the Colonel's Lady and Judy O'Grady are sisters under their skin. And so the Austrian woman of 1776 and the Spanish woman of 1856 found amusement in very similar ways. They plunged into a sea of strange frivolity such as one finds today at the centers of high fashion. Marie Antoinette bedecked herself with eccentric garments. On her head she wore a hat styled a What Is It, towering many feet in height and flaunting party-colored plumes. Worse than all this, she refused to wear corsets, and at some great function she would appear in what looked exactly like a bedroom gown. She would neglect even the ordinary niceties of life. Her hands were not well cared for. It was very difficult for the ladies in attendance to persuade her to brush her teeth with regularity. Again, she would persist in wearing her frilled and lace-trimmed petticoats long after their dainty edges had been smirched and blackened. Yet these things might have been counteracted had she gone no further. Unfortunately, she did go further. She loved to dress at night like a shop girl and venture out into the world of Paris, where she was frequently followed and recognized. Think of it. The Queen of France, elbowed in dense crowds and seeking to attract the attention of common soldiers. Of course, almost everyone put the worst construction upon this, and after a time upon everything, she did. When she took a fancy for constructing labyrinths and secret passages in the palace, all Paris vowed that she was planning means by which her various lovers might enter without observation. The hidden printing presses of Paris swarmed with gross lampoons about this reckless girl, and although there was little truth in what they said, there was enough to cloud her reputation. When she fell ill with the measles, she was attended in her sick chamber by four gentlemen of the court. The king was forbidden to enter, lest he might catch the childish disorder. The apathy of the king, indeed, drove her into many a folly. After four years of marriage, as Mrs. Main records, he had only reached the point of giving her a chilly kiss. The fact that she had no children became a serious matter. Her brother, the Emperor Joseph of Austria, when he visited Paris, ventured to speak to the king upon the subject. Even the Austrian ambassador had thrown out hints that the house of Bourbon needed direct heirs. Louis grunted and said little, but he must have known how good was the advice. It was at about this time when there came to the French court a young Swede named Axel de Fersen, who bore the title of Count, but who was received less for his rank than for his winning manner, his knightly bearing, and his handsome, sympathetic face. Romantic in spirit, he threw himself at once into a silent inner worship of Marie Antoinette, who had for him a singular attraction. Wherever he could meet her, they met. To her growing cynicism, this breath of pure yet ardent affection was very grateful. It came as something fresh and sweet into the feverish life she led. Other men had had the audacity to woo her, 
among them the Duc de Lausanne, whose complicity in the famous affair of the diamond necklace afterward cast her, though innocent, into ruin, the Duc de Biron and the Duc uh, and the Baron de Bezenval, who had obtained much influence over her, which he had used for the most evil purposes. Bezenval tainted her mind by persuading her to read indecent books, in the hope that at last she would become his prey. But none of these men ever meant to Marie Antoinette what Fersen meant. Though less than twenty years of age, he maintained the reserve of a great gentleman and never forced himself upon her notice. Yet their first acquaintance had occurred in such a way as to give it a touch of intimacy. He had gone to a masked ball, and there had chosen for his partner a lady whose face was quite concealed. Something drew the two together. The gaiety of the woman and the chivalry of the man blended most harmoniously. It was only afterward that he discovered that his chance partner was the first lady in France. She kept his memory in her mind, for some time later, when he was at a royal drawing-room and she heard his voice, she exclaimed, "'Ah, an old acquaintance!' From this time, Person was among those who were most intimately favored by the queen. He had the privilege of attending her private receptions at the palace of the Trianon, and was a conspicuous figure at the feast given in the queen's honor by the princess de Lamballe, a beautiful girl whose head was destined afterward to be severed from her body and borne upon a bloody pike through the streets of Paris. But as yet the deluge had not yet arrived and the great and noble still danced upon the brink of a volcano. Fersen grew more and more infatuated, nor could he quite conceal his feelings. The queen, in her turn, was neither frightened nor indignant. His passion, so profound and yet so respectful, deeply moved her. There came a time when the truth was made clear to both of them. Fersen was near her, while she was singing to the harpsichord, and she was betrayed by her own music into an avowal which song made easy. She forgot that she was queen of France. She only felt that her womanhood had been starved and slighted, and that here was a noble-minded lover of whom she could be proud. Some time after this, announcement was officially made of the approaching accouchement of the queen. It was impossible that malicious tongues should be silent. The king's brother, the Comte de Provence, who, had, who hated the queen, just as the Bonapartes afterward hated Josephine, did his best to besmirch her reputation. He had, indeed, the extraordinary insolence to do so at a time when one would suppose the vilest of men would remain silent. The child proved to be a princess, and she afterward received the title of Duchesse de Angoulême. The king of Spain asked to be her godfather at the christening, which was to be held in the cathedral of Notre Dame. The Spanish king was not present in person, but asked the Comte de Provence to act as his proxy. On the appointed day, the royal party proceeded to the cathedral, and the Comte de Provence presented the little child at the baptismal front and the Comte de Provence presented the little child at the baptismal font. The grand almoner who presided asked, What name shall be given to this child? The Comte de Provence answered in a sneering tone, Oh, we don't begin with that. The first thing to find out is who the father and the mother are. These words spoken at such a place and such a time and with a strongly sardonic ring set all Paris gossiping. It was a thinly veiled innuendo that the father of the child was not the king of France. Those about the court immediately began to look at Fersen with significant smiles. The queen would gladly have kept him near her, but Fersen cared even more for her good name than for his love of her. It would have been so easy to remain in the full enjoyment of his conquest, but he was too chivalrous for that or, rather, he knew that the various ambassadors in Paris had told their respective governments of the rising scandal. In fact, the following secret dispatch was sent to the King of Sweden by his envoy. I must confide to your Majesty that the young Count Fersen has been so well received by the Queen 
that various persons have taken it amiss. I own that I am sure that she has a liking for him. I have seen proofs of it too certain to be doubted. During the last few days the Queen has not taken her eyes off him, and as she gazed they were full of tears. I beg your majesty to keep their secret to yourself. The queen wept, because Fersen had resolved to leave her, lest she should be exposed to further gossip. If he left her without any apparent reason, the gossip would only be the more intense. Therefore, he decided to join the French troops who were going to America to fight under Lafayette. A brilliant but dissolute duchess taunted him when the news became known. How is this? said she, do you forsake your conquest? But, lying like a gentleman, Fersen answered quietly, had I made a conquest, I should not forsake it. I go away free, and unfortunately without leaving any regret. Nothing could have been more chivalrous than the pains which Fersen took to shield the reputation of the queen. He even allowed it to be supposed that he was planning a marriage with a rich young Swedish woman who had been naturalized in England. As a matter of fact, he departed for America, and not very long afterward the young woman in question married an Englishman. Fersen served in America for a long time, returning, however, at the end of three years. He was one of the original Cincinnati, being admitted to the order by Washington himself. When he returned to France, he was received with high honors and was made colonel of the Royal Swedish Regiment. The dangers threatening Louis and his court, which were now gigantic and appalling, forbade him to forsake the queen. By her side he did what he could to check the revolution, and, failing this, he helped her maintain an imperial dignity of manner which she might otherwise have lacked. He faced the bellowing mob which surrounded the Tuileries. Lafayette tried to make the National Guard obey his orders, but he was jeered at for his pains. Violent epithets were hurled at the king. The least insulting name which they could give him was a fat pig. As for the queen, the most filthy phrases were showered upon her by the men, and even more so by the women, who swarmed out of the slums and sought her life. At last, in 1791, it was decided that the king and the queen and their children, of whom they now had three, should endeavor to escape from Paris. First and planned their flight but it proved to be a failure. Everyone remembers how they were discovered and halted at Varennes. The royal party was escorted back to Paris by the mob, which chanted with insolent additions, We've brought back the baker, the baker's wife, and the baker's boy. Now we shall have bread. Against the savage fury which soon animated the French, a foreigner like Fersen could do very little, but he seems to have endeavored night and day, to save the woman whom he loved. His efforts have been described by Grandat, but they were of no avail. The king and queen were practically made prisoners. Their eldest son died. They went through horrors that were stimulated by the wretched Hibert at the head of his so-called madman, Enrage. The king was executed in January 1792. The queen dragged out a brief existence in a prison where she was forever under the eyes of human brutes, who guarded her and watched her and jeered at her at times when even men would be sensitive. Then at last she mounted the scaffold, and her head, with its shining hair, fell into the bloody basket. Marie Antoinette shows many contradictions in her character. As a young girl she was petulant and silly and almost unseemly in her actions. As a queen, with waning power, she took on a dignity, which recalled the dignity of her imperial mother. At first a flirt, she fell deeply in love when she met a man who was worthy of that love. She lived for most part like a mere cocotte. She died every inch a queen. One finds a curious resemblance between the fate of Marie Antoinette and that of her gallant lover, who outlived her for nearly twenty years. She died amid the streets and execrations of a maddened populace in Paris. He was practically torn in pieces by a mob in the streets of Stockholm. The day of his death was the anniversary of the flight to Varennes. To the last moment of his existence, he remained faithful to the memory of the royal woman who had given herself so utterly to him. End of Marie Antoinette and Count Fersen 
Recording by Miriam Esther Goldman. The Story of Aaron Burr, Volume 2 of Famous Affinities of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Miriam Esther Goldman. Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr, Volume 2. The Story of Aaron Burr. There will come a time when the name of Aaron Burr will be cleared from the prejudice which now surrounds it, when he will stand in the public estimation side by side with Alexander Hamilton, whom he shot in a duel in 1804, but whom in many respects he curiously resembled. When the white light of history shall have searched them both, they will appear as two remarkable men, each having his own undoubted faults, and at the same time his equally undoubted virtues. Burr and Hamilton were born within a year of each other, Burr being a grandson of Jonathan Edwards, and Alexander Hamilton being the illegitimate son of a Scottish merchant in the West Indies. Each of them was short in stature, keen of intellect, of great physical endurance, courage, and impressive personality. Each, as a young man, served on the staff of Washington during the Revolutionary War, and each of them quarreled with him, though in a different way. On one occasion, Burr was quite unjustly suspected by Washington of looking over the latter's shoulder while he was writing. Washington leaped to his feet with the exclamation, "'How dare you, Colonel Burr!' Burr's eyes flashed at the question, and he retorted haughtily, "'Colonel Burr dare do anything!' This, however, was the end of their altercation. The cause of Hamilton's difference with his chief is not known, but it was a much more serious quarrel, so that the young officer left his staff position in a fury and took no part in the war until the end, when he was present at the Battle of Yorktown. Burr, on the other hand, helped Montgomery to storm the heights of Quebec, and nearly reached the upper citadel when his commander was shot dead and the Americans retreated. In all this confusion, Burr showed himself a man of metal. The slain Montgomery was six feet high, but Burr carried his body away with wonderful strength amid a shower of musket balls and grape shot. Hamilton had no belief in the American Constitution, which he called a shattered, feeble thing. He could never obtain an elective office, and he would have preferred to see the United States transformed into a kingdom. Washington's magnanimity and clear-sightedness made Hamilton secretary of the Treasury. Burr, on the other hand, continued his military service until the war was ended, routing the enemy at Hackensack, enduring the horrors of Valley Forge, commanding a brigade at the Battle of Monmouth, and heading the defense of the city of New Haven. He was also Attorney General of New York, was elected to the United States Senate, was tied with Jefferson for the presidency, and then became vice-president. Both Hamilton and Burr were effective speakers, but while Hamilton was wordy and diffuse, Burr spoke always to the point, with clear and cogent reasoning. Both were lavish spenders of money, and both were engaged in duels before the fatal one in which Hamilton fell. Both believed in dueling as the only way of settling an affair of honor. Neither of them was averse to love affairs, though it may be said that Hamilton sought women, while Burr was rather sought by women. When Secretary of the Treasury, Hamilton was obliged to confess an adulterous amour in order to save himself from the charge of corrupt practices in public offices. So long as Burr's wife lived, he was a devoted, faithful husband to her. Hamilton was obliged to confess his illicit acts, while his wife, formerly Miss Elizabeth Schuyler, was living. She spent her later years in buying and destroying the compromising documents which her husband had published for his countrymen to read. The most extraordinary thing about Aaron Burr was the magnetic quality that was felt by everyone who approached him. The roots of this penetrated down into a deep vitality. He was always young, always alert, polished in manner, 
courageous with that sort of courage which does not even recognize the presence of danger, charming in conversation, and able to adapt it to men or women of any age whatever. His hair was still dark in his eightieth year. His step was still elastic. His motions were still as spontaneous and energetic as those of a youth. So it was that everyone who knew him experienced his fascination. The rough troops whom he led through the Canadian swamps felt the iron hand of his discipline, yet they were devoted to him, since he shared all their toils, faced all their dangers, and ate with them the scraps of hide which they gnawed to keep the breath of life in their shrunken bodies. Burr's discipline was indeed very strict, so that at first raw recruits rebelled against it. On one occasion the men of an untrained company resented it so bitterly that they decided to shoot Colonel Burr as he paraded them for roll call that evening. Burr somehow got word of it, and contrived to have all the cartridges drawn from their muskets. When the time for the roll call came, one of the malcontents leaped from the front line and leveled his weapon at Burr. "'Now is the time, boys!' he shouted. Like lightning, Burr's sword flashed from its scabbard with such a vigorous stroke as to cut the man's arm completely off and partly to cleave the musket. "'Take your place in the ranks,' said Burr. The mutineer obeyed, dripping with blood. A month later, every man in that company was devoted to his commander. They had learned that discipline was the surest source of safety. But with this high spirit and readiness to fight, Burr had a most pleasing way of meeting everyone who came to him. When he was arrested in the western forest, charged with high treason, the sound of his voice won from jury after jury verdicts of acquittal. Often the sheriffs would not arrest him. One grand jury merely exonerated him from all public misdemeanors, but brought in a strong presentment against the officers of the government for molesting him. It was the same everywhere. Burr made friends and devoted allies among all sorts of men. During his stay in France, England, Germany, and Sweden, he interested such men as Charles Lamb, Jeremy Bentham, Sir Walter Scott, Goethe, and Heeren. They found his mind able to meet with theirs on equal terms. Burr, indeed, had graduated as a youth with honors from Princeton, and had continued his studies there after graduation, which was then a most unusual thing to do. But, of course, he learned most from his contact with men and women of the world. Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe, in The Minister's Wooing, has given what is probably an exact likeness of Burr with his brilliant gifts and some of his defects. It is a strong testimony to the character of Mr. Burr that Mrs. Stowe set out to paint him as a villain, but before she had written long she felt his fascination and made her readers in their own despite admirers of this remarkable man. There are many parallels, indeed, between him and Napoleon, in the quickness of his intellect, the ready use of his resources, and his power over men, while he was more than Napoleon in his delightful gift of conversation and the easy play of his cultured mind. Those who are full of charm are willing also to be charmed. All his life Burr was abstemious in food and drink. His tastes were most refined. It is difficult to believe that such a man could have been an unmitigated profligate, in his twentieth year there seems to have begun the first of the romances that run through the story of his long career. Perhaps one ought not to call it the first romance, for at eighteen, while he was studying law at Litchfield, a girl whose name has been suppressed made an open avowal of love for him. Almost at the same time an heiress with a large fortune would have married him had he been willing to accept her hand but at this period he was only a boy and did not take such things seriously. Two years later, after Burr had seen hard service at Quebec and on Manhattan Island, his name was associated with that of a very beautiful girl named Margaret Moncrief. She was the daughter of a British major, but in some way she had been captured while within the American lines. 
Her captivity was regarded as little more than a joke, but while she was thus a prisoner she saw a great deal of Burr. For several months they were comrades, after which General Putnam sent her with his compliments to her father. Margaret Moncrief had a most emotional nature. There can be no doubt that she deeply loved the handsome young American officer, whom she never saw again. It is doubtful how far their intimacy was carried. Later she married a Mr. Coglan. After reaching middle life, she wrote of Burr in a way which shows that neither years nor the obligations of marriage could make her forget that young soldier, whom she speaks of as the conqueror of her soul. In the rather florid style of those days, the once youthful Margaret Moncrief expresses herself as follows. Oh, may these pages one day meet the eye of him who subdued my virgin heart, whom the immutable, unerring laws of nature had pointed out for my husband, but whose sacred decree the barbarous customs of society fatally violated. Commenting on this paragraph, Mr. H. C. Merwin justly remarks that, whatever may have been Burr's conduct towards Margaret Moncrief, the lady herself, who was the person chiefly concerned, had no complaint to make of it. It certainly was no very serious affair, since in the following year Burr met a lady who, while she lived, was the only woman for whom he ever really cared. This was Theodosia Prevost, the wife of a major in the British Army. Burr met her first in 1777, while she was living with her sister in Westchester County. Burr's command was fifteen miles across the river, but distance and danger made no difference to him. He used to mount a swift horse, inspect his sentinels and outposts, and then gallop to the Hudson, where a barge rowed by six soldiers awaited him. The barge was well supplied with buffalo skins, upon which the horse was thrown with his legs bound, and then half an hour's rowing brought them to the other side. There Burr resumed his horse, galloped to the house of Miss Provost, and, after a few hours with her, returned in the same way. Mrs. Provost was by no means beautiful, but she had an attractiveness of her own. She was well educated and possessed charming manners, with a disposition both gentle and affectionate. Her husband died soon after the beginning of the war, and then Burr married her. No more ideal family could be conceived than his, and the letters which pass between the two are full of adoration. Thus she wrote to him. Tell me, why do I grow every day more tenacious of your regard? Is it because each revolving day proves you more deserving? And thus Burr answered her. Continue to multiply your letters to me. They are all my solace. The last six are constantly within my reach. I read them once a day at least. Write me all that I have asked, and a hundred things which I have not. When it is remembered that these letters were written after nine years of marriage, it is hard to believe all the evil things that have been said of Burr. His wife died in 1794, and then he gave a double affection to his daughter Theodosia, whose beauty and accomplishments were well known throughout the country. Burr took the greatest pains in her education, and believed that she should be trained, as he had been, to be brave, industrious, and patient. He himself, who has been described as a voluptuary, delighted in the endurance of cold and heat and of severe labor. After his death, one of his young admirers was asked what Burr had done for him. The reply was characteristic. He made me iron was the answer. No father ever gave more attention to his daughter's welfare. As to Theodosia's studies, he was very strict, making her read Greek and Latin every day, with drawing and music and history, in addition to French. Not long before her marriage to Joseph Alston of South Carolina, Burr wrote to her, I really think, my dear Theo, that you will be very soon beyond all verbal criticism and that my whole attention will be presently directed to the improvement of your style. Theodosia Burr married into a family of good old English stock, where riches were abundant and high character was regarded as the best of all possessions. 
Everyone has heard of the mysterious tragedy which is associated with her history. In 1812, when her husband had been elected governor of his state, her only child, a sturdy boy of eleven, died, and Theodosia's health was shattered by her sorrow. In the same year, Burr returned from a sojourn in Europe, and his loving daughter embarked from Charleston on a schooner, the Patriot, to meet her father in New York. When Burr arrived, he was met by a letter which told him that his grandson was dead and that Theodosia was coming to him. The weeks sped by, and no news was heard of the ill-fated patriot. At last it became evident that she must have gone down, or in some other way have been lost. Burr and Governor Alston wrote to each other letter after letter, of which each one seems to surpass the agony of the other. At last all hope was given up. Governor Alston died soon after of a broken heart, but Burr, as became a Stoic, acted otherwise. He concealed everything that reminded him of Theodosia. He never spoke of his lost daughter. His grief was too deep-seated and too terrible for speech. Only once did he ever allude to her, and this was in a letter written to an afflicted friend, which contained the words— Ever since the event which separated me from mankind, I have been able neither to give nor to receive consolation. In time, the crew of a pirate vessel was captured and sentenced to be hanged. One of the men, who seemed to be less brutal than the rest, told how in 1812 they had captured a schooner, and, after their usual practice, had compelled the passengers to walk the plank. All hesitated and showed cowardice, except only one, a beautiful woman, whose eyes were as bright, and whose bearing was as unconcerned, as if she were safe on shore. She quickly led the way, and, mounting the plank with a certain scorn of death, said to the others, Come, I will show you how to die. It has always been supposed that this intrepid girl may have been Theodosia Alston, if so, she only acted as her father would have done, and in strict accordance with his teachings. This resolute courage, this stern joy in danger, this perfect equanimity, made Burr especially attractive to women who love courage, the more so when it is coupled with gentleness and generosity. Perhaps no man in our country has been so vehemently accused regarding his relations with the other sex. The most improbable stories were told about him, even by his friends. As to his enemies, they took boundless pains to paint him in the blackest colors. According to them, no woman was safe from his intrigues. He was a perfect devil in leading them astray and then casting them aside. Thus one Matthew L. Davis, in whom Burr had confided as a friend, wrote of him long afterward a most unjust account, unjust because we have proofs that it was false in the intensity of its abuse. Davis wrote, It is truly surprising how any individual could become so eminent as a soldier, as a statesman, and as a professional man who devoted so much time to the other sex as was devoted by Colonel Burr. For more than half a century of his life they seemed to absorb his whole thought. His intrigues were without number. The sacred bonds of friendship were unhesitatingly violated when they operated as barriers to the indulgence of his passions. In this particular, Burr appears to have been unfeeling and heartless. It is impossible to believe that the Spartan Burr, whose life was one of incessant labor and whose kindliness toward every one was so well known should have deserved a commentary like this the charge of immorality is so easily made and so difficult of disproof that it has been flung promiscuously at all the great men of history including in our own country washington and jefferson as well as burr in england when gladstone was more than seventy years of age he once stopped to ask a question of a woman in the street 
Within twenty-four hours the London clubs were humming with a sort of demonic glee over the story that this aged and austere old gentleman was not above seeking common street amours. And so with Aaron Burr to a great extent. That he was a man of strict morality it would be absurd to maintain. That he was a reckless and licentious profligate would be almost equally untrue. Mr. H. O. Merwin has very truly said, Part of Burr's reputation for profligacy was due, no doubt, to that vanity respecting women of which Davis himself speaks. He never refused to accept the parentage of a child. Why do you allow this woman to saddle you with her child when you know you are not the father of it? said a friend to him a few months before his death. Sir, he replied, when a lady does me the honor to name me the father of her child, I trust I shall always be too gallant to show myself ungrateful for the favor. There are two curious legends relating to Aaron Burr. They serve to show that his reputation became such that he could not enjoy the society of a woman without having her regarded as his mistress. When he was a United States senator from New York, he lived in Philadelphia at the lodging-house of a Mrs. Payne, whose daughter, Dorothy Todd, was the very youthful widow of an officer. This young woman was rather free in her manners, and Burr was very responsive in his. At the time, however, nothing was thought of it. But presently Burr brought to the house the serious and somewhat pedantic James Madison and introduced him to the hoyden. Madison was then forty-seven years of age, a stranger to society, but gradually rising to a prominent position in politics. The Great Little Madison, as Burr rather lightly called him. Before long he had proposed marriage to the young widow. She hesitated, and someone referred the matter to President Washington. The father of his country answered in what was perhaps the only opinion that he ever gave on the subject of matrimony. It is worth preserving because it shows that he had a sense of humor. For my own part, I never did, nor do I believe I ever shall, give advice to a woman who is setting out on a matrimonial voyage. A woman very rarely asks an opinion or seeks advice on such an occasion till her mind is wholly made up, and then it is with the hope and expectation of obtaining a sanction, and not that she means to be governed by your disapproval. Afterward, when Dolly Madison, with her yellow turban and kittenish ways, was making a sensation in Washington society, someone recalled her old association with Burr. At once the story sprang to light that Burr had been her lover, and that he had brought about the match with Madison as an easy way of getting rid of her. There is another curious story which makes Martin Van Buren, eighth president of the United States, to have been the illegitimate son of Burr. There is no earthly reason for believing this, except that Burr sometimes stopped overnight at the tavern in Kinderhook, which was kept by Burren's putative father, and that Van Buren in later life showed an astuteness equal to that of Aaron Burr himself, so that he was called by his opponents the Fox of Kinderhook. But, as Van Buren was born in December of the same year, 1782, in which Burr was married to Theodosia Prevost, the story is utterly improbable, and we remember, as we must, the ardent affection which Burr showed his wife not only before their marriage, but afterward, until her death. Putting aside these purely spurious instances, as well as others cited by Mr. Parton, the fact remains that Aaron Burr, like Daniel Webster, found a great attraction in the society of women, that he could please them and fascinate them to an extraordinary degree, and that during his later life he must be held quite culpable in this respect. His love-making was ardent and rapid, as we shall afterwards see in the case of his second marriage. Many other stories are told of him. For instance, it is said that he once took a stagecoach from Jersey City to Philadelphia. The only other occupant was a woman of high standing, and one whose family deeply hated Burr. Nevertheless, so the story goes, before they had reached Newark, 
She was absolutely swayed by his charm of manner, and when the coach made its last stop before Philadelphia, she voluntarily became his mistress. It must also be said that, unlike those of Webster and Hamilton, his intrigues were never carried on with women of the lower sort. This may be held by some to deepen the charge against him, but more truly does it exonerate him, since it really means that in many cases these women of the world threw themselves at him and sought him as a lover, when otherwise he might never have thought of them. That he was not heartless and indifferent to those who had loved him may be shown by the great care which he took to protect their names and reputations. Thus, on the day before his duel with Hamilton, he made a will in which he constituted his son-in-law as his executor. At the same time, he wrote a sealed letter to Governor Alston, in which he said, If you can pardon and indulge a folly, I would suggest that Madame, too well under the name of Lenora, has claims on my recollection. She is now with her husband at Santiago, in Cuba. Another fact has been turned to his discredit. From many women, in the course of his long life, he had received a great quantity of letters written by aristocratic hands on scented paper, and these letters he had never burned. Here again, perhaps, was shown the vanity of the man who loved love for its own sake. He kept all these papers in a huge iron-clamped chest, and he instructed Theodosia, in case he should die, to burn every letter which might injure anyone. After Theodosia's death, Burr gave the same instructions to Matthew L. Davis, who did indeed burn them, though he made their existence a means of blackening the character of Burr. He should have destroyed them unopened, and should never have mentioned them in his memoirs of the man who trusted him as a friend. Such was Aaron Burr throughout a life which lasted for eighty years. His last romance at the age of seventy-eight, is worth narrating, because it has often been misunderstood. Madame Jumel was a Rhode Island girl who, at seventeen years of age, eloped with an English officer, Colonel Peter Croft. Her first husband died while she was still quite young, and then she married a French wine merchant, Stephen Jumel, some twenty years her senior, but a man of much vigor and intelligence. Monsieur Jumel made a considerable fortune in New York, owning a small merchant fleet, and after Napoleon's downfall he and his wife went to Paris, where she made a great impression in the salons by her vivacity and wit and by her lavish expenditures. Losing, however, part of what she and her husband possessed, Madame Jumel returned to New York, bringing with her a great amount of furniture and paintings, with which she decorated the historic house still standing in the upper part of Manhattan Island, a mansion held by her in her own right. She managed her estate with much ability, and in 1828 Monsieur Jumel returned to live with her in what was in those days a splendid villa. Four years later, however, Monsieur Jumel suffered an accident from which he died in a few days, leaving his wife still an attractive woman, and not very much past her prime. Soon after she had occasion to seek for legal advice, and for this purpose visited the law office of Aaron Burr. She had known him a good many years before, and though he was now seventy-eight years of age, there was no perceptible change in him. He was still courtly in manner, tactful and deferential, while physically he was straight, active, and vigorous. A little later she invited him to a formal banquet, where he displayed all his charms and shone to great advantage. When he was about to lead her in to dinner, he said, "'I give my hand, madam, my heart has long been yours.' These attentions he followed up with several other visits, and finally proposed that she should marry him. Much fluttered and no less flattered, she uttered a sort of no which was not likely to discourage a man like Aaron Burr. "'I shall come to you before very long,' he said, "'accompanied by a clergyman, "'and then you will give me your hand, because I want it.' This rapid sort of wooing was pleasantly embarrassing, 
the lady rather liked it, and so, on an afternoon when the sun was shining and the leaves were rustling in the breeze, Burr drove up to Madame Jumel's mansion, accompanied by Dr. Bogart, the very clergyman who had married him to his first wife fifty years before. Madame Jumel was now seriously disturbed, but her refusal was not a strong one. There were reasons why she should accept the offer. The great house was lonely. The management of her estate required a man's advice. Moreover, she was under the spell of Burr's fascination. Therefore, she arrayed herself in one of her most magnificent Paris gowns. The members of her household and eight servants were called in, and the ceremony was duly performed by Dr. Bogart. A banquet followed. A dozen cobwebbed bottles of wine were brought up from the cellar, and the marriage feast went on merrily until after midnight. This marriage was a singular one from many points of view. It was strange that a man of seventy-eight should take by storm the affections of a woman so much younger than he, a woman of wealth and knowledge of the world. In the second place, it is odd that there was still another woman, a mere girl, who was so infatuated with Burr that when she was told of his marriage it nearly broke her heart. Finally, in the early part of that same year, he had been accused of being the father of a newborn child. And in spite of his age, everyone believed the charge to be true. Here is a case that it would be hard to parallel. The happiness of the newly married pair did not, however, last very long. They made a wedding journey into Connecticut, of which state Burr's nephew was then governor, and there Burr saw a monster bridge over the Connecticut River, in which his wife had shares, though they brought her little income. He suggested that she should transfer the investment, which, after all, was not a very large one, and place it in a venture in Texas which looked promising. The speculation turned out to be a loss, however, and this made Mrs. Burr extremely angry, the more so as she had reason to think that her ever-youthful husband had been engaged in flirting with the country girls near the Jumel mansion. She was a woman of high spirit, and had at times a violent temper. One day the postmaster, at what was then the village of Harlem, was supposed to see Mrs. Burr drive up before the post office in an open carriage. He came out to ask what she desired, and was surprised to find her in a violent temper, and with an enormous horse-pistol on each cushion at her side. "'What do you wish, madam?' said he, rather mildly. "'What do I wish?' she cried. "'Let me get at that villain Aaron Burr!' Presently Burr seems to have succeeded in pacifying her, but in the end they separated, though she afterward always spoke most kindly of him. When he died, only about a year later, she is said to have burst into a flood of tears. Another tribute to the fascination which Aaron Burr exercised through all his checkered life. It is difficult to come to any fixed opinion regarding the moral character of Aaron Burr. As a soldier, he was brave to the point of recklessness. As a political leader, he was almost the equal of Jefferson and quite superior to Hamilton. As a man of the world, he was highly accomplished, polished in manner, charming in conversation. He made friends easily, and he forgave his enemies with a broad-mindedness that is unusual. On the other hand, in his political career there was a touch of insincerity, and it can scarcely be denied that he used his charm too often to the injury of those women who could not resist his insinuating ways and the caressing notes of his rich voice. But as a husband in his youth, he was devoted, affectionate, and loyal, while as a father he was little less than worshipped by the daughter whom he reared so carefully. One of his biographers very truly says that no such wretch as Burr has been declared to be could have won and held the love of such a wife and such a daughter as Burr had. When all the other witnesses have been heard, let the two Theodosias be summoned, 
and especially that daughter who showed toward him an affectionate veneration unsurpassed by any recorded in history or romance. Such an advocate as Theodosia the Younger must avail in some degree, even though the culprit were brought before the bar of heaven itself. End of The Story of Aaron Burr Recording by Miriam Esther Goldman George the Fourth and Mrs. Fitzherbert, Volume Two of Famous Affinities of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr, Volume Two, George the Fourth and Mrs. Fitzherbert. In the last decade of the eighteenth century, England was, perhaps, the most brilliant nation of the world. Other countries had been humbled by the splendid armies of France, and were destined to be still further humbled by the emperor who came from Corsica. France had begun to seize the sceptre of power, yet to this picture there was another side, fearful want and grievous poverty, and the horrors of the revolution. Russia was too far away, and was still considered too barbarous for a brilliant court to flourish there. Prussia had the prestige that Frederick the Great won for her, but she was still a comparatively small state. Italy was in a condition of political chaos. The banks of the Rhine were running blood where the Austrian armies faced the gallant Frenchmen under the leadership of Moreau but England, in spite of the loss of her American colonies, was rich and prosperous, and her invincible fleets were extending her empire over the seven seas. At no time in modern England has the court at London seen so much real splendour or such fine manners. The royalist émigré who fled from France brought with them names and pedigrees that were older than the Crusades, and many of them were received with the frankest, freest English hospitality. If here and there some marquis or baron of ancient blood was perforce content to teach music to the daughters of tradesmen in suburban schools, nevertheless they were better off than they had been in France, harried by the savage gaze-hounds of the guillotine. Afterward, in the days of the Restoration, when they came back to their estates, they had probably learned more than one lesson from the bulldogs of merry England, who had little tact, perhaps, but who were at any rate kindly and willing to share their goods with pinched and poverty-stricken foreigners. The court, then, as has been said, was brilliant with notables from continental countries, and with the historic wealth of the peerage of England. Only one cloud overspread it and that was the mental condition of the king. We have been accustomed to think of George the Third as a dull creature, almost always hovering on the verge of that insanity which finally swept him into a dark obscurity. But Thackeray's picture of him is absurdly untrue to the actual facts. George the Third was by no means a dullard, nor was he a sort of beefy country squire, who roved about the palace gardens with his unattractive spouse. Obstinate enough he was, and ready for a combat with the rulers of the continent, or with his self-willed sons, but he was a man of brains and power, and Lord Rosebery has rightly described him as the most striking constitutional figure of his time. Had he retained his reason, and had his erratic and self-seeking son not succeeded him during his own lifetime, Great Britain might very possibly have entered upon other ways than those which opened to her after the downfall of Napoleon. The real centre of fashionable England, however, was not George the Third, but rather his son, subsequently George the Fourth, who was made Prince of Wales three days after his birth, and who became Prince Regent during the insanity of the King. He was the leader of the social world, 
the fit companion of Beau Brummel under the choice circle of rakes and fox-hunters who drank pottle-deep. Some called him the first gentleman of Europe. Others, who knew him better, described him as one who never kept his word to man or woman, and who lacked the most elementary virtues. Yet it was his good luck during the first years of his regency to be popular as few English kings have ever been. To his people he typified old England against revolutionary France, and his youth and gaiety made many like him. He drank and gambled, he kept packs of hounds and strings of horses, he ran deeply into debt that he might patronise the sports of that uproarious day. He was a gallant Corinthian, a haunter of dens where there were prize-fights and cock-fights, and there was hardly a doubtful resort in London where his face was not familiar. He was much given to gallantry, not so much as it seemed for wantonness, but from sheer love of mirth and chivalry. For a time, with his chosen friends, such as Fox and Sheridan, he ventured into reckless intrigues that recalled the amour of his predecessor, Charles the Second. He had by no means the wit and courage of Charles, and, indeed, the House of Hanover lacked the outward show of chivalry which made the Stuarts shine with external splendour. But he was good-looking and stalwart, and when he had half a dozen robust comrades by his side, he could assume a very manly appearance. Such was George the Fourth in his regency and in his prime. He made that period famous for its card-playing, its deep drinking, and for the dissolute conduct of its courtiers and noblemen, no less than for the gallantry of its soldiers and its momentous victories on sea and land. It came, however, to be seen that his true achievements were in reality only escapades, that his wit was only folly, and his so-called sensibility was but sham. He invented buckles, striped waistcoats, and flamboyant collars, but he knew nothing of the principles of kingship, or the laws by which a state is governed. The fact that he had promiscuous affairs with women appealed at first to the popular sense of the romantic. It was not long, however, before these episodes were trampled down into the mire of vulgar scandal. One of the first of them began when he sent a letter, signed Florizel, to a young actress, Perdita Robinson. Mrs. Robinson, whose maiden name was Mary Darby, and who was the original of famous portraits by Gainsborough and Reynolds, was a woman of beauty, talent, and temperament. George, wishing in every way to be romantic, insisted upon clandestine meetings on the Thames at Kew, with all the stage trappings of the popular novels, cloaks, veils, faces hidden, and armed watchers to warn her of approaching danger. Poor Perdita took this nonsense so seriously that she gave up her natural vocation for the stage, and forsook her husband, believing that the prince would never weary of her. He did weary of her very soon, and, with the brutality of a man of such a type, turned her away with the promise of some money, after which he cut her in the park and refused to speak to her again. As for the money, he may have meant to pay it, but Perdita had a long struggle before she succeeded in getting it. It may be assumed that the prince had to borrow it, and that this obligation formed part of the debts which Parliament paid for him. It is not necessary to number the other women whose heads he turned. They are too many for remembrance here, and they have no special significance, save one, who, as is generally believed, became his wife, so far as the church could make her so. An act of 1772 had made it illegal for any member of the English royal family to marry without the permission of the king. A marriage contracted without the king's consent might be lawful in the eyes of the church, but the children born of it could not inherit any claim to the throne. It may be remarked here that this withholding of permission was strictly enforced. Thus William the Fourth, who succeeded George the Fourth, was married before his accession to the throne 
to Mrs. Jordan, Dorothy Bland. Afterward he lawfully married a woman of royal birth, who was known as Queen Adelaide. There is an interesting story which tells how Queen Victoria came to be born, because her father, the Duke of Kent, was practically forced to give up a morganatic union, which he greatly preferred, to a marriage arranged for him by Parliament. Except the Duke of Cambridge, the Duke of Kent was the only royal duke who was likely to have children in the regular line. The only daughter of George the Fourth had died in childhood. The Duke of Cumberland was, for various reasons, ineligible. The Duke of Clarence, later King William the Fourth, was almost too old, and therefore to ensure the succession, the Duke of Kent was begged to marry a young and attractive woman, a princess of the house of Saxe-Coburg, who was ready for the honour. It was greatly to the Duke's credit that he showed deep and sincere feeling in this matter. As he said himself, in effect, "'This French lady has stood by me in hard times and in good times, too. Why should I cast her off? She has been more than a wife to me. And what do I care for your plans in Parliament? Send over for one of the Stuarts. They are better men than the last lot of our fellows that you have had.' In the end, however, he was wearied out, and was persuaded to marry. But he insisted that a generous sum should be settled on the lady who had been so long his true companion, and to whom, no doubt, he gave many a wistful thought, in his new but unfamiliar quarters in Kensington Palace, which was assigned as his residence. Again, the second Duke of Cambridge, who died only a few years ago, greatly desired to marry a lady who was not of royal rank, though of fine breeding and of good birth. He besought his young cousin, as head of the family, to grant him this privilege of marriage, but Queen Victoria stubbornly refused. The Duke was married according to the rites of the Church, but he could not make his wife a Duchess. The Queen never quite forgave him for his partial defiance of her wishes, though the Duke's wife, she was usually spoken of as Mrs. Fitzgeorge, was received almost everywhere, and two of her sons hold high rank in the British Army and Navy, respectively. The one real love story in the life of George the Fourth is that which tells of his marriage with a lady who might well have been the wife of any king. This was Maria Anne Smythe, better known as Mrs. Fitzherbert who was six years older than the young prince, when she first met him in company with a body of gentlemen and ladies, in 1784. Maria Fitzherbert's face was one which always displayed its best advantages. Her eyes were peculiarly languishing, and as she had already been twice a widow, and was six years his senior, she had the advantage over a less experienced lover. Likewise she was a Catholic and so, by another act of Parliament, any marriage with her would be illegal. Yet just because of all these different objections, the Prince was doubly drawn to her, and was willing to sacrifice even the throne if he could but win her. His father, the King, called him into the royal presence, and said, "'George, it is time that you should settle down and ensure the succession to the throne.' "'Sir,' replied the Prince, I prefer to resign the succession and let my brother have it, and that I should live as a private English gentleman. Mrs. Fitzherbert was not the sort of woman to give herself up readily to a morganatic connection. Moreover, she soon came to love Prince George too well to entangle him in a doubtful alliance with one of another faith than his. Not long after he first met her, the prince, who was always given to private theatricals, sent messengers riding in hot haste to her house, to tell her that he had stabbed himself, that he begged to see her, and that unless she came, he would repeat the act. The lady yielded, and hurried to Carlton House, the prince's residence. But she was prudent enough to take with her the Duchess of Devonshire, who was a reigning beauty of the court. The scene which followed was theatrical rather than impressive. The prince was found in his sleeping-chamber, pale and with his ruffles blood-stained. 
he played the part of a youthful and love-stricken wooer, vowing that he would marry the woman of his heart or stab himself again. In the presence of his messengers, who with the Duchess were witnesses, he formally took the lady as his wife, while Lady Devonshire's wedding ring sealed the troth. The prince also acknowledged it in a document. Mrs. Fitzherbert was, in fact, a woman of sound sense. Shortly after this scene of melodramatic intensity, her wits came back to her, and she recognised that she had merely gone through a meaningless farce. So she sent back the prince's document and the ring, and hastened to the continent where he could not reach her, although his detectives followed her steps for a year. At the last she yielded, however, and came home to marry the prince in such fashion as she could, a marriage of love, and surely one of morality, though not of parliamentary law. The ceremony was performed, quote, in her own drawing-room in her house in London, in the presence of the officiating Protestant clergyman and two of her own nearest relatives. End quote. Such is the serious statement of Lord Stourton, who was Mrs. Fitzherbert's cousin and confidant. The truth of it was never denied, and Mrs. Fitzherbert was always treated with respect, and even regarded as a person of great distinction. Nevertheless, on more than one occasion, the Prince had his friends in Parliament deny the marriage, in order that his debts might be paid, and new allowances issued to him by the Treasury. George certainly felt himself a husband. Like any other married prince, he set himself to build a palace for his country home. While in search of some suitable spot, he chanced to visit the pretty fishing village of Brighton, to see his uncle, the Duke of Cumberland. Doubtless he found it an attractive place, yet this may have been not so much because of its view of the sea as for the reason that Mrs. Fitzherbert had previously lived there. However, in 1784, the prince sent down his chief cook to make arrangements for the next royal visit. The cook engaged a house on the spot where the pavilion now stands, and from that time Brighton began to be an extremely fashionable place. The court doctors, giving advice that was agreeable, recommended their royal patient to take sea-bathing at Brighton. At once the place sprang into popularity. At first the gentry were crowded into lodging-houses, and the accommodations were primitive to a degree. But soon handsome villas arose on every side, hotels appeared, places of amusement were opened. The prince himself began to build a tasteless but showy structure, partly Chinese and partly Indian in style, on the fashionable promenade of the steam. During his life with Mrs. Fitzherbert at Brighton, the prince held what was practically a court. Hundreds of the aristocracy came down from London and made their temporary dwellings there, while thousands, who were by no means of the court, made the place what is now popularly called London by the Sea. There were the Duc de Chartres of France, statesmen and rakes like Fox, Sheridan, and the Earl of Barrymore, a very beautiful woman named Mrs. Couch, a favourite singer at the opera, to whom the prince gave at one time jewels worth ten thousand pounds, and a sister of the Earl of Barrymore who was as notorious as her brother. She often took the President's chair at a club which George's friends had organised, and which she had christened the Hellfire Club. Such persons were not the only visitors at Brighton. Men of much more serious demeanour came down to visit the prince, and brought with them quieter society. Nevertheless, for a considerable time, the place was most noted for its wild scenes of revelry, into which George frequently entered, though his home life with Mrs. Fitzherbert at the pavilion was a decorous one. No one felt any doubt as to the marriage of the two persons who seemed so much like a prince and a princess. Some of the people of the place addressed Mrs. Fitzherbert as Mrs. Prince. The old king and his wife, however, much deplored their son's relation with her. 
this was partly due to the fact that Mrs. Fitzherbert was a Catholic, and that she had received a number of French nuns who had been driven out of France at the time of the Revolution. But no less displeasure was caused by the prince's racing and dicing, which swelled his debts to almost a million pounds, so that Parliament and, indeed, the sober part of England were set against him. Of course, his marriage to Mrs. Fitzherbert had no legal status, nor is there any reason for believing that she ever became a mother. She had no children by her former two husbands, and Lord Stoughton testified positively that she never had either son or daughter by Prince George. Nevertheless, more than one American claimant has risen to advance some utterly visionary claim to the English throne by reason of alleged descent from Prince George and Mrs. Fitzherbert. Neither William the Fourth nor Queen Victoria ever spent much time at Brighton. In King William's case it was explained that the dampness of the pavilion did not suit him, and as to Queen Victoria, it was said that she disliked the fact that buildings had been erected so as to cut off the view of the sea. It is quite likely, however, that the Queen objected to the associations of the place, and did not care to be reminded of the time when her uncle had lived there so long in a morganatic state of marriage. At length the time came when the King, Parliament, and the people at large insisted that the Prince of Wales should make a legal marriage, and a wife was selected for him in the person of Caroline, daughter of the Duke of Brunswick. This marriage took place exactly ten years after his wedding with the beautiful and gentle-mannered Mrs. Fitzherbert. With the latter he had known many days and hours of happiness. With Princess Caroline he had no happiness at all. Prince George met her at the pier to greet her. It is said that as he took her hand he kissed her, and then, suddenly recoiling, he whispered to one of his friends, "'For God's sake, George, give me a glass of brandy!' Such an utterance was more brutal and barbaric than anything his bride could have conceived of, though it is probable, fortunately, that she did not understand him by reason of her ignorance of English. We need not go through the unhappy story of this unsympathetic, neglected, rebellious wife. Her life with the prince soon became one of open warfare, but instead of leaving England she remained to set the kingdom in an uproar. As soon as his father died and he became king, George sued her for divorce. Half the people sided with the queen, while the rest regarded her as a vulgar creature who made love to her attendants and brought dishonour on the English throne. It was a sorry, sordid contrast between the young Prince George, who had posed as a sort of cavalier, and this now furious grey old man, wrangling with his furious German wife. Well might he look back to the time when he met Perdita in the moonlight on the Thames, or when he played the part of Florizel, or, better still, when he enjoyed the sincere and disinterested love of the gentlewoman who was his wife in all but legal status. Caroline of Brunswick was thrust away from the king's coronation. She took a house within sight of Westminster Abbey, so that she might make hag-like screeches to the mob and to the king as he passed by. Presently, in August 1821, only a month after the coronation, she died, and her body was taken back to Brunswick for burial. George himself reigned for nine years longer. When he died in 1830, his executor was the Duke of Wellington. The Duke, in examining the late King's private papers, found that he had kept, with the greatest care, every letter written to him by his morganatic wife. During his last illness she had sent him an affectionate missive which it is said George read eagerly. Mrs. Fitzherbert wished the Duke to give up her letters but he would do so only in return for those which he had written to her. It was finally decided that it would be best to burn both his and hers. This work was carried out in Mrs. Fitzherbert's own house by the Lady, the Duke, and the Earl of Albemarle. 
of george it may be said that he has left as memories behind him only three things that will be remembered the first is the pavilion at brighton with its absurdly oriental decorations its minarets and flimsy towers the second is the buckle which he invented and which thackeray has immortalized with his biting satire the last is the story of his marriage to maria fitzherbert and of the influence exercised upon him by the affection of a good woman end of george the fourth and mrs fitzherbert charlotte corday and adam lux volume two of famous affinities of history this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr Volume 2 Charlotte Corday and Adam Lux Perhaps some readers will consider this story inconsistent with those that have preceded it. Yet, as it is little known to most readers, and as it is perhaps unique in the history of romantic love, I cannot forbear relating it for I believe that it is full of curious interest and pathetic power. All those who have written of the French Revolution have paused in their chronicle of blood and flame to tell the episode of the peasant royalist Charlotte Corday, but in telling it they have often omitted the one part of the story that is personal and not political. The tragic record of this French girl and her self-sacrifice has been told a thousand times by writers in many languages, yet almost all of them have neglected the brief romance which followed her daring deed and which was consummated after her death upon the guillotine it is worth our while to speak first of charlotte herself and of the man she slew and then to tell that other tale which ought always to be entwined with her great deed of daring charlotte corday marianne charlotte corday d'armont was a native of normandy and was descended as her name implies from noble ancestors her forefathers, indeed, had been statesmen, civil rulers, and soldiers, and among them was numbered the famous poet Corneille, whom the French rank with Shakespeare. But a century or more of vicissitudes had reduced her branch of the family almost to the position of peasants, a fact which partly justifies the name that some give her when they call her the Jeanne d'Arc of the Revolution. She did not, however, spend her girlish years amid the fields and woods tending her sheep, as did the other Jeanne d'Arc, but she was placed in charge of the sisters in a convent, and from them she received such education as she had. She was a lonely child, and her thoughts turned inward, brooding over many things. After she had left the convent she was sent to live with an aunt. Here she devoted herself to reading over and over the few books which the house contained. These consisted largely of the deistic writers, especially Voltaire, and to some extent they destroyed her convent faith, though it is not likely that she understood them very fully. More to her taste was a copy of Plutarch's Lives. These famous stories fascinated her. They told her of battle and siege, of intrigue and heroism, and of that romantic love of country which led men to throw away their lives for the sake of a whole people. Brutus and Regulus were her heroes, to die for the many seemed to her the most glorious end that any one could seek. When she thought of it, she thrilled with a sort of ecstasy, and longed with all the passion of her nature that such a glorious fate might be her own. Charlotte had nearly come to womanhood at the time when the French Revolution first broke out. Royalist though she had been in her sympathies, she felt the justice of the people's cause. She had seen the suffering of the peasantry, the brutality of the tax-gatherers, and all the oppression of the old regime. But what she hoped for was a democracy of order and equality and peace. Could the king reign as a constitutional monarch rather than as a despot, this was all for which she cared. In Normandy, where she lived, were many of those moderate republicans known as Girondists, who felt as she did, and who hoped for the same peaceful end to the great outbreak. On the other hand, in Paris, the party of the mountain, as it was called, ruled with a savage violence that soon was to culminate in the reign of terror. Already the guillotine ran red with noble blood. 
Already the king had bowed his head to the fatal knife. Already the threat had gone forth that a mere breath of suspicion or a pointed finger might be enough to lead men and women to a gory death. In her quiet home near Caen, Charlotte Corday heard as from afar the story of this dreadful Saturnalia of assassination which was making Paris a city of bloody mist. Men and women of the Girondist party came to tell her of the hideous deeds that were perpetrated there. All these horrors gradually wove themselves in the young girl's imagination around the sinister and repulsive figure of Jean-Paul Marat. She knew nothing of his associates, Danton and Robespierre. It was in Marat alone that she saw the monster who sent innocent thousands to their graves, and who reveled like some arch-fiend in murder and gruesome death. In his earlier years Marat had been a very different figure, an accomplished physician, the friend of nobles, a man of science and original thought, so that he was nearly elected to the Academy of Sciences. His studies in electricity gained for him the admiration of Benjamin Franklin and the praise of Goethe. But when he turned to politics he left all this career behind him. He plunged into the very mire of red republicanism, and even there he was for a time so much hated that he sought refuge in London to save his life. On his return he was hunted by his enemies, so that his only place of refuge was in the sewers and drains of Paris. A woman, one Simone Evrard, helped him to escape his pursuers. In the sewers, however, he contracted a dreadful skin disease from which he never afterward recovered, and which was extremely painful as well as shocking to behold. It is small wonder that the stories about Marat circulated through the provinces made him seem more a devil than a man. His vindictiveness against the Girondists brought all of this straight home to Charlotte Corday, and led her to dream of acting the part of Brutus, so that she might free her country from this hideous tyrant. In January 1793, King Louis the Sixteenth met his death upon the scaffold, and the Queen was thrust into a foul prison. This was a signal for activity among the Girondists in Normandy, and especially at Caen, where Charlotte was present at their meetings and heard their fervid oratory. There was a plot to march on Paris, yet in some instinctive way she felt that such a scheme must fail. It was then that she definitely formed the plan of going herself, alone, to the French capital to seek out the hideous Marat and to kill him with her own hands. To this end she made application for a passport allowing her to visit Paris. The passport still exists, and it gives us an official description of the girl. It reads, Allow citizen Marie Cordet to pass. She is twenty-four years of age, five feet and one inch in height, hair and eyebrows chestnut colour, eyes grey, forehead high, mouth medium size, chin dimpled, and an oval face. Apart from this verbal description, we have two portraits painted while she was in prison. Both of them make the description of the passport seem faint and pale. The real Charlotte had a wealth of chestnut hair which fell about her face and neck in glorious abundance. Her great grey eyes spoke eloquently of truth and courage. Her mouth was firm yet winsome, and her form combined both strength and grace. Such is the girl who, on reaching Paris, wrote to Marat in these words, "'Citizen, I have just arrived from Caen. Your love for your native place doubtless makes you wish to learn the events which have occurred in that part of the Republic. I shall call at your residence in about an hour. Be so good as to receive me, and give me a brief interview. I will put you in such condition as to render great service to France.' This letter failed to gain her admission, and so did another, which she wrote soon after. The fact is that Marat was grievously ill. His disease had reached a point where the pain could be assuaged only by hot water, and he spent the greater part of his time wrapped in a blanket and lying in a large tub. A third time, however, the persistent girl called at his house and insisted that she must see him, saying that she was herself in danger from the enemies of the Republic. Through an open door, Marat heard her mellow voice, and gave orders that she should be admitted. As she entered, she gazed for a moment upon the lank figure rolling in the tub, the red-like face, and the shifting eyes. Then she approached him, concealing in the bosom of her dress a long carving-knife, 
which she had purchased for two francs. In answer to Marat's questionary look, she told him that there was much excitement at Caen, and that the Girondists were plotting there. To this Marat answered, in his harsh voice, "'All these men you mention shall be guillotined in the next few days.' As he spoke, Charlotte flashed out the terrible knife, and with all her strength she plunged it into his left side, where it pierced a lung and a portion of his heart. Marat, with the blood gushing from his mouth, cried out, "'Help, darling!' His cry was meant for one of the two women in the house. Both heard it, for they were in the next room, and both of them rushed in and succeeded in pinioning Charlotte Corday, who, indeed, made only a slight effort to escape. Troops were summoned, she was taken to the prison de l'Abbé, and soon after she was arraigned before the revolutionary tribunal. Placed in the dock, she glanced about her with an air of pride, as of one who gloried in the act which she had just performed. A written charge was read. She was asked what she had to say. Lifting her head with a look of infinite satisfaction, she answered in a ringing voice, "'Nothing, except that I succeeded.' A lawyer was assigned for her defence. He pleaded for her earnestly, declaring that she must be regarded as insane, but those clear, calm eyes and that gentle face made her sanity a matter of little doubt. She showed her quick wit in the answers which she gave to the rough prosecutor, Fouquet Tinville, who tried to make her confess that she had accomplices. "'Who prompted you to do this deed?' roared Tinville. "'I needed no prompting. My own heart was sufficient.' "'In what, then, had Marat wronged you?' He was a savage beast who was going to destroy the remains of France in the fires of civil war. "'But whom did you expect to benefit?' insinuated the prosecutor. "'I have killed one man to save a hundred thousand. "'What? Did you imagine that you had murdered all the Marats?' "'No, but this one being dead, the rest will perhaps take warning.' Thus her directness baffled all the efforts of the prosecution to trap her into betraying any of her friends. The court, however, sentenced her to death. She was then immured in the conciergerie. This dramatic court scene was the beginning of that strange, brief romance to which one can scarcely find a parallel. At the time there lived in Paris a young German named Adam Lux. The continual talk about Charlotte Corday had filled him with curiosity regarding this young girl, who had been so daring and so patriotic. She was denounced on every hand as a murderess with the face of a Medusa and the muscles of a Vulcan. Street songs about her were dinned into the ears of Adam Lux. As a student of human nature, he was anxious to see this terrible creature. He forced his way to the front of the crowded benches in the courtroom and took a stand behind a young artist who was finishing a beautiful sketch. From that moment until the end of the trial, the eyes of Adam Lux were fastened on the prisoner. What a contrast to the picture he had imagined! A mass of regal chestnut hair crowned with the white cap of a Norman peasant girl, grey eyes, very sad and serious, but looking serenely forth from under long dark lashes, lips slightly curved with an expression of quiet humour, a face the colour of the sun and wind, a bust indicative of perfect health the chin of a Caesar, and the whole expression one of almost divine self-sacrifice. Such were the features that the painter was swiftly putting upon his canvas, but behind them Adam Lux discerned the soul for which he gladly sacrificed both his liberty and his life. He forgot his surroundings, and seemed to see only that beautiful, pure face, and to hear only the exquisite cadences of the wonderful voice. When Charlotte was led forth by a file of soldiers, Adams staggered from the scene, and made his way as best he might to his lodgings. There he lay prostrate, his whole soul filled with the love of her who had in an instant won the adoration of his heart. Once, and only once again, when the last scene opened on the tragedy, did he behold the heroine of his dreams. On the 17th of July, Charlotte Corday was taken from her prison to the gloomy guillotine. It was toward evening, and nature had given a setting fit for such an end. Blue-black thunder-clouds rolled in huge masses across the sky until their base appeared to rest on the very summit of the guillotine. Distant thunder rolled and grumbled beyond the river. Great drops of rain fell upon the soldiers' drums. Young, beautiful, unconscious of any wrong, 
Charlotte Corday stood beneath the shadow of the knife. At the supreme moment a sudden ray from the setting sun broke through the cloud-rack and fell upon her slender figure, until she glowed in the eyes of the startled spectators like a statue cut in burnished bronze. Thus illumined, as it were, by a light from heaven itself, she bowed herself beneath the knife and paid the penalty of a noble, if misdirected, impulse. As the blade fell, her lips quivered with her last and only plea. My duty is enough. The rest is nothing. Adam Lux rushed from the scene a man transformed. He bore, graven upon his heart, neither the mob of tossing red caps, nor the glare of the sunset, nor the blood-stained guillotine, but that last look from those brilliant eyes. The sight almost deprived him of his reason, the self-sacrifice of the only woman he had ever loved, even though she had never so much as seen him, impelled him with a sort of fury to his own destruction. He wrote a bitter denunciation of the judges, of the officers, and of all who had been followers of Marat. This document he printed, and scattered copies of it through every quarter in Paris. The last sentences are as follows. The guillotine is no longer a disgrace. It has become a sacred altar from which every taint has been removed by the innocent blood shed there on the 17th of July. Forgive me, my divine Charlotte, if I find it impossible at the last moment to show the courage and the gentleness that were yours. I glory because you are superior to me, for it is right that she who is adored should be higher and more glorious than her adorer. This pamphlet, spread broadcast among the people, was soon reported to the leaders of the rebel. Adam Lux was arrested for treason against the Republic, but even these men had no desire to make a martyr of this hot-headed youth. They would stop his mouth without taking his life. Therefore he was tried and speedily found guilty, but an offer was made him that he might have passports that would allow him to return to Germany if only he would sign a retraction of his printed words. Little did the judges understand the fiery heart of the man they had to deal with. To die on the same scaffold as the woman whom he had idealized was to him the crowning triumph of his romantic love. He gave a prompt and insolent refusal to their offer. He swore that if released he would denounce his darling's murderers with a still greater passion. In anger the tribunal sentenced him to death. Only then he smiled and thanked his judges courteously, and soon after went blithely to the guillotine like a bridegroom to his marriage feast. Adam Lux. Spirit courtship had been carried on silently all through that terrible cross-examination of Charlotte Corday. His heart was betrothed to hers in that single gleam of the setting sun when she bowed beneath the knife. One may believe that these two souls were finally united when the same knife fell suddenly upon his neck and when his life-blood sprinkled the altar that was still stained with hers. End of Charlotte Corday and Adam Lux Napoleon and Marie Bowewska Volume 2 of Famous Affinities of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr Volume 2 Napoleon and Marie Bawewska There are four women who may be said to have deeply influenced the life of Napoleon. These four are the only ones who need to be taken into account by the student of his imperial career. The great emperor was susceptible to feminine charms at all times, but, just as it used to be said of him, that his smile never rose above his eyes, so it might as truly be said that, in most instances, the throbbing of his heart did not affect his actions. Women to him were the creatures of the moment, although he might seem to care for them, and to show his affection in extravagant ways, as in his affair with Mademoiselle Georges, the beautiful but rather tiresome actress. 
As for Madame de Stael, she bored him to distraction by her assumption of wisdom. That was not the kind of woman that Napoleon cared for. He preferred that a woman should be womanly, and not a sort of owl to sit and talk with him about the theory of government. When it came to married women, they interested him only because of the children they might bear to grow up as recruits for his insatiate armies. At the public balls, given at the Tuileries, he would walk about the gorgeous drawing-rooms, and, when a lady was presented to him, he would snap out sharply, How many children have you? If she were able to answer that she had several, the emperor would look pleased, and would pay her some compliment. But if she said that she had none, he would turn upon her sharply, and say, Then go home and have some. Of the four women who influenced his life, first must come Josephine, because she secured him his earliest chance of advancement. She met him through Barras, with whom she was said to be rather intimate. The young soldier was fascinated by her, the more because she was older than he, and possessed all the practiced arts of the Creole and the woman of the world. When she married him, she brought him as her dowry the command of the army of Italy, where in a few months he made the tricolor, borne by ragged troops, triumphant over the splendidly equipped hosts of Austria. She was his first love, and his knowledge of her perfidy gave him the greatest shock and horror of his whole life. Yet she might have held him to the end, if she had borne an heir to the imperial throne. It was her failure to do so that led Napoleon to divorce Josephine, and marry the thick-lipped Marie Louise of Austria. There were times later when he showed signs of regret, and said, I have had no luck since I gave up Josephine. Marie Louise was of importance for a time, the short time when she entertained her husband, and delighted him by giving birth to the little king of Rome. Yet, in the end, she was but an episode, fleeing from her husband in his misfortune, becoming the mistress of Count Nieperg, and letting her son, Leglon, die in a land that was far from France. Napoleon's sister, Pauline Bonaparte, was the third woman who comes to mind when we contemplate the great Corsican's career. She, too, is an episode. During the period of his ascendancy, she plagued him with her wanton ways, her sauciness, and trickery. It was amusing to throw him into one of his violent rages. But Pauline was true at heart, and when her great brother was sent to Elba, she followed him devotedly, and gave him all her store of jewels, including the famous Borgesi diamonds, perhaps the most superb of all gems known to the Western world. She would gladly have followed him also to St. Helena, had she been permitted. Remaining behind, she did everything possible in conspiring to secure his freedom. But, after all, Pauline and Marie-Louise count for comparatively little. Josephine's fate was interwoven with Napoleon's, and with his Corsican superstition he often said so. The fourth woman, of whom I am writing here, may be said to have almost equaled Josephine in her influence on the emperor, as well as in the pathos of her life story. On New Year's Day of 1807, Napoleon, who was then almost emperor of Europe, passed through the little town of Bronia in Poland, riding with his cavalry to Warsaw, the ancient capital of the Polish kingdom. He seemed a very demagogue of battle. True, 
he had had to abandon his long-cherished design of invading and overrunning England, and Nelson had shattered his fleets and practically driven his flag from the sea. But the naval disaster of Trafalgar had speedily been followed by the triumph of Austerlitz, the greatest and most brilliant of all Napoleon's victories, which left Austria and Russia humbled to the very ground before him. Then Prussia had dared to defy the overbearing conqueror, and had put into the field against him her armies trained by Frederick the Great. But these he had shattered almost at a stroke, winning in one day the decisive battles of Jena and Auerstadt. He had stabled his horses in the royal palace of the Hohenzollerns, and had pursued the remnant of the Prussian forces to the Russian border. As he marched into the Polish provinces, the people swarmed by thousands to meet him, and hail him as their country's saviour. They believed, down to the very last, that Bonaparte would make the Poles once more a free and independent nation, and rescue them from the tyranny of Russia. Napoleon played upon this feeling in every manner known to his artful mind. He used it to alarm the Tsar. He used it to intimidate the Emperor of Austria. But more especially did he use it among the Poles themselves, to win for his armies thousands upon thousands of gallant soldiers, who believed that in fighting for Napoleon they were fighting for the final independence of their native land. Therefore, with the intensity of patriotism, which is a passion among the Poles, every man and every woman gazed at Napoleon with something like adoration. For was not he the mighty warrior who had in his gift what all desired? Soldiers of every rank swarmed to his standards, Princes and nobles flocked about him. Those who stayed at home repeated wonderful stories of his victories, and prayed for him and fed the flame which spread through all the country. It was felt that no sacrifice was too great to win his favor, that to him, as a deity, everything that he desired should be yielded up, since he was to restore the liberty of Poland. And hence, when the carriage of the emperor dashed into Bronya, surrounded by Polish lancers and French cuirassiers, the enormous crowd surged forward and blocked the way so that their hero could not pass because of their cheers and cries and supplications. In the midst of it all, there came a voice of peculiar sweetness from the thickest portion of the crowd. Please, let me pass, said the voice. Let me see him, if only for a moment. The populace rolled backward, and through the lane which they made, a beautiful girl with dark blue eyes that flamed, and streaming hair that had become loosened about her radiant face, was confronting the emperor. Carried away by her enthusiasm, she cried, Thrice welcome to Poland. We can do or say nothing to express our joy in the country, which you will surely deliver from its tyrant. The emperor bowed, and, with a smile, handed a great bouquet of roses to the girl, for her beauty and her enthusiasm had made a deep impression on him. Take it, said he, as a proof of my admiration. I trust that I may have the pleasure of meeting you at Warsaw, and of hearing your thanks from those beautiful lips. In a moment more the trumpets rang out shrilly, the horsemen closed up beside the imperial carriage, and it rolled away amid the tumultuous shouting of the populace. The girl who had so attracted Napoleon's attention was Marie Bowieska, descended from an ancient, though impoverished, family in Poland. When she was only fifteen, she was courted by one of the wealthiest men in Poland, 
the Count Wawewska. He was three or four times her age, yet her dark blue eyes, her massive golden hair, and the exquisite grace of her figure, led him to plead that she might become his wife. She had accepted him, but the marriage was that of a mere child, and her interest still centred upon her country, and took the form of patriotism, rather than that of wifehood and maternity. It was for this reason that the young countess had visited Bronya. She was now eighteen years of age, and still had the sort of romantic feeling which led her to think that she would keep in some secret hiding-place the bouquet which the greatest man alive had given her. But Napoleon was not the sort of man to forget anything that had given him either pleasure or the reverse. He who, at the height of his cares, could recall instantly how many cannon were in each seaport of France, and could make out an accurate list of all his military stores, he who would call by name every soldier in his guard, with the full remembrance of the battles each man had fought in, and the honours that he had won. He was not likely to forget so lovely a face as the one which had gleamed with peculiar radiance through the crowd at Bronya. On reaching Warsaw, he asked one or two well-informed persons about this beautiful stranger. Only a few hours had passed before Prince Poniatowski, accompanied by other nobles, called upon her at her home. "'I am directed, madam,' said he, "'by order of the Emperor of France, "'to bid you to be present at a ball "'that is to be given in his honour to-morrow evening.' Madame Bowewska was startled, and her face grew hot with blushes. Did the emperor remember her escapade at Bronya? If so, how had he discovered her? Why should he seek her out, and do her such an honour? That, madame, is his imperial majesty's affair, Poniatowski told her. I merely obey his instructions, and ask your presence at the ball. Perhaps heaven has marked you out to be the means of saving our unhappy country. In this way, by playing on her patriotism, Poniatowski almost persuaded her, and yet something held her back. She trembled, though she was greatly fascinated, and finally she refused to go. Scarcely had the envoy left her, however, when a great company of nobles entered in groups and begged her to humour the emperor. Finally, her own husband joined in their entreaties, and actually commanded her to go. So at last she was compelled to yield. It was by no means the frank and radiant girl who was now preparing again to meet the emperor. She knew not why, and yet her heart was full of trepidation and nervous fright, the cause of which she could not guess, yet which made her task a severe ordeal. She dressed herself in white satin, with no adornment save a wreath of foliage in her hair. As she entered the ballroom, she was welcomed by hundreds whom she had never seen before, but who were of the highest nobility of Poland. Murmurs of admiration followed her, and finally Poniatowski came to her and complimented her, besides bringing her a message that the emperor desired her to dance with him. I am very sorry, she said with a quiver of the lips, but I really cannot dance. Be kind enough to ask the emperor to excuse me. But at that very moment she felt some strange magnetic influence, and, without looking up, she could feel that Napoleon himself was standing by her as she sat with blanched face and downcast eyes, not daring to look up at him. White upon white, 
is a mistake, madam, said the emperor, in his gentlest tones. Then, stooping low, he whispered, I had expected a far different reception. She neither smiled nor met his eyes. He stood there for a moment, and then passed on, leaving her to return to her home with a heavy heart. The young countess felt that she had acted wrongly, and yet there was an instinct, an instinct that she could not conquer. In the grey of the morning, while she was still tossing feverishly, her maid knocked at the door and brought her a hastily scribbled note. It ran as follows. I saw none but you. I admired none but you. I desire only you. Answer at once, and calm the impatient ardor of N. These passionate words burned from her eyes the veil that had hidden the truth from her. What before had been mere blind instinct became an actual verity. Why had she at first rushed forth into the very streets to hail the possible deliverer of her country, and then why had she shrunk from him when he sought to honour her? It was all clear enough now. This bedside missive meant that he had intended her dishonour, and that he had looked upon her simply as a possible mistress. At once she crushed the note angrily in her hand. There is no answer at all, said she, bursting into bitter tears at the very thought that he should dare to treat her in this way. But on the following morning, when she awoke, her maid was standing beside her with a second letter from Napoleon. She refused to open it, and placed it in a packet with the first letter, and ordered that both of them should be returned to the emperor. She shrank from speaking to her husband of what had happened, and there was no one else in whom she dared confide. All through that day there came hundreds of visitors, either of princely rank or men who had won fame by their gallantry and courage. They all begged to see her, but to them all she sent one answer, that she was ill and could see no one. After a time, her husband burst into her room and insisted that she should see them. Why, exclaimed he, you are insulting the greatest men and the noblest women of Poland. More than that, there are some of the most distinguished Frenchmen sitting at your doorstep, as it were. There is de Roc, Grand Marshal of France, and in refusing to see him, you are insulting the great emperor on whom depends everything that our country longs for. Napoleon has invited you to a state dinner, and you have given him no answer whatever. I order you to rise at once and receive these ladies and gentlemen who have done you so much honor. She could not refuse. Presently she appeared in her drawing-room, where she was at once surrounded by an immense throng of her own countrymen and countrywomen, who made no pretense of misunderstanding the situation. To them, what was one woman's honour when compared with the freedom and independence of their nation? She was overwhelmed by arguments and entreaties. She was even accused of being disloyal to the cause of Poland, if she refused her consent. One of the strangest documents of that period was a letter sent to her and signed by the noblest men in Poland. It contained a powerful appeal to her patriotism. One remarkable passage even quotes the Bible to point out her line of duty. A portion of this letter ran as follows. Did Esther, think you, give herself to Ahasuerus out of the fullness of her love for him? So great was the terror with which he inspired her, 
that she fainted at the sight of him. We may therefore conclude that affection had but little to do with her resolve. She sacrificed her own inclinations to the salvation of her country, and that salvation it was her glory to achieve. May we be enabled to say the same of you, to your glory and our own happiness. After this letter came others from Napoleon himself, full of the most humble pleading. It was not wholly distasteful thus to have the conqueror of the world seek her out, and offer her his adoration, any more than it was distasteful to think that the revival of her own nation depended on her single will. M. Frederic Masson, whose minute studies regarding everything relating to Napoleon have won him a seat in the French Academy, writes of Marie Bawewska at this time. Every force was now brought into play against her. Her country, her friends, her religion, the Old and the New Testaments, all urged her to yield. They all combined for the ruin of a simple and inexperienced girl of eighteen, who had no parents, whose husband, even, thrust her into temptation, and whose friends thought that her downfall would be her glory. Amid all these powerful influences, she consented to attend the dinner. To her gratification, Napoleon treated her with distant courtesy, and, in fact, with a certain coldness. I heard that Madame Bowewska was indisposed. I trust that she has recovered, was all the greeting that he gave her when they met. Everyone else with whom she spoke overwhelmed her with flattery and with continued urging, but the emperor himself for a time acted as if she had displeased him. This was consummate art, for as soon as she was relieved of her fears, she began to regret that she had thrown her power away. During the dinner she let her eyes wander to those of the emperor, almost in supplication. He, the subtlest of men, knew that he had won. His marvellous eyes met hers, and drew her attention to him as by an electric current. And when the ladies left the great dining-room, Napoleon sought her out, and whispered in her ear a few words of ardent love. It was too little to alarm her seriously now. It was enough to make her feel that magnetism which Napoleon knew so well how to evoke and exercise. Again, everyone crowded about her with congratulations. Some said, He never even saw any of us. His eyes were all for you. They flashed fire as he looked at you. You have conquered his heart, others said, and you can do what you like with him. The salvation of Poland is in your hands. The company broke up at an early hour, but Madame Bawewska was asked to remain. When she was alone, General Duroc, one of the Emperor's favorite officers and most trusted lieutenants, entered and placed a letter from Napoleon in her lap. He tried to tell her, as tactfully as possible, how much harm she was doing by refusing the imperial request. She was deeply affected, and presently, when Duroc left her, she opened the letter which he had given her, and read it. It was worded thus. There are times when all splendors become oppressive, as I feel but too deeply at the present moment. How can I satisfy the desires of a heart that yearns to cast itself at your feet, when its impulses are checked at every point by considerations of the highest moment? Oh, if you would, you alone might overcome the obstacles that keep us apart. My friend Duroc will make all easy for you. Oh, come, come, 
your every wish shall be gratified. Your country will be dearer to me when you take pity on my poor heart. N. Every chance of escape seemed to be closed. She had Napoleon's own word that he would free Poland in return for her self-sacrifice. Moreover, her powers of resistance had been so weakened that, like many women, she temporized. She decided that she would meet the emperor alone. She would tell him that she did not love him, and yet would plead with him to save her beloved country. As she sat there, every tick of the clock stirred her to a new excitement. At last there came a knock upon the door. A cloak was thrown about her from behind, a heavy veil was drooped about her golden hair, and she was led, by whom she knew not, to the street, where a finely appointed carriage was waiting for her. No sooner had she entered it than she was driven rapidly through the darkness to the beautifully carved entrance of a palace. Half led, half carried, she was taken up the steps to a door which was eagerly opened by someone within. There were warmth and light and color and the scent of flowers as she was placed in a comfortable armchair. Her wrappings were taken from her. The door was closed behind her, and then, as she looked up, she found herself in the presence of Napoleon, who was kneeling at her feet and uttering soothing words. Wisely, the emperor used no violence. He merely argued with her. He told her over and over his love for her, and finally he declared that for her sake he would make Poland once again a strong and splendid kingdom. Several hours passed. In the early morning, before daylight, there came a knock at the door. Already, said Napoleon, well, my plaintive dove, go home and rest. You must not fear the eagle. In time, you will come to love him, and in all things you shall command him. Then he led her to the door, but said that he would not open it unless she promised to see him the next day, a promise which she gave the more readily because he had treated her with such respect. On the following morning her faithful maid came to her bedside with a cluster of beautiful violets, a letter, and several daintily made Morocco cases. When these were opened, there leaped out strings and necklaces of exquisite diamonds, blazing in the morning sunlight. Madame Bowewska seized the jewels and flung them across the room with an order that they should be taken back at once to the imperial giver. But the letter, which was in the same romantic strain as the others, she retained. On that same evening, there was another dinner given to the emperor by the nobles, and Marie Wawesca attended it, but of course without the diamonds, which she had returned, nor did she wear the flowers which had accompanied the diamonds. When Napoleon met her, he frowned upon her, and made her tremble with the cold glances that shot from his eyes of steel. He scarcely spoke to her throughout the meal but those who sat beside her were earnest in their pleading. Again, she waited until the guests had gone away, and with a lighter heart, since she felt that she had nothing to fear. But when she met Napoleon in his private cabinet, alone, his mood was very different from that which he had shown before. Instead of gentleness and consideration, he was the Napoleon of camps, and not of courts. He greeted her brusquely. I scarcely expected to see you again, said he. Why did you refuse my diamonds and my flowers? Why did you avoid my eyes at dinner? Your coldness is an insult which I shall not brook. Then 
he raised his voice to that rasping, almost blood-curtling tone, which even his hardiest soldiers dreaded. I will have you know that I mean to conquer you. You shall, yes, I repeat it, you shall love me. I have restored the name of your country. It owes its very existence to me. Then he resorted to a trick which he had played years before in dealing with the Austrians at Campo Formio. See this watch which I am holding in my hand. Just as I dash it to fragments before you, so will I shatter Poland if you drive me to desperation by rejecting my heart and refusing me your own. As he spoke, he hurled the watch against the opposite wall, with terrific force, dashing it to pieces. In terror, Madame Voeska fainted. When she resumed consciousness, there was Napoleon, wiping away her tears with the tenderness of a woman, and with words of self-reproach. The long siege was over. Napoleon had conquered and this girl of eighteen gave herself up to his caresses and endearments, thinking that, after all, her love of country was more than her own honour. Her husband, as a matter of form, put her away from him, though, at heart, he approved what she had done, while the Polish people regarded her as nothing less than a national heroine, to them she was no minister to the vices of an emperor, but rather one who would make him love Poland for her sake, and restore its greatness. So far as concerned his love for her, it was indeed almost idolatry. He honoured her in every way, and spent all the time at his disposal in her company. But his promise to restore Poland he never kept, and gradually she found that he had never meant to keep it. I love your country, he would say, and I am willing to aid in the attempt to uphold its rights. But my first duty is to France. I cannot shed French blood in a foreign cause. By this time, however, Marie Waweska had learned to love Napoleon for his own sake. She could not resist his ardour, which matched the ardour of the Poles themselves. Moreover, it flattered her to see the greatest soldier in the world, a suppliant for her smiles. For some years she was Napoleon's close companion, spending long hours with him, and finally accompanying him to Paris. She was the mother of Napoleon's only son, who lived to manhood. This son, who bore the name of Alexandra Florian de Boeski, was born in Poland in 1810, and later was created a count and duke of the Second French Empire. It may be said, parenthetically, that he was a man of great ability. Living down to 1868, he was made much of by Napoleon the Third, who placed him in high offices of state, which he filled with distinction. In contrast with the Duc de Morny, who was Napoleon's illegitimate half-brother, Alexandre de Vowewski stood out in brilliant contrast. He would have nothing to do with stock-jobbing and unseemly speculation. I may be poor, he said, though he was not poor, but at least I remember the glory of my father and what is due to his great name. As for Madame Boeska, she was loyal to the emperor and lacked the greed of many women whom he had made his favorites. Even at Elba, when he was in exile and disgrace, she visited him that she might endeavor to console him she was his counsellor and friend, as well as his earnestly loved mate. 
When she died in Paris in 1817, while the dethroned emperor was a prisoner at St. Helena, the word Napoleon was the last upon her lips. End of Napoleon and Marie Bowewska The Story of Pauline Bonaparte, Volume 2 of Famous Affinities of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr, Volume 2 The Story of Pauline Bonaparte. It was said of Napoleon long ago that he could govern emperors and kings, but that not even he could rule his relatives. He himself once declared, my family have done me far more harm than I have been able to do them good. It would be an interesting historical study to determine just how far the great soldier's family aided in his downfall by their selfishness, their jealousy, their meanness, and their ingratitude. There is something piquant in thinking of Napoleon as a domestic sort of person. Indeed, it is rather difficult to do so. When we speak his name, we think of the stern warrior hurling his army up bloody slopes and on to bloody victory. He is the man whose steely eyes made his haughtiest marshals tremble, or else the wise far-seeing statesman and lawgiver. But decidedly, he is not the household model. We read of his sharp speech of women, of his outrageous manners at the dinner-table, and of the thousand or more details which Madame de Remusson has chronicled, and perhaps in part invented, for there has always existed the suspicion that her eminence was that of a woman who had herself sought the imperial favor and had failed to win it. But in fact all these stories relate to the Napoleon of courts and places, and not to the Napoleon of home. In his private life this great man was not merely affectionate and indulgent, but he even showed a certain weakness where his relatives were concerned, so he let them prey upon him almost without end. He had a great deal of the Italian largeness and lavishness of character with his family. When a petty officer, he nearly starved himself in order to give his younger brother Louis a military education. He was devotedly fond of children, and they were fond of him, as many anecdotes attest. His passionate love for Josephine before he learned of her infidelity is almost painful to read. And even afterward, when he had been disillusioned, and when she was paying Foch a thousand francs a day to spy upon Napoleon's every action, he still treated her with friendliness and allowed her extravagance to embarrass him. He made his eldest brother Joseph king of Spain, and Spain proved almost as deadly to him did russia he made his youngest brother jerome king of westphalia and jerome turned the place into a big sty and brought discredit on the very name of bonaparte his brother louis for whom he had starved himself he placed upon the throne of holland and louis promptly devoted himself to his own interests convining at many things that were inimical to france he was planning high advancement for his brother lucien and lucien suddenly married a disreputable actress and fled with her to england where he was received with pleasure by the most persistent of all Napoleon's enemies. So much for his brothers, incompetent, ungrateful, or openly his foes. But his three sisters were no less remarkable in the relations which they bore to him. They had been styled the three crowned courtesans, and they have been contempt together as being utterly void of principle and monsters of ingratitude. Much of this censor was well deserved by all of them, by Caroline, by Elise, and Pauline, but when we look at the facts impartially, we shall find something which makes Pauline stand out alone as infinitely superior to her sisters. Of all other Bonapartes, she was the only one who showed fidelity and gratitude to the emperor, her brother. Even Madame Mere, Napoleon's mother, who beyond all question transmitted to him his great mental and physical power, did nothing for him. At the height of his splendor, she hoarded Sous and France and grumbly remarked, All this is for a time, it isn't going to last. Pauline, however, was in one respect different from all her kindred. Napoleon made Elise a princess in her own right, and gave her the grand duchy of Tuscany. He married Caroline to Marshal Murat, and they became respectively king and queens of Naples. For Pauline he did very little, less, in fact, than for any other member of his family, and yet she alone stood by him to the end. This feather-headed, languishing, beautiful, distracting morsel of frivolity, who had the manners of a kitten and the morals of a cat, nevertheless was not wholly unworthy to be Napoleon's sister. 
one has to tell many hard things of her and yet one almost pardons her because of her underlying devotion to the man who made the name of bonaparte illustrious for ever caroline queen of naples urged her husband to turn against his former chief elise sour and greedy threw in her fortunes with the murrets pauline as we shall see had the one redeeming trait of gratitude to those who knew her she was from girlhood an incarnation of what used to be called femininity we have to-day another and a higher definition of womanhood but to her contemporaries and to many modern writers she has seemed to be the first of all women woman to the tips of her rosy fingernails says levi those who saw her were distracted by her loveliness they say that no one can form any idea of her beauty from her pictures a veritable masterpiece of creation she had been called frederick masson declares she was so much more the typical woman that with her the defects common to women reached the highest development while her beauty attained a perfection which may justly be called unique no one speaks of pauline bonaparte's character or of her intellect but wholly of her loveliness and her charm and it must be added of her utter lack of anything like a moral sense even as a child of thirteen when the bonapartes left corsica and took up their abode in marseilles she attracted universal attention by her wonderful eyes her grace and also by her utter lack of decorum which she showed the bonaparte girls at this time lived almost on charity the future emperor was then a captain of artillery and could give them but little out of his scanty pay pauline or as they called her in those days paulette wore unbecoming hats and shabby gowns and shoes that were full of holes none the less she was sought out by several men of note among them friron a commissioner of the convention he visited pauline so often as to cause unfavorable comment but he was in love with her and she fell in love with him to the extent of her capacity she used to write to him love letters in italian which were certainly not lacking in ardor here is the end of one of them i love you always and most passionately i love you forever my beautiful idol my heart my appealing lover i love you love you love you the most loved of lovers and i swear never to love any one else this was interesting in view of the fact that soon afterward she fell in love with chenot who became a famous marshal but her love affairs never gave her any serious trouble and the three sisters who now began to feel the influence of napoleon's rise to power enjoyed themselves as they had never done before at Antibes, they had a beautiful villa and later a mansion at milan by this time napoleon had routed the austrians in italy and all france was ringing with his name what was pauline like in her maidenhood arnaud says she was an extraordinary combination of perfect physical beauty and the strange moral laxity she was as pretty as you please but utterly unreasonable she had no more manners than a schoolgirl talking incoherently giggling at everything and nothing and mimicking the most serious persons of rank general richard who knew her then tells in his monograph of the private theatricals in which pauline took part and of the sport which they had behind the scenes he says the bonaparte girls used literally to dress us they pulled our ears and slapped us but they always kissed and made up later we used to stay in the girls room all the time when they were dressing napoleon was anxious to see his sisters in some way settled he proposed to general Mormont to marry pauline the girl was then only seventeen and one might have some faith in her character but Mormont was shrewd and knew her far too well the words in which he declined the honor are interesting i know that she is charming and exquisitely beautiful yet i have dreams of domestic happiness of fidelity and of virtue such dreams are seldom realized i know still in the hope of winning them and then he paused coughed and completed what he had to say in a sort of mumble but his meaning was wholly clear he would not accept the offer of pauline in marriage even though she was the sister of his mighty chief then napoleon turned to general leclerc with whom pauline had for some time flirted as she had flirted with almost all the officers of napoleon's staff leclerc was only twenty-six he was rich and of good manners and rather serious and in poor health this was not precisely the sort of husband for pauline if we look at it in a conventional way but it served napoleon's purpose and it did not in the least interfere with his sister's intrigues poor leclerc who really loved pauline grew thin and graver still in manner he was sent to spain and portugal and finally was made commander-in-chief to the french expedition to haiti where the famous black rebel toussaint de louverture was heading an uprising of the negroes napoleon ordered pauline to accompany her husband 
Pauline flatly refused, although she made this an occasion of ordering mountains of pretty clothes and pyramids of hats, but still she refused to go on board the flagship. Leclerc expostulated and pleaded, but the lovely witch laughed in his face and still persisted that she would never go. Word was brought to Napoleon, and he made short work of her resistance. Bring a litter, he said, with one of his steely glances. Order six grenadiers to thrust her into it, and see that she goes on board forthwith. And so, screeching like an angry cat, she was carried on board and set sail with her husband and one of her former lovers. She found Haiti and Santo Domingo more agreeable than she had supposed. She was there a sort of queen who could do as she pleased, and have her orders implicitly obeyed. Her dissipation was something frightful. Her folly and her vanity were beyond belief. But at the end of two years both she and her husband fell ill. He was stricken down by the yellow fever, which was decimating the French army. Pauline was suffering from the results of her life in a tropical climate. Leclerc died, the expedition was abandoned, and Pauline brought the general's body back to France. When he was buried, she, still recovering from her fever, had him interred in a costly coffin and paid him the tribute of cutting off her beautiful hair and burying it with him. What a touching tribute to her dead husband, said someone to Napoleon. The emperor smiled cynically as he remarked, Hm, of course she knows that her hair is bound to fall out after her fever, and that it will come in longer and thicker for being cropped. Napoleon, in fact, though he loved Pauline better than his other sisters, or perhaps because he loved her better, was very strict with her. He obliged her to wear mourning and to observe some of the proprieties, but it was hard to keep her within bounds. Presently it became noised about that Prince Camillo Borghese was exceedingly intimate with her. The prince was an excellent specimen of the fashionable Italian. He was immensely rich. His palace at Rome was crammed with pictures, statues, and every sort of artistic treasure. He was the owner, moreover, of the famous Borghese jewels, the finest collections of diamonds in the world. Napoleon rather sternly insisted upon her marrying Borghese. Fortunately, the prince was very willing to be connected with Napoleon, while Pauline was delighted at the idea of having diamonds that would eclipse all the gems which Josephine possessed. For, like all the Bonapartes, she detested her brother's wife. So she would be married and show her diamonds to Josephine. It was a bit of feminine malice which she could not resist. The marriage took place very quietly at Joseph Bonaparte's house because of the absence of Napoleon but the newly made princess was invited to visit Josephine at the palace of St. Claude. Here was to be the triumph of her life. She spent many days in planning a toilet which should be absolutely crushing to Josephine. Whatever she wore must be a background for the famous diamonds. Finally, she decided on green velvet. When the day came, Pauline stood before a mirror and gazed at herself with diamonds glistening in her hair, shimmering around her neck, and fastened so thickly on her green velvet gown as to remind one of a moving jewel casket. She actually shed tears of joy. Then she entered her carriage and drove out to St. Claude. But the Creole Josephine, though no longer young, was a woman of great subtlety as well as charm. Stories had been told to her of the green velvet, and therefore she had her drawing room redecorated in the most uncompromising blue. It killed the green velvet completely. As for the diamonds, she met that manoeuvre by wearing not a single gem of any kind. Her dress was an Indian muslin with a broad hem of gold. Her exquisite simplicity, coupled with her dignity of bearing, made the Princess Pauline, with her shower of diamond and her green velvet displayed against the blue, seem absolutely vulgar. Josephine was most generous in her admiration of the Borghese gems, and she kissed Pauline on parting. The victory was hers. There was another story of a defeat which Pauline met from another lady, one Madame de Coutard. This was at the magnificent ball given to the most fashionable world of Paris. Pauline decided upon going, and intended, in her own phrase, to blot out every woman there. She kept the secret of her toilet absolutely, and she entered the ballroom at the psychological moment when all the guests had just assembled. She appeared, and at sight of her the music stopped. Silence fell upon the assemblage, and a sort of quiver went through everyone. Her costume was of the finest muslin, bordered with golden palm leaves. Four bands, spotted like leopard skin, were wound around her head, while these in turn were supported by little clusters of golden grapes. She had copied the headdress of her Bachante de Louvre. All over her person were cameos, and just beneath her breasts she wore a golden band held in place by an engraved gem. Her beautiful wrists, arms, and hands were bare. She had, in fact, blotted out her rivals. 
Nevertheless, Madame de Couton took her revenge. She went up to Pauline, who was lying on a divan, to set off her loveliness, and began gazing at the princess through a double eyeglass. Pauline felt flattered for a moment, and then became uneasy. The lady who was looking at her said to a companion in a tone of compassion, What a pity! She really would be lovely, if it weren't for that. For what? returned her escort. Why, are you blind? It is so remarkable that you surely must see it. Pauline was beginning to lose her self-composure. She flushed and looked wildly about, wondering what was meant. Then she heard Madame Coutard say, Why, her ears! If I had such ears as those, I would cut them off. Pauline gave one great gasp and fainted dead away. As a matter of fact, her ears were not so bad. They were simply very flat and colorless, forming a contrast with the rosy tints of her face. But from that moment, no one could see anything but these ears, and thereafter the princess wore her hair low, enough to cover them. This may be seen in the statue of her by Canova. It was considered a very daring thing for her to pose for him in the nude, for only a bit of drapery is thrown over her lower limbs. Yet it is true that this statue is absolutely classical in its conception and execution, and its interest is heightened by the fact that its model was what she afterwards styled herself with true Napoleonic pride, a sister of Bonaparte. Pauline detested Josephine, and was pleased when Napoleon divorced her, but she also disliked the Austrian Archduchess Marie-Louise, who was Josephine's successor. On one occasion, at a great court function, she got behind the empress and ran out her tongue at her, in full view of all the nobles and distinguished persons present. Napoleon's eagle eye flashed upon Pauline and blazed up like fire upon eyes. She actually took to her heels, rushed out of the ball, and never visited the court again. It would require much time to tell of her other eccentricities, of her intrigues, which were innumerable, of her quarrel with her husband, and of the minor breaches of the quorum, with which she startled Paris. One of these was her choice of a huge negro to bathe her every morning. When someone ventured to protest, she answered naively, What? Do you call that thing a man? And she compromised by compelling her black servitor to go out and marry someone at once, so that he might continue his ministrations with propriety. To her, Napoleon showed himself far more severe than with either Caroline or Elise, gave her a marriage dowry of half a million francs, when she became the princess of Borghese, but after that he was continually checking her extravagances. Yet in 1814, when the downfall came and Napoleon was sent into exile to Elba, Pauline was the only one of all his relatives to visit him and spend her time with him. His wife fell away and went back to her Austrian relatives. Of all the Bonapartes, only Pauline and Madame Mere remained faithful to the Emperor. Even then Napoleon refused to pay a pill of hers of sixty-two francs, while he allowed her only two hundred and forty francs for the maintenance of her horses. But she, with a generosity of which one would have thought her quite incapable, gave to her brother a great part of her fortune. When he escaped from Elba and began the campaign of 1815, she presented him with all the Borghese diamonds. In fact, he had them with him in his carriage to Waterloo, where they were captured by the English. Contrast this with the meanness and ingratitude of her sisters and her brothers, and one may well believe that she was sincerely proud of what it meant to be La Sœur de Bonaparte. When he was sent to St. Elena, she was ill in bed and could not accompany him. Nevertheless, she tried to sell all her trinkets, of which she was so proud, in order that she might give him help. When he died, she received the news with bitter tears, on hearing all the particulars of that long agony. As for herself, she did not long survive. At the age of forty-four, her last moments came. Knowing that she was to die, she sent for Prince Borghese and sought a reconciliation. But after all, she died as she had lived, the queen of trinkets, la reine de colifichet. She asked the servant to bring a mirror. She gazed into it with her dying eyes, and then, as she sank back, it was with a smile of deep content. I am not afraid to die, she said. I am still beautiful. End of the story of Pauline Bonaparte Recording by Ellie, August 2009
by Lyndon Orr. Volume 2. The Story of the Empress Marie-Louise and Count Nyperg. There is one famous woman whom history condemns, while at the same time it partly hides the facts which might mitigate the harshness of the judgment that is passed upon her. This woman is Marie-Louise, Empress of France, consort of the great Napoleon, and Archduchess of Imperial Austria. When the most brilliant figure in all history, after his overthrow in 1814, was in tawdry exile on the petty island of Elba, the Empress was already about to become a mother, and the father of her unborn child was not Napoleon, but another man. This is almost all that is usually remembered of her, that she was unfaithful to Napoleon, that she abandoned him in the hour of his defeat, and that she gave herself with readiness to one inferior in rank, yet with whom she lived for years, and to whom she bore what the French writer styled, quote, a brood of bastards, unquote. Naturally enough, the Austrian and German historians do not have much to say of Marie Louise, because in her own disgrace she also brought disgrace upon the proudest reigning family in Europe. Naturally also, French writers, even those who are hostile to Napoleon, do not care to dwell upon the story, since France itself was humiliated when its greatest genius and most splendid soldier was deceived by his Austrian wife. Therefore, there are still many who know little beyond the bare fact that the Empress Marie Louise threw away her pride as a princess, her reputation as a wife, and her honor as a woman. Her figure seems to crouch in a sort of murky byway, and those who pass over the high road of history ignore it with averted eyes. In reality, the story of Napoleon and Marie-Louise, and of the Count von Nyperg, is one which, when you search it to the very core, leads you straight to a sex problem of a very curious nature. Nowhere else does it occur in the relations of the great personages of history. But in literature, Balzac, that master of psychology, has touched upon the theme in the early chapters of his famous novel called Quote, a woman of thirty. Unquote. As to the Napoleonic story, let us first recall the facts of the case, giving them in such order that their full significance may be understood. In 1809, Napoleon, then at the plenitude of his power, shook himself free from the clinging clasp of Josephine and procured the annulment of his marriage to her. He really owed her nothing. Before he knew her, she had been the mistress of another. In the first years of their life together, she had been notoriously unfaithful to him. He had held to her from habit, which was in part a superstition. But the remembrance of the wrong which she had done him made her faded charms at times almost repulsive. And then Josephine had never borne him any children, and without a son to perpetuate his dynasty, the gigantic achievements which he had wrought seemed futile in his eyes and likely to crumble into nothingness when he should die. No sooner had the marriage been annulled than his titanic ambition leaped, as it always did, to a tremendous pinnacle. He would wed, he would have children, but he would wed no petty princess. The man who in his early youth had felt honored by a marriage with the almost déclassé widow of a Creole planter now stretched out his hand that he might take to himself a woman not merely royal but imperial. At first he sought the sister of the Tsar of Russia, but Alexander entertained a profound distrust of the French emperor and managed to evade the tentative demand. There was, however, a reigning family far more ancient than the Romanovs, a family which had held the imperial dignity for nearly six centuries, the oldest and the noblest blood in Europe. This was the Austrian house of Habsburg. Its head, the Emperor Francis, had thirteen children, of whom the eldest, the Archduchess Marie-Louise, 
was then in her nineteenth year. Napoleon had resented the rebuff which the Tsar had given him. He turned, therefore, the more eagerly to the other project. Yet there were many reasons why an Austrian marriage might be dangerous, or at any rate ill-omened. Only sixteen years before, an Austrian archduchess, Marie Antoinette, married to the ruler of France, had met her death upon the scaffold. Hated and cursed by the French people, who had always blamed, quote, the Austrian, unquote, for the evil days which had ended in the flames of revolution. Again, the father of the girl to whom Napoleon's fancy turned had been the bitter enemy of the new regime in France. His troops had been beaten by the French in five wars and had been crushed at Austerlitz and Wagram. Bonaparte had twice entered Vienna at the head of a conquering army, and thrice he had slept in the imperial palace at Schönbrunn, while Francis was fleeing through the dark, a beaten fugitive, pursued by the swift squadrons of the French cavalry. The feeling of Francis of Austria was not merely that of the vanquished toward the victor. It was a deep hatred, almost religious in its fervor. He was the head and front of the old-time feudalism of birth and blood. Napoleon was the incarnation of the modern spirit which demolished thrones and set an iron heel upon crowned heads, giving the sacred titles of king and prince to soldiers who, even in palaces, still showed the swaggering brutality of the camp and the stable whence they sprang. Yet just because an alliance with the Austrian house seemed in so many ways impossible, the thought of it inflamed the ardor of Napoleon all the more. Impossible, he had once said contemptuously. The word impossible is not French. The Austrian alliance, unnatural though it seemed, was certainly quite possible. In the year 1809, Napoleon had finished his fifth war with Austria by that terrific battle of Wagram, which brought the empire of the Habsburgs to the very dust. The conqueror's rude hand had stripped from Francis province after province. He had even let fall hints that the Habsburgs might be dethroned and that Austria might disappear from the map of Europe to be divided between himself and the Russian Tsar, who was still his ally. It was at this psychological moment that the Tsar wounded Napoleon's pride by refusing to give the hand of his sister Anne. The subtle diplomats of Vienna immediately saw their chance. Prince Metternich, with the caution of one who enters the cage of a man-eating tiger, suggested that the Austrian Archduchess would be a fitting bride for the French conqueror. The notion soothed the wounded vanity of Napoleon. From that moment events moved swiftly, and before long it was understood that there was to be a new empress in France, and she was to be none other than the daughter of the man who had been Napoleon's most persistent foe upon the continent. The girl was to be given, sacrificed, if you like, to appease an imperial adventurer. After such a marriage, Austria would be safe from spoliation. The reigning dynasty would remain firmly seated upon its historic throne. But how about the girl herself? She had always heard Napoleon spoken of as sort of an ogre, a man of low ancestry, a brutal and faithless enemy of her people. She knew that this bold, rough-spoken soldier, less than a year before, had added insult to the injury which he had inflicted on her father. In public proclamations he had called the Emperor Francis a coward and a liar. Up to the latter part of the year, Napoleon was to her imagination a blood-stained, sordid, and yet all-powerful monster outside the pale of human liking and respect. What must have been her thoughts when her father first told her with averted face that she was to become the bride of such a being? Marie Louise had been brought up, as all German girls of rank were then brought up, in quiet simplicity and utter innocence. In person, she was a tall blonde, 
with a wealth of light brown hair tumbling about a face, which might be called attractive because it was so youthful and so gentle, but in which only poets and courtiers could see beauty. Her complexion was rosy, with that peculiar tinge which means in the course of time it will become red and mottled. Her blue eyes were clear and childish. Her figure was good, though already too full for a girl who was younger than her years. She had a large and generous mouth with full lips, the lower one being the true, quote, Habsburg lip, unquote, slightly pendulous, a feature which has remained for generation after generation as a sure sign of Habsburg blood. One sees in it the present emperor of Austria, in the late queen regent of Spain, and in the present king of Spain, Alfonso. All the artists who made miniatures or paintings of Marie Louise softened down this racial mark so that no likeness of her shows it as it really was. But take her all in all, she was a simple, childlike, German madchen who knew nothing of the outside world except what she had heard from her discreet and watchful governess and what had been told her of Napoleon by her uncles, the archdukes, whom he had beaten down in battle. When she learned that she was to be given to the French emperor, her girlish soul experienced a shudder, but her father told her how vital was this union to her country and to him. With a sort of piteous dread, she questioned the archdukes, who had called Napoleon an ogre. Oh, that was when Napoleon was an enemy, they replied. Now he is our friend. Marie-Louise listened to all this, and like the obedient German girl she was, yielded her own will. Events moved with a rush, for Napoleon was not the man to dally. Josephine had retired to her residence at Malmaison, and Paris was already astir with the preparations for the new empress, who was to assure the continuation of the Napoleonic glory by giving children to her husband. Napoleon had said to his ambassador with his usual bluntness, This is the first and most important thing. She must have children. To the girl whom he was to marry, he sent the following letter, an odd letter, combining the formality of a negotiator with the veiled ardor of a lover. My cousin, the brilliant qualities which adorn your person have inspired in me a desire to serve you and to pay you homage. In making my request to the emperor, your father, and praying him to entrust to me the happiness of your imperial highness, may I hope that you will understand the sentiments which lead me to this act? May I flatter myself that it will not be decided solely by the duty of parental obedience? However slightly the feelings of your imperial highness may incline to me, I wish to cultivate them with so great care, and to endeavor so constantly to please you in everything, that I flatter myself that some day I shall prove attractive to you. This is the end at which I desire to arrive, and for which I pray your highness will be favorable to me. Immediately everything was done to dazzle the imagination of the girl. She had always dressed in the simplicity of the schoolroom. Her only ornaments had been a few colored stones, which she sometimes wore as a necklace or a bracelet. Now the resources of all France were drawn upon. Precious laces foamed about her. Cascades of diamonds flashed before her eyes. The costliest and most exquisite creations of the Parisian shops were spread around her to make up a trousseau fit for the princess, who was soon to become the bride of the man who had mastered continental Europe. The archives of Vienna were ransacked for musty documents, which would show exactly what had been done for all other Austrian princesses who had married rulers of France. Everything was duplicated down to the last detail. Ladies-in-waiting thronged about the young archduchess, and presently there came to her Queen Caroline of Naples, Napoleon's sister, of whom Napoleon himself once said, 
she is the only man among my sisters as joseph is the only woman among my brothers caroline by virtue of her rank as queen could have free access to her husband's future bride also there came presently napoleon's famous marshal berthier prince of neuchatel the chief of the old guard who had just been created prince of wagram a title which very naturally he did not use in austria he was to act as proxy for napoleon in the preliminary marriage service at vienna all was excitement vienna had never been so gay money was lavished under the direction of caroline and berthier there were illuminations and balls the young girl found herself the centre of the world's interest and the excitement made her dizzy she could not be but flattered and yet there were many hours when her heart misgave her more than once she was found in tears her father an unaffectionate though narrow soul spent an entire day with her consoling and reassuring her one thought she always kept in mind what she had said to metternich at the very first i want only what my duty bids me want at last came the official marriage by proxy in the presence of a splendid gathering the various documents were signed and the dowry was arranged for gifts were scattered right and left at the opera there were gala performances then marie louise bade her father a sad farewell almost suffocated by sobs and with her eyes streaming with tears she was led between two hedges of bayonets to her carriage while cannon thundered and all the church bells of vienna rang a joyful peal she set out for france accompanied by a long train of carriages filled with noble men and noble women with ladies-in-waiting and scores of attendant menials the young bride the wife of a man whom she had never seen was almost dead with excitement and fatigue at a station in the outskirts of vienna she scribbled a few lines to her father which are a commentary upon her state of mind i think of you always and i always shall god has given me power to endure this final shock and in him alone i have put all my trust he will help me and give me courage and i shall find support in doing my duty toward you since it is all for you that i have sacrificed myself there is something piteous in this little note of a frightened girl going to encounter she knew not what and clinging almost frantically to the one thought that whatever might befall her she was doing as her father wished one need not recount the long and tedious journey of many days over wretched roads in carriages that jolted and lurched and swayed she was surrounded by unfamiliar faces and was compelled to meet at every town the chief men of the place all of whom paid her honor but stared at her with irrepressible curiosity day after day she went on and on each morning a courier on a foaming horse presented her with a great cluster of fresh flowers and a few lines scrawled by the unknown husband who was to meet her at her journey's end there lay the point upon which her wandering thoughts were focused the journey's end the man whose strange mysterious power had forced her from her schoolroom had driven her through a nightmare of strange happenings and who was waiting for her somewhere to take her to himself to master her as he had mastered generals and armies what was marriage what did it mean what experience still lay before her these were the questions which she must have asked herself through that long exhausting journey when she thought of the past she was homesick when she thought of the immediate future she was fearful with a shuddering fear at last she reached the frontier of france and her carriage passed into a sort of triple structure the first pavilion of which was austrian while the middle pavilion was neutral and the farther one was french here she was received by those who were afterward to surround her the representatives of the napoleonic court these were not all plebeians and children of the revolution 
ex-stable boys, ex-laundresses. By this time, Napoleon had gathered around himself some of the noblest families of France who had rallied to the empire. The assemblage was a brilliant one. There were Montmorencys and Beaumonts and Audenards in abundance. But to Marie-Louise, as to her Austrian attendants, they were all alike. These were French, they were strangers, and she shrank from them. Yet here her Austrians must leave her. All who had accompanied her thus far were now turned back. Napoleon had been insistent on this point. Even her governess, who had been with her since her childhood, was not allowed to cross the French frontier. So fixed was Napoleon's purpose to have nothing Austrian about her, that even her pet dog, to which she clung as a girl would cling, was taken from her. Thereafter she was surrounded only by French faces, by French guards, and was greeted only by salvos of French artillery. In the meantime, what was Napoleon doing at Paris? Since the annulment of his marriage with Josephine, he had gone into a sort of retirement, matters of state war internal reforms no longer interested him but that restless brain could not sink into repose inflamed with the ardor of a new passion that passion was all the greater because he had never yet set eyes upon its object marriage with an imperial princess flattered his ambition the youth and innocence of the bride stirred his whole being with a thrill of novelty the painted charms of Josephine, the mercenary favors of actresses, the calculated ecstasies of the women of the court who gave themselves to him from vanity, had long since palled upon him. Therefore, the impatience with which he awaited the coming of Marie-Louise became every day more tense. For a time, he amused himself with planning down to the very last details the demonstrations that were to be given in her honor. He organized them as minutely as he had ever organized a conquering army. He showed himself as wonderful in these petty things as he had had in those great strategic combinations which had baffled the ablest generals of Europe. But after all had been arranged, even to the illuminations, the cheerings, the salutes, and the etiquette of the court, he fell into a fever of impatience which gave him sleepless nights and frantic days. He paced up and down the Tuileries, almost beside himself. He hurried off courier after courier with orders that the postillion should lash their horses to bring the hour of meeting nearer still. He scribbled love letters. He gazed continually on the diamond-studded portrait of the woman who was hurrying toward him. At last, as the time approached, he entered a swift traveling carriage and hastened to Campania, about fifty miles from Paris, where it had been arranged that he should meet his consort, and whence he was to escort her to the capital, so that they might be married in the great gallery of the Louvre. At Campania, the chancellery had been set apart for Napoleon's convenience, while the chateau had been assigned to Marie-Louise and her attendants. When Napoleon's carriage had dashed into the place, drawn by horses that had traveled at a gallop, the emperor could not restrain himself. It was raining torrents, and the night was coming on. Yet, none the less, he shouted for fresh horses and pushed on to Soissons, where the new empress was to stop and dine. When he reached there and she had not arrived, new relays of horses were demanded, and he hurried off once more into the dark. At the little village of Courcelles, he met the courier who was riding in advance of the empress's cortege. "'She will be here in a few minutes,' cried Napoleon, and he leaped from his carriage into the highway. The rain descended harder than ever, and he took refuge in the arched doorway of the village church his boots already bemired, his great coat reeking with the downpour. As he crouched before the church, he heard the sound of carriages, and before long there came toiling through the mud the one in which was seated the girl for whom he had been so long waiting. 
it was stopped at an order given by an officer within it half fainting with fatigue and fear marie louise sat in the dark alone here if ever was the chance for napoleon to win his bride could he have restrained himself could he have shown the delicate consideration which was demanded of him could he have remembered at least he was an emperor and that the girl timid and shuddering was a princess her future story might have been far different but long ago he had ceased to think of anything except his own desires he approached the carriage an obsequious chamberlain drew aside the leathern covering and opened the door exclaiming as he did so the emperor and then there leaped in the rain-soaked mud-bespattered being whose excesses had always been as unbridled as his genius the door was closed the leathern curtain again drawn and the horses set out at a gallop for Cesson. within the shrinking bride was at the mercy of pure animal passion feeling upon her hot face a torrent of rough kisses and yielding herself in terror to the caresses of wanton hands at soissons napoleon allowed no halt but the carriage plunged on still in the rain to campagna there all the arrangements made with so much care were thrust aside though the actual marriage had not yet taken place napoleon claimed all the rights which afterward were given in the ceremonial at paris he took the girl to the chancellery and not to the chateau in an ante-room dinner was served with haste to the imperial pair and queen caroline then the latter was dismissed with little ceremony the lights were extinguished and this daughter of a line of emperors was left to the tender mercies of one who always had about him something of the common soldier the man who lives for loot and lust at eleven the next morning she was unable to rise and was served in bed by the ladies of her household these facts repellent as they are must be remembered when we call to mind what happened in the next five years the horror of that night could not be obliterated by splendid ceremonies by studious attention or by all the pomp and gaiety of the court napoleon then forty-one practically the same age as his new wife's father the austrian emperor marie louise was barely nineteen and younger than her years her master must have seemed to be the brutal ogre whom her uncles had described installed in the tuileries she taught herself compliance on their marriage night napoleon had asked her briefly what did your parents tell you and she had answered meekly to be yours altogether and to obey you in everything but though she gave compliance and though her freshness seemed enchanting to napoleon there was something concealed within her thoughts to which he could not penetrate he gaily said to a member of his court marry a german my dear fellow they are the best women in the world gentle good artless and as fresh as roses yet at the same time napoleon felt a deep anxiety lest in her very heart of hearts this german girl might either fear him or hate him secretly somewhat later prince metternich came from the austrian court to paris i give you leave said napoleon to have a private interview with the empress let her tell you what she likes and i shall ask no questions even should i do so i now forbid your answering me metternich was closeted with the empress for a long while when he returned to the ante-room he found napoleon fidgeting about his eyes a pair of interrogation points i am sure he said that the empress told you that i was kind to her metternich bowed and made no answer well said napoleon somewhat impatiently at least i am sure that she is happy tell me did she not say so the austrian diplomat remained unsmiling your majesty himself has forbidden me to answer he returned with another bow we may fairly draw the inference that marie louise though she adapted herself to her surroundings 
was never really happy. Napoleon became infatuated with her. He surrounded her with every possible mark of honor. He abandoned public business to walk or drive with her. But the memory of his own brutality must have vaguely haunted him throughout it all. He was jealous of her, as he had never been jealous of the fickle Josephine. Constant has recorded that the greatest precautions were taken to prevent any person whatsoever, and especially any man, from approaching the empress, save in the presence of witnesses. Napoleon himself underwent a complete change of habits and demeanor. Where he had been rough and coarse, he became attentive and refined. His shabby uniforms were all discarded, and he spent hours in trying on new costumes. He even attempted to learn the waltz, but this he gave up in despair. Whereas before he ate hastily and at irregular intervals, he now sat at dinner with the unusual patience, and the court took on a character which it had never had. Never before had he sacrificed either his public duty or his private pleasures for any woman. Even in the first ardor of his marriage with Josephine, when he used to pour out his heart to her in letters from Italian battlefields, he did so only after he had made the disposition of his troops and had planned his movements for the following day. Now, however, he was not merely devoted, but uxorious, and in 1811, after the birth of the little king of Rome, he ceased to be the earlier Napoleon altogether. He had founded a dynasty. He was the head of a reigning house. He forgot the principles of the revolution, and he ruled, as he thought, like other monarchs, by the grace of God. As for Marie-Louise, she played her part extremely well. Somewhat haughty and unapproachable to others, she nevertheless studied Napoleon's every wish. She seemed even to be loving, but one can scarcely doubt that her obedience sprang ultimately from fear and that her devotion was the devotion of a dog which had been beaten into subjection. Her vanity was flattered in many ways, and most of all by her appointment as regent of the empire during Napoleon's absence in the disastrous Russian campaign, which began in 1812. It was in June of that year that the French emperor held court at Dresden, where he played, as it was said, to a parterre of kings. That was the climax of his magnificence, for there were gathered all the sovereigns and princes who were his allies, and who furnished the levies that swelled his grand army to six hundred thousand men. Here Marie-Louise, like her husband, felt to the full the intoxication of supreme power. By a sinister coincidence it was here that she first met the other man, then unnoticed and little heeded, who was to cast upon her a fascination which in the end proved irresistible. The man was Adam Albrecht, Count von Nyperg. There is something mysterious about his early years, and something baleful about his silent warfare with Napoleon. As a very young soldier, he had been an Austrian officer in 1793. His command served in Belgium, and there, in a skirmish, he was overpowered by the French in superior numbers, but resisted desperately. In the melee, a saber slashed him across the right side of his face, and he was made a prisoner. The wound deprived him of his right eye, so that for the rest of his life he was compelled to wear a black bandage to conceal the mutilation. From that moment he conceived an undying hatred of the French. Serving against them in the Tyrol and in Italy, he always claimed that had the Archduke Charles followed his advice, the Austrians would have forced Napoleon's army to capitulate at Marengo, thus bringing early eclipse to the rising star of Bonaparte. However this may be, Napoleon's success enraged Nyperg and made his hatred almost the hatred of a fiend. Hitherto he had detested the French as a nation. Afterward he concentrated his malignity upon the person of Napoleon. 
in every way he tried to cross the path of that great soldier and though nyperg was a comparatively unknown man his indomitable purpose and his continued intrigues at last attracted the notice of the emperor for in eighteen o eight napoleon wrote this significant sentence the count von nyperg is openly known to have been the enemy of the french little did the great conqueror dream how deadly was the blow with which this austrian count was destined finally to deal him nyperg although his title was not a high one belonged to the old nobility of austria he had proved his bravery in war and as a duelist and he was a diplomat as well as a soldier despite his mutilation he was a handsome and accomplished courtier a man of wide experience and one who bore himself in a manner which suggested the spirit of romance according to masson he was an austrian don juan and had won the hearts of many women at thirty he had formed a connection with an italian woman named theresa pola who he had carried away from her husband she had borne him five children and in eighteen thirteen he had married her in order that these children might be made legitimate in his own sphere the activity of Nyberg was almost as remarkable as napoleon's in a greater one apart from his exploits on the field of battle he had been attached to the austrian embassy in paris and strangely enough had been decorated by napoleon himself with the golden eagle of the legion of honor four months later we find him minister of austria at the court of sweden where he helped to lay the train of intrigue which was to detach bernadotte from napoleon's cause in eighteen twelve as just has been said he was with marie louise for a short time at dresden hovering about her already forming schemes two years after this he overthrew marat at naples and then hurried on post haste to urge prince eugene to abandon Bonaparte. when the great struggle of eighteen fourteen neared its close and napoleon fighting with his back to the wall was about to succumb to the united armies of europe it was evident that the austrian emperor would soon be able to separate his daughter from her husband in fact when napoleon was sent to elba marie louise returned to vienna the cynical austrian diplomats resolved that she should never again meet her imperial husband she was made duchess of parma in italy and set out for her new possessions and the man with the black band across his sightless eye was chosen to be her escort and companion when nyperg received this commission he was with teresa pola at milan a strange smile flitted across his face and presently he remarked with cynical frankness before six months i shall be her lover and later on her husband he took up his post as chief escort of marie louise and they journeyed slowly to munich and baden and geneva loitering along the way amid the great events which were shaking europe this couple attracted slight attention napoleon in elba longed for his wife and for his little son the king of rome he sent countless messages and many courtiers but every message was intercepted and no courtier reached its destination meanwhile marie louise was lingering agreeably in switzerland she was happy to have escaped from the whirlpool of politics and war amid the romantic scenery through which she passed nyperg was always by her side attentive devoted trying in everything to please her with him she passed delightful evenings he sang to her in his rich baritone songs of love he seemed romantic with a touch of mystery a gallant soldier whose soul was also touched by sentiment one would have said that marie louise the daughter of an imperial line would have been proof against the fascinations of a person so far inferior to herself in rank and who besides the great emperor was less than nothing even granting that she had never really loved napoleon she might still have preferred to maintain her dignity to share his fate 
and go down in history as the empress of the greatest man whom modern times have known. But Marie Louise was, after all, a woman, and she followed the guidance of her heart. To her, Napoleon was still the man who had met her amid the rainstorm at Courcey, and had from the first moment when he touched her violated all the instincts of a virgin. Later he had in his way tried to make amends, but the horror of that first night had never wholly left her memory. Napoleon had unrolled before her the drama of sensuality, but her heart had not been given to him. She had been his empress. In a sense, it might be more true to say that she had been his mistress, but she had never been duly wooed and won and made his wife an experience which is the right of every woman. And so this Nyperg, with his deferential manners, his soothing voice, his magnetic touch, his ardor, and his devotion, appeased that craving which the master of a hundred legions could not satisfy. In less than the six months of which Nyperg had spoken, the psychological moment had arrived. In the dim twilight she listened to his words of love, and then, drawn by that irresistible power which masters pride and woman's will, she sank into her lover's arms, yielding to his caresses and knowing that she would be parted from him no more except by death. From that moment he was bound to her by the closest ties and lived with her at the petty court of Parma. His prediction came true to the very letter. Teresa Pola died, and then Napoleon died, and after this, Marie-Louise and Nyperg were united in a morganatic marriage. Three children were born to them before his death in 1829. It is interesting to note how much of an impression was made upon her by the final exile of her imperial husband to St. Helena. When the news was brought to her, she observed casually, "'Thanks. By the way, I should like to ride this morning to Markenstein.' Do you think the weather is good enough to risk it? Napoleon, on his side, passed through agonies of doubt and longing when no letters came to him from Marie-Louise. She was constantly in his thoughts during his exile at St. Helena. When his faithful friend and constant companion at St. Helena, the Count Las Casas, was ordered by Sir Hudson Lowe to depart from St. Helena, Napoleon wrote to him, should you see some day my wife and son embrace them for two years i have neither directly nor indirectly heard from them there has been on this island for six months a german botanist who has seen them in the garden of schoenbrunn a few months before his departure the barbarians meaning the english authorities at st helena have carefully prevented him from coming to give me any news respecting them at last the truth was told him, and he received it with that high magnanimity, or it may be fatalism, which at times he was capable of showing. Never in all his days of exile did he say one word against her. Possibly in searching his own soul he found excuses, such as we may find. In his will he spoke of her with great affection, and shortly before his death he said to his physician and to Marky, after my death, I desire that you will take my heart, put it in the spirits of wine, and that you will carry it to Parma to my dear Marie-Louise. You will please tell her that I tenderly loved her, that I never ceased to love her. You will relate to her all that you have seen, and every particular respecting my situation and death. The story of Marie-Louise is pathetic, almost tragic. There is a taint of grossness about it. And yet, after all, there is a lesson in it, the lesson that true love cannot be forced or summoned at command, and that it is destroyed before its birth by outrage, and that it goes out only when evoked by sympathy, by tenderness, and by devotion. End of the story of the Empress Marie Louise and Count Nyperg. End of Volume 2 of Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr
The Wives of General Houston, Volume Three of Famous Affinities of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. Famous Affinities of History by Lyndon Orr. Volume Three The Wives of General Houston. Sixty or seventy years ago, it was considered a great joke to chalk up on any man's house door, or on his trunk at a coaching station, the conspicuous letters G T T. The laugh went round, and every one who saw the inscription chuckled and said, They've got it on you, old hoss. The three letters meant gone to Texas, and for any man to go to Texas in those days meant his moral, mental, and financial dilapidation. Either he had plunged into bankruptcy, and wished to begin life over again in a new world, or the sheriff had a warrant for his arrest. The very task of reaching Texas was a fearful one. Rivers that overran their banks, fever-stricken lowlands where gaunt faces peered out from moldering cabins, bottomless swamps where the mud oozed greasily and where the alligator could be seen slowly moving his repulsive form, all this stretched on for hundreds of miles, to horrify and sicken the emigrants who came toiling on foot or struggling upon emaciated horses. Other daring pioneers came by boat, running all manner of risks upon the swollen rivers. Still others descended from the mountains of Tennessee, and passed through a more open country, and with a greater certainty of self-protection, because they were trained from childhood to wield the rifle and the long sheath knife. It is odd enough to read, in the chronicles of those days, that amid all this suffering and squalor, there was drawn a strict line between the quality and those who had no claim to be patricians. The quality was made up of such emigrants as came from the more civilized East, or who had slaves, or who dragged with them some rickety vehicle with carriage horses, however gaunt the animals might be. All others, those who had no slaves or horses, and no traditions of the older states, were classed as poor whites, and they accepted their mediocrity without a murmur. Because he was born in Lexington, Virginia, and moved thence with his family to Tennessee, young Sam Houston, a truly eponymous American hero, was numbered with the quality when, after long wandering, he reached his boyhood home. His further claim to distinction as a boy came from the fact that he could read and write, and was even familiar with some of the classics in translation. When less than eighteen years of age, he had reached a height of more than six feet. He was skillful with the rifle a remarkable rough-and-tumble fighter, and as quick with his long knife as any Indian. This made him a notable figure, the more so as he never abused his strength and courage. He was never known as anything but Sam. In his own sphere he passed for a gentleman and a scholar, thanks to his Virginian birth and to the fact that he could repeat a great part of Pope's translation of the Iliad. His learning led him to teach school a few months in the year to the children of the white settlers, Indeed, Houston was so much taken with the pursuit of scholarship that he made up his mind to learn Greek and Latin. Naturally, this seemed mere foolishness to his mother, his six strapping brothers, and his three stalwart sisters, who cared little for study. So sharp was the difference between Sam and the rest of the family that he gave up his yearning after the classics and went to the other extreme by leaving home and plunging into the heart of the forest, beyond sight of any white man or woman, or any thought of Hellas and ancient Rome. Here in the dimly lidded glades he was most happy. The Indians admired him for his woodcraft, and for the skill with which he chased the wild game amid the forests. From his copy of the Iliad he would read to them the thoughts of the world's greatest poet. It is told that nearly forty years after, when Houston had long led a different life, and had made his home in Washington, a deputation of more than forty untamed Indians from Texas arrived there under the charge of several army officers. They chanced to meet Sam Houston. One and all ran to him, clasped him in their brawny arms, hugged him like bears to their naked breasts, and called him father. Beneath the copper skin and thick paint the blood rushed, and their faces changed, and the lips of many a warrior trembled, although the Indian may not weep. In the gigantic form of Houston, on whose ample brow the beneficent love of a father was struggling with the sternness of the patriarch and warrior, we saw civilization awing the savage at his feet. We needed no interpreter to tell us that this impressive supremacy was gained in the forest. 
His family had been at first alarmed by his stay among the Indians, but when after a time he returned for a new outfit, they saw that he was entirely safe, and left him to wander among the red men. Later he came forth and resumed the pursuits of civilization. He took up his studies, he learned the rudiments of law, and entered upon its active practice. When barely thirty-six he had won every office that was open to him, ending with his election to the governorship of Tennessee in 1827. Then came a strange episode which changed the whole course of his life. Until then the love of woman had never stirred his veins. His physical activities in the forests, his unique intimacy with Indian life, had kept him away from the social intercourse of towns and cities. In Nashville, Houston came to know for the first time the fascination of feminine society. As a lawyer, a politician, and the holder of important offices, he could not keep aloof from that gentler and more winning influence which had hitherto been unknown to him. In 1828, Governor Houston was obliged to visit different portions of the state, stopping, as was the custom, to visit at the homes of the quality, and to be introduced to wives and daughters as well as to their sportsmen's sons. On one of his official journeys he met Miss Eliza Allen a daughter of one of the influential families of Sumner County, on the northern border of Tennessee. He found her responsive, charming, and greatly to be admired. She was a slender type of southern beauty, well calculated to gain the affection of a lover, and especially of one whose associations had been chiefly with the women of frontier communities. To meet a girl who had refined taste and wide reading, and who was at the same time graceful and full of humor, must have come as a pleasant experience to Houston. He and Miss Allen saw much of each other, and few of their friends were surprised when the word went forth that they were engaged to be married. The marriage occurred in January 1829. They were surrounded with friends of all classes and ranks, for Houston was the associate of Jackson, and was immensely popular in his own state. He seemed to have before him a brilliant career. He had won a lovely bride to make a home for him, so that no man seemed to have more attractive prospects. What was there which at this time interposed in some malignant way to blight his future? It was a little more than a month after his marriage when he met a friend, and taking him out into a strip of quiet woodland, said to him, I have something to tell you, but you must not ask me anything about it. My wife and I will separate before long. She will return to her father's, while I must make my way alone. Houston's friend seized him by the arm and gazed at him with horror. Governor, said he, you're going to ruin your whole life. What reason have you for treating this young lady in such a way? What has she done that you should leave her? Or what have you done that she should leave you? Every one will fall away from you. Houston grimly replied, I have no explanation to give you. My wife has none to give you. She will not complain of me, nor shall I complain of her. It is no one's business in the world except our own. Any interference will be impertinent, and I shall punish it with my own hand. But, said his friend, think of it. The people at large will not allow such action. They will believe that you, who have been their idol, have descended to insult a woman. Your political career is ended. It will not be safe for you to walk the streets. What difference does it make to me, said Houston gloomily? What must be, must be. I tell you, as a friend, in advance, so that you may be prepared. But the parting will take place very soon. Little was heard for another month or two and then came the announcement that the governor's wife had left him and had returned to her parents' home. The news flew like wildfire, and was the theme of every tongue. Friends of Mrs. Houston begged her to tell them the meaning of the whole affair. Adherents of Houston, on the other hand, set afloat stories of his wife's coldness and of her peevishness. The state was divided into factions, and what really concerned a very few was, as usual, made everybody's business. There were times when, if Houston had appeared near the dwelling of his former wife, he would have been lynched or riddled with bullets. Again, there were enemies and slanderers of his who, had they shown themselves in Nashville, would have been torn to pieces by men who hailed Houston as a hero, and who believed that he could not possibly have done wrong. However his friends might rage, and however her people might wonder and seek to pry into the secret, no satisfaction was given on either side. The abandoned wife never uttered a word of explanation. Houston was equally reticent and self-controlled. In later years he sometimes drank deeply, and was loose-tongued, but never, even in his cups, could he be persuaded to say a single word about his wife. The whole thing is a mystery and cannot be solved by any evidence that we have. Almost every one who has written of it seems to have indulged in mere guesswork. 
One popular theory is that Miss Allen was in love with someone else, that her parents forced her into a brilliant marriage with Houston, which, however, she could not afterward endure, and that Houston, learning the facts, left her because he knew that her heart was not really his. But the evidence is all against this. Had it been so, she would surely have secured a divorce, and would then have married the man whom she truly loved. As a matter of fact, although she did divorce Houston, it was only after several years, and the man whom she subsequently married was not acquainted with her at the time of the separation. Another theory suggests that Houston was harsh in his treatment of his wife, and offended her by his untaught manners and extreme self-conceit. But it was not likely that she objected to his manners, since she had become familiar with them before she gave him her hand, and as to his conceit, there is no evidence that it was as yet unduly developed. After his Texas campaign, he sometimes showed a rather lofty idea of his own achievements, but he does not seem to have done so in these early days. Some have ascribed the separation to his passion for drink, but here again we must discriminate. Later in life he became very fond of spirits and drank whiskey with the Indians, but during his early years he was most abstemious. It scarcely seems possible that his wife left him because he was intemperate. If one wishes to construct a reasonable hypothesis on a subject where the facts are either wanting or conflicting, it is not impossible to suggest a solution of this puzzle about Houston. Although his abandoned wife never spoke of him and shut her lips tightly when she was questioned about him, Houston, on his part, was not so taciturn. He never consciously gave any direct clue to his matrimonial mystery, but he never forgot this girl who was his bride and whom he seems always to have loved. In what he said, he never ceased to let a vein of self-reproach run through his words. I should choose this one paragraph as the most significant. It was written immediately after they had parted. Eliza stands acquitted by me. I have received her as a virtuous, chaste wife, and as such I pray God I may ever regard her, and I trust I ever shall. She was cold to me, and I thought she did not love me. And again, he said to an old and valued friend at about the same time, I can make no explanation. I exonerate the lady fully, and do not justify myself. Miss Allen seems to have been a woman of the sensitive American type, which was so common in the early and the middle part of the last century. Mrs. Trollope has described it for us with very little exaggeration. Dickens has drawn it with a touch of malice, and yet not without truth. Miss Martineau described it during her visit to this country, and her account quite coincides with those of her two contemporaries. Indeed, American women of that time unconsciously described themselves in a thousand different ways. They were, after all, only a less striking type of the sentimental English women who read L.E.L. and the earlier novels of bulwer lytton On both sides of the Atlantic there was a reign of sentiment and a prevalence of what was then called delicacy. It was a die-away, unwholesome attitude toward life, and was morbid to the last degree. In circles where these ideas prevailed, to eat a hearty dinner was considered unwomanly. To talk of anything except some gilded annual, or book of beauty, or the gossip of the neighborhood, was wholly to be condemned. The typical girl of such a community was thin and slender, and given to a mild starvation, though she might eat quantities of jam and pickles, and saleratus biscuit. She had the strangest view of life, and an almost unnatural shrinking from any usual converse with men. Houston, on his side, was a thoroughly natural and healthful man, having lived an outdoor life, hunting and camping in the forest, and displaying the unaffected manner of the pioneer. Having lived the solitary life of the woods, it was a strange thing for him to meet a girl who had been bred in an entirely different way who had learned a thousand little reservations and dainty graces, and whose very breath was coyness and reserve. Their mating was the mating of the man of the forest with the woman of the sheltered life. Houston assumed everything. His bride shrank from everything. There was a mutual shock amounting almost to repulsion. She, on her side, probably thought she had found in him only the brute which lurks in man. He, on the other, repelled and checked, at once grasped the belief that his wife cared nothing for him because she would not meet his ardors with like ardors of her own. It is the mistake that has been made by thousands of men and women at the beginning of their married lives, the mistake on one side of too great sensitiveness 
and on the other side of too great warmth of passion. This episode may seem trivial, and yet it is one that explains many things in human life. So far as concerns Houston, it has a direct bearing on the history of our country. A proud man, he could not endure the slights and gossip of his associates. He resigned the governorship of Tennessee, and left by night, in such a way as to surround his departure with mystery. There had come over him the old longing for Indian life, and when he was next visible he was in the land of the Cherokees, who had long before adopted him as a son. He was clad in buckskin and armed with knife and rifle, and served under the old chief Ulutika. He was a gallant defender of the Indians. When he found how some of the Indian agents had abused his adopted brothers, he went to Washington to protest, still wearing his frontier garb. One William Stansbury, a congressman from Ohio, insulted Houston, who leapt upon him like a panther, dragged him about the Hall of Representatives, and beat him within an inch of his life. He was arrested, imprisoned, and fined, but his old friend, President Jackson, remitted his imprisonment, and gruffly advised him not to pay the fine. Returning to his Indians, he made his way to a new field which promised much adventure. This was Texas, of whose condition in those early days something has already been said. Houston found a rough American settlement, composed of scattered villages extending along the disputed frontier of Mexico. Already, in the true Anglo-Saxon spirit, the settlers had formed a rudimentary state, and as they increased and multiplied, they framed a simple code of laws. Then, quite naturally, there came a clash between them and the Mexicans. The Texans, headed by Moses Austin, had set up a republic and asked for admission to the United States. Mexico regarded them as rebels, and despised them because they made no military display, and had no very accurate military drill. They were dressed in buckskin and ragged clothing, but their knives were very bright, and their rifles carried surely. Furthermore, they laughed at odds, and if only a dozen of them were gathered together, they would take on almost any number of Mexican regulars. In February, 1836, the acute and able Mexican, Santa Ana, led across the Rio Grande a force of several thousand Mexicans, showily uniformed and completely armed. Everyone remembers how they fell upon the little garrison at the Alamo, now within the city limits of San Antonio, but then an isolated mission building surrounded by a thick adobe wall. The Americans numbered less than three hundred men. A sharp attack was made against these overwhelming odds. The Americans drove the assailants back with their rifle fire, but they had nothing to oppose the Mexican artillery. The contest continued for several days, and finally the Mexicans breached the wall and fell upon the garrison, who were now reduced by more than half. There was an hour of blood, and every one of the Alamo's defenders, including the wounded, was put to death. The only survivors of the slaughter were two negro slaves, a woman and a baby girl. When the news of this bloody affair reached Houston, he leaped forth to the combat like a lion. He was made commander-in-chief of the scanty Texan forces. He managed to rally about seven hundred men, and set out against Santa Anna with little in the way of equipment, and with nothing but the flame of frenzy to stimulate his followers. By march and countermarch, the hostile forces came face to face near the shore of San Jacinto Bay, not far from the present city of Houston. Slowly they moved upon each other, when Houston halted, and his sharpshooters raked the Mexican battle line with terrible effect. Then Houston uttered the cry, Remember the Alamo! With deadly swiftness he led his men in a charge upon Santa Ana's lines. The Mexicans were scattered as by a mighty wind, their commander was taken prisoner, and Mexico was forced to give its recognition to Texas as a free republic, of which General Houston became the first president. This was the climax of Houston's life, but the end of it leaves us with something still to say. Long after his marriage with Miss Allen, he took an Indian girl to wife, and lived with her quite happily. She was a very beautiful woman, a half-breed, with the English name of Tiana Rogers. Very little, however, is known of her life with Houston. Later still, in 1840, he married a lady from Marion, Alabama, named Margaret Moffat Lay. He was then in his forty-seventh year, while she was only twenty-one. But again, as with his Indian wife, he knew nothing but domestic tranquillity. These later experiences go far to prove the truth of what has already been given as the probable cause of his first mysterious failure to make a woman happy. 
After Texas entered the Union in 1845, Houston was elected to the United States Senate, in which he served for thirteen years. In 1852, 1856, and 1860, as a Southerner who opposed any movement looking toward secession, he was regarded as a possible presidential candidate. But his career was now almost over, and in 1863, while the Civil War, which he had striven to prevent, was at its height, he died. End of the Wives of General Houston